Presentation laptop, live test, presentation laptop. And clerk's laptop. This is Councillor Clark testing his mic. Can everyone hear me? Can anybody can we, hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Councillor Clark. Perfect. Thank you. And we are concluding the live, live test, but pre please remember that we are, are still streaming.
order. Members of the public are advised that are needed for head pass life by the City of Hamilton temporarily archived on the city's website. As well, a reminder that all electronic devices, including your home phones, are to be switched to one audible fa function during the committee meetings. Yes. We are going to have a roll call. So I'd like to please indicate your presence when I call your name. Mayor Eisenberger. I see you, but he's muted. Can we unmute everybody just for temporarily? Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Um, Councillor Wilson, you're not working. You might want to check your mic, please. No, still not doing it. I just want to make sure everybody's note mics are in good working order so we don't run into this problem later. Okay, can you unmute her, please, for me? No. Check the, the center part of your, um, to make sure they're both plugged in and maybe move it to a different port in your computer. Okay, <coughs> so we'll move on, sorry. I just wanted to get that. Councillor Farr. Here. Thank you. Councillor Nan. Good morning, President. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Marula. I'm here indeed. Thank you. Councillor Collins. No, I don't see him yet. Councillor Jackson. Here. Good morning. Councillor Pauls. Here. Thank you. And Councillor Danko. Present. Thank you. Councillor Clark. I am here. Thank you. Councillor Pearson. Present. Thank uh -oh. you. Councillor Ferguson. I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Vanderbeek. I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Whitehead is not joining us for a little while. Councillor Partridge. I don't see her yet, but we will keep an eye on both her and Councillor Collins. And just to let everybody know that my e-scribe's not working right now in the council chamber, so I will be voting the old-fashioned way all day today. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Through you, Madam Deputy Mary. Yes, there are changes to the agenda. Delegation requests 5.1. Um, 5.1i, Danielle Hitchcock-Welsh is a video submission. 5.1j, Catherine King is a video submission. 5.1k, Carly Rogers, and that is also a video submission. 5.2, Dan Carter, Canadian Hemp Farmers Alliance, respecting adopting hemp into the Canadian SDGs. That would be for a future GIC. Added discussion items. Item 9.6A is Tim Hortons Field Enguard Anchor Replacement, uh, sorry, Repair and Replacement. And this is in addition to 9.6. Uh, and just for clarification, we will be dealing with 9.6A first. It's the information report in order to get all the information you require before you make a decision on 9.6. Long point 11, the encampment update, report HSC 20038. General information and other business is amendments to the outstanding business list. The items to be renewed, removed, contractual update from Electra. This was addressed on July 6, 2020 as item one, C report 20-010, and divesting and defunding of the Hamilton Police Services. Added private and confidential is item 13.2, encampment litigation update, and this is pursuant to subsections E and F of the city's procedural bylaw and the Ontario Municipal Act. Thank you. And just to let everyone know that the delegation requests, we have all but three are video presentations. So we are going to move up the three delegates who are on website, or sorry, WebEx, to the front of the line. Um, so those three are not sitting here waiting all day for their turn. So we're going to be, put, so I'm just going to put on notice right now. And please forgive me if I do not say your name properly. It's nothing personal. I'm just horrible at this. Mayor um, Gora. Doski, Suzanne Nayaga, and Joanna Atchinson, or Atchinson. Uh, please be ready, you're going to be going up at the front of the line. So uh, it's moved by Mayor Eisenberger, second by Councillor Wilson for the changes to the agenda. Uh, we have an e-vote, please. I need Mayor Eisenberger. Councillor Pauls. Thumbs up, thank you. And can you un 
Can you unmute uh, Councillor Pauls just for a second, please? Councillor Pauls? Yeah, I just voted. Thank you. Okay. Okay, th folks, thank you. Thank you. So now, uh, let's see. There are no further speakers. We're ready to go. Declarations of interest. Are there anyone here with declaration of interest? And, and Councillor Pauls is shaking her hand. Yes. Um, discussion items 91, 92, 93, 94, 95. I have a conflict of interest as my son is hired by City of Hamilton Police. Thank you. Thank you. And you'll be filling out the proper paperwork later. Yes. Yes. Anyone else? Seeing none, thank you. So now I need approval of the minutes for the previous meeting. This is August 10th, 2020. Moved by Councillor Farr, second by Councillor Nan. Any questions? Seeing none, we need an electric vote, electronic vote, please. I'm sorry, you're not on. I didn't hear you. Oh, thank you. Good morning, Miss. Okay, I got you in now. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. We'll just mute you now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We got electronic vote, please, on the August tenth, uh, two thousand twenty. Minutes. Mayor is a thumbs up. Thank you. Got you. Okay. Oh, <laughs> the vote's not out yet, folks. <laughs> this is fun, guys. Sorry, the coffee maker wasn't working this morning. Okay, we're ready. Okay, thank you. Communications members of the committee, if you have before you the communication 4.1A to 4.1D, and it's moved by Councilor Marula, second by Councilor Jackson. Uh, are there any uh, discussion on these items? Seeing nobody waving frantically, may I please have an electronic vote to receive them? Doing another vote. It seems so much faster when I'm at home. Because <laughs> I'm in my pajamas, sure. Thank you. So now we have delegation requests. Members of the committee, you have before request 5.1a to 5.1k and 5.2 uh, any discussion respecting these items uh, first I'm going to it's moved by Councillor Danko second by Councillor Clark that we receive thank you uh, no indication from anyone thank you so can we have an electronic vote please to approve Thank you. Now we have consent items. Members of committee, you have your consent item 6.1 to 6.4. Is there any discussion respecting 6.1? Seeing none. 6.2. Sorry, I can read these off and it might make it easier. 6.1 was the Hamilton Tax Increment Grant 11 and 15 uh, Cannon Street West. This is in Ward 2. 6.2 is the Environmental Remediation and Site Enhancement. This is the Erase Redevelopment Grant Applications for 1.15 1, and 121 Benzem Smart uh, Avenue. This is in Ward 4. Is there anything on 6.2? Seeing none. 6.3 is Ottawa Street Business Improvement Area. This is the Revised Board Management. This is Wards 3 and 4. No discussion. 6.4 is grant from Parks Canada National Cost Sharing Program for Heritage Places for Battle of Stony Creek Historical Site of Canada. This is in Ward 10. No, actually, that's Ward 5, isn't it? Thank yes, you. Thank you. 
So we need to change that one, please. Okay, so it's moved by Councillor Pearson, second by Councillor Ferguson, that we receive all four items and we approve them. Electronic vote, please. Good morning, Councillor Collins. Thank you. Everybody in? Thank you. So folks, we're now on to the public meeting delegations. Uh, we have before you, I believe there's over 40. We have three that are on WebEx, the rest are on uh, video presentation. I just want to remind her that the public is coming in to view their opinions. This is going to be anyone who wants to speak. It is to ask questions for clarity only. You are not to debate, in my opinion, and you're not to do political speeches. If I find that you are debating, I will warn you once. If you continue to debate with the delegate, I will cut your mic off. Those are gonna be the rules today. We have a lot to do. Let's make it efficient and respectful. Thank you very much. So I am going to pull up the first WebEx and believe me, I am so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, and it's Mayur Gorodowski. Do we have um, Mayur here? Um, I do not see him on the WebEx. Okay, mm -hmm. let's, we'll go to the next one. We'll come back to Mayur. I know that it takes a while sometimes for them to click in. Suzanne Nyaga. And Suzanne is on WebEx. Yep, I'm here. Hi, Hi. Suzanne. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for and having me. To let to just to remind you, this is a five minute rule, please. Yep. And thank you for joining us. You're you're you can proceed anytime you want. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Uh, good morning, councillors, Madam Chair, Mr. Mayor, and all other attendees. My name is Suzanne, and I'm a resident in Ward 14. And today I'm speaking in support of the call to defund the Hamilton Police. Um, I'm baffled that policing costs are some of the highest costs Hamilton taxpayers face when the city has an affordable housing crisis and a, wasteless, a wait list of hundreds for social housing. The reality is, is that the police do not keep us safe. They do not protect us. And we're demanding that you as representatives of the city of Hamilton reinvest in our communities and reinvest in the people of Hamilton. The city of Hamilton has spent $171 million on the police budget, but only an embarrassing 44.3 million on housing services and 4.8 million on unhoused people. Again, the Hamilton police have 17 new full-time officers, while Ontario Works lost 44 hires. When we know that police criminalize and violate low-income families, low-income communities, where Ontario Works can provide financial support to these very same communities, I don't understand why the city of Hamilton continuously invests in officers with badges and guns on the street before they invest in the well-being of the people of Hamilton. To hear that the police service budget has gone up almost 50% in the last five years is disgusting when we don't see the same across the board in other social services. Taxpayers should be spending money to help those who are in precarious housing situations get housed. We should be spending money to make sure that people have holistic support when they've fallen down, not to make sure that police are on the streets. I understand that the rationale behind police is that it reduces crime. However, when we actually look at research, this isn't true. The biggest social determinant for crime is income inequality. So when you invest in poverty reduction strategies, you actually invest in the reduction of crime. When you invest in youth engagement programs in low-income communities, when you invest in social housing, when you invest in permanent supportive housing for those experiencing mental health issues or significant disabilities, you invest in reducing crime at a better rate than investing in the police would ever do. In fact, in Canada, 50 to 80 percent of cases that police respond to are non-criminal in nature, so they're not even responding to criminal reasons. So I don't understand why they need to show up with badges and guns, which we know when they show up and somebody is experiencing a mental health crisis, somebody is in a vulnerable point in their life, 70 percent of the individuals killed by police in Canada are people experiencing mental health issues, on top of the disproportionate rate of killings of Black and Indigenous people by the police. 
Time and time again, research shows us that police are not the best emergency resp response service, that police do not keep a lot of communities safe. So it's time that the city of Hamilton and you as our representatives get creative. It's time to get creative about what emergency services look like in the city. It's time to listen to research, statistics, and facts and address poverty in the city, address housing in the city, address children's services in the city. Stop investing into police and invest into your communities. Invest into the people of Hamilton, the people who you said you sit on these committees, you sit on this council to represent. It's time to listen to our voices and the demands that we've put forth that are very simple to grasp, an immediate 20% reduction in police services, full transparency of the line-by-line -line police budget so we understand where our money is going and who it's going to, and a $30 million cut from HPS salaries, specifically from Division 1, 2, and 3, as well as money cut from the Mounted Unit Action Team and Victim Services. At the end of the day, we're going to defund Hamilton police. That's going to happen. But I just hope that you as our representatives would side with the people of Hamilton, will listen to the communities that have been endangered time and time again by police services, will listen to research that says that investing in police is not the best way to actually address crime. I hope that you will listen to the people that you choose to represent and defund the police of Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. You were under the five minutes, and I really appreciate that. Um, Councilor Ferguson, questions for clarity, please. Yes, yeah, just two quick questions, Suzanne. Okay. Uh, number one is you said that the uh, police budget, I think, I just want to make sure I got your number right. The police budget has increased by 50% over the last five years. Did I hear that correctly? Suzanne? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Ferguson. I'm puzzled where you got that stat from because I chaired the police board for five years. And, uh, you know, the last two I have not, or a year and a half I have not, and our average budget increase was in the, just over two or just under two in that, that area. And so that would make it 10% over uh, five years. I'm just puzzled where you got that stat from. Suzanne? I have no response to that. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson, your second question. Well, that's an interesting answer. The second part is you say 50% of all calls for police service are non-criminal. Do you not think that responding to automobile collisions is a big part of policing? Thank you, Suzanne. I don't believe that you need to show up with a gun um, in order to deal with automobile incidences. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Okay, I'm thank you. I see no other questions from our speakers. We're going to approve all the speakers at the end, please. So now I'm going to ask for Joanna Aitchison. Aitchison, I'm sorry, Joanna, are you there? Hello, yes. Hi, Joanna, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me, everyone. I really appreciate there it. There you are. Um, I have prepared something to read, if that's okay. That's wonderful, thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, as I've lived in, mostly white income neighbor, white middle income neighborhoods for a lot of my life. In 2015, my partner and I moved to Gibson in Ward 3 to uh, raise our children. The first year or two, I was surprised to see police on our street at least once a week, even more in the summers. I've learned that my shock was privilege and ignorance in disguise. I'd never witnessed how police surveil and interact with neighborhoods where the rate of poverty is high and resources are low. In the past five years, I've called the police more times than I had in my entire life. Once for what appeared to be a gang fight, two large groups holding metal poles and bats. A couple of times for fights between teens, once for a distressed stranger in our backyard late at night. Each time the police responded and the solution felt like a band-aid on a giant wound. Either the threat of police caused everyone to take things elsewhere or police would arrive, check things out and leave. In each situation, folks were clearly fearful and were clearly not being given any proper tools to cope with the situation they were in. I regret those calls that I made and I no longer see the police as a helpful option. The most recent example of watching Hamilton police fail an individual was a few weeks ago. We could see someone shouting and lying in the grass at the side of the road across from our house. A neighbor had already called the police. About five officers arrived within minutes the officers started speaking with the individual who was lying on the ground. They were all standing, positioned in a circle around the person below them. While this was happening, 
A scooter pulled over to the side of the road, and the rider asked police if they could toss the person a bottle of water. The distressed individual drank the water and started to settle and come to a bit. After a while, the police slowly dispersed. Once they'd gone, we heard the rider inviting their friend over so they could get some care and some food. So the situation left me with some questions. The top ones being, why did five officers arrive on the scene for one unarmed individual not posing a visible threat? What strategy is being implemented when officers stand over and surround an individual who is vulnerable and possibly untrusting or afraid? If community care is a goal in policing, why was a civilian the first to offer this person a bottle of water and a safe place to settle? And lastly, what would it take to equip neighborhoods with resources to care for individuals who are experiencing poverty, mental illness, hunger, and addiction? Instead of paying five officers to show up to a situation unprepared and unable to offer this person what was needed. Today, I won't be reading the list of demands laid out by HWDSB Kids Need Help, as I'm certain you will be hearing from several people today regarding this list. I'm also certain that as council members who are interested in meeting the needs of Hamiltonians, you'll have already read the demands and looked into information being highlighted about Hamilton Police Services and their unethical interactions with community members. My purpose in speaking to you today and in sharing my story is to echo what so many Hamiltonians have already been saying. There's an undeniable need for a shift in how we do things in this city. Contrary to what Councillor Marula has said, this is not coming from a place of confusion about Canadian municipal politics. The need for systematic change is clearly present in Hamilton, and to ignore it, not even engage in a humble and sincere conversation, is to fail at doing your jobs as councillors. I'm disappointed that it took almost 45 minutes to reach a point where you voted to even hear delegates and decided to even participate in this conversation. You can do better than this. If you are a white mid-income individual like myself, I call you more than anyone to be open, humble, and willing to listen as my fellow delegates speak today. Please set aside defensiveness and fear of cha challenging what you know. Set aside the worries you have about diving into complicated questions. It's not a foolish thing for council members to ask how a citizen's quality of life can be improved. Despite not being able to determine the HPS budget, you still hold a lot of power and influence. It's your responsibility to hear the concerns of your constituents and to advocate for us, all of us. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Suzanne. You're well under the five minutes and I really appreciate that part of it. Um, I'm not seeing any speakers at this point in time and I'm glad that uh, um, you joined us today. Thank you. Thanks. So now I'm going to go back to see if Mayur is online yet. Okay, well, we'll keep that open. So we've got the rest of the uh, delegates to go through. So as I said earlier, folks, these are all video presentations. Most of them, in fact, all of them, except for one, just a little over five minutes, but, mo but all of the rest are under five. So we're going to start with James Carnes. And I think that Stephanie has got these all queued and ready to go. <laughs> That was wishful thinking. That was my timer. <laughs> How you making out, Stephanie? I know. By the time you get a couple under your belt, it'll be easy. Sorry, folks, bear with me for a second because my screen is not wanting to share. So 
Tamara, I don't know what's happening. See, when you go yeah, here, I share content, right? Yeah. Oh, there we go. It just likes you better. Uh huh. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Sorry, folks, we are just trying to see why we can't get sound here. Has IT left? Our apologies, folks, we are trying to figure this out. We're almost there, folks. Sorry. Okay, we're switching over computers. Yeah, we're going to try something different, folks. This is the first time we've done this, so our apologies. We are definitely trying to make this happen for you. Clerks have been like wizards up to this point, so I guess you can be forgiven once in a while. Stop sharing your screen. Stop sharing. It's not beavers. <laughs>
Okay, folks, we're still having issues here. So instead of holding everyone up uh, for now, we're until they get this sorted out, I'm going to suggest we go to discussion items and we will come back to the delegates. They're all on video. So um, we can put them on when we figure out the technical difficulties. So we have discussion items. Mr. Mayor, are you there? I understand you have a motion respecting items 9.1 to 9.5. Would you please introduce your motion? Yes, thank you. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Jackson, that we uh, defer items 9.1 through 9.5 to the uh, September 23rd GIC meeting so that the Chief of Police can be in attendance to present the information and answer any questions of Council. Thank you. And, I, and that, you know, maybe a word on that before we get to a vote. Uh, okay. you know, I want to thank the chief of police for agreeing to uh, to come. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I would say, unorthodox in terms of uh, you know, having council request and, and 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 the chief adhering to that. I think, uh, given the circumstances, I think he understands that there's a good reason to uh, clarify a number of issues. Uh, you know, going forward and answer any questions that council might have. So I think it's a a, a wise step on his part, and I want to thank him for doing that. He'll be there with. The senior command, the deputies, and uh, <clears throat> and some other folks that work in the crisis and uh, and coast areas that uh, that uh, he he made the pre presentation with at uh, police services board. And, uh, I know the board uh, fully supports his desire to come and present this to uh, council, and uh, and we look forward to that ongoing dialogue going forward. So I want to thank the chief for for making that. Uh, I think very. Very, very positive step to come before council to address some of these concerns. Thank you. So it's moved by yourself, seconded by Councillor Jackson, who I see is still present. That's good. I don't see anybody's hands waving to speak, so it is now moved and seconded. Uh, electronic vote, please. Councillor Pauls and Vanderbeek. Councillor Fars, thumbs up. Councillor Pauls, I believe, was conflict, correct? Okay. Okay, we're done. Thank you very much, folks. So now we're on to nine points. Oh. We're going to try the delegates again. Please have patience if this works. And we're going to go back to seven uh, delegates and uh, presentations. So let's try again, Tamara. Okay. Okay, yep, so we're gonna go to 9.6 folks. Can we go back, please? Thank you. So 9.6, now just to reiterate what our clerk said earlier, this is about the Tim Hortons Field End Guard Anchor Repair Replacement, PW20039C Citywide. Um, so we need to put it on the table. So I've got Councillor Vanderbeek and seconded by Councillor Partridge. Oh, sorry, Councillor Jackson's waving. Never mind. Okay. So we're just going to put it on the floor for now, folks. Um, and this is just to let 9.6A first. No, I'm getting there. Hang on. Okay. So this is what I'm asking for 9.6 to be put on the on the floor, uh, but we are going to deal with 9.6A prior to 9.6 to ensure that members of the committee have all the additional information required to consider the recommendations in item 9.6. So we have it on the floor already. Uh, Rome D'Angelo and Janet Warner and Rob Gatto are present for questions if needed. So folks, 9.6A is on the uh, table and we've got Councillor Ferguson is waving frantically. We'll start with you, sir. I don't know about frantically, but I just wanted to. Uh, frantically. I, I just wanted to speak to a part, which was the addendum Correct. that, uh, as a result of the referral back to staff, 
And just to remind everybody, that's what we're speaking about right now. So thank you, Ms. Uh, Councilor for 9.6A, go ahead. Okay, I don't know whether to direct this question to um, our legal counsel, our legal Meg Nicolotti, or to Ron D'Angelo, or one of his um, other managers or directors, but I was a little puzzled by the answer that they contacted Infrastructure Ontario to come on site and take a look at it. And I always responded, they do not have the technical expertise to comment. I recall when the Pan Am gains were awarded, the Premier made it abundantly clear that um, IO would be the agency that would deliver these projects because they had the technical expertise. And and so do we just accept this 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 comment they made and, and roll over and spend a million dollars? Or are we gonna challenge that? And we do have some time to challenge it because the stadium isn't gonna be used now, it looks like till next year, uh, at least for the Tiger Cats. So um, I'm not sure whether Rome wants to take that or Nicole wants to take that question. I see Rob Gatto's online. Um, who would like to take that? Rome, are you online? I'll take that. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, I would defer to our, our legal services for that <laughs> part of a claim. And who in our legal services is online right now? Yep. Yeah. Hello, Councillor. Hi, Nicole. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I think the um, that the challenge we have here is that we are, if we're dealing re this report that's on the agenda is really to look at the funding associated with getting those repairs done. Uh, we are bringing back further information uh, in camera relating to the claim counselor. So I'm not really in a position to answer that uh, at this time. Uh, if there's on the issue of the expertise and whatnot, uh, that's that's more on the litigation side and we're, that's not in front of us today. Thank you, counselor. Well, I see Ontario Sports Solution um, D uh, didn't result in any solution uh, to, to rob them. Were you there when um, uh, Ontario Sports Solutions came to the site? Yeah, through Madam Chair. Um, Thank you, they just, And what did they tell you? So um, we met on August 14th with uh, Ontario Sports Solution and the subcontractor that installed the uh, the panels and the, uh, the precast foot joints. Um, and there was no resolution. They observed. Um, they seen, um, you know, the uh, the rusting of the panels and the loosening of the, the screws. So we walked through the east and the west side, and we showed them uh, the uh, temporary repairs that were completed over the three three years. Councillor. And and so they they accepted no responsibility for it. Rob. Madam Chair, that is correct. They made no comment. They observed the uh, work we did. No comment. Councillor? Well, I just have trouble, Madam Chair, accepting this. We're getting blown off. And if we go and spend a million dollars, we'll never see it again. And there's no urgency to do this because they don't need the stadium right now. When I toured the site, there's clearly a design area. I, I had an opportunity to walk up with Rob and, and Janet and um, others. And one in particular, the person that did the engineering report for us. And there's two main problems. Number one, the screws that hold the panels on um, are way undersized, a little bit tiny, it looks like number 10 screws to hold these panels to protect the public from falling off the back and not falling off the sides of the stadium. And secondly, as he said, and it's true, my experience, and you know, um, there's supposed to be integrity rails running between these four foot panels. So if one fails, the other ones hold it. And we've put some on ourselves, but it was clearly a design fault by not having the integrity rails linking these things together in case they fail. So I just have real serious trouble without getting a proper legal opinion other than we don't know yet, um, going ahead and spending this money. Because once you spend the money, it's gone. and. Uh, and, and particularly when there's no urgency uh, with the stadium not being used. So I won't support this motion. And I think we should refer it back again to get a legal opinion uh, before we spend the money on uh, how we're going to get compensated for this because it's construction issues and design issues. We have no contractual link to Ontario Sports Solution. They were a contractor hired by IO. And to IO, to make the comment that they have don't have the technical expertise is ridiculous. 
That's why they were retained to do this. So I can't support the motion before us today, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I have Councillor Clark, Councillor Danko, Mayor Eisenberger. So start with Councillor Clark, please. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Um, quick question for our staff. So I'm trying to understand exactly what happened when Infrastructure Ontario came to tour the stadium. And it sounded like the staff had indicated they came, they looked at it, and then they really didn't make a comment one way or the other. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, through Madam Chair, um, Councillor uh, Clark, Infrastructure Ontario did not uh, complete a site visit. It was the contractor, Ontario Sports Solution, and the subcontract. Councillor? So have we reached out to Infrastructure Ontario at all? Rob? Through, Mad through Madam Chair, yes, we Thank have, you. and uh, they declined a, a site visit, as we indicated in the uh, information report. They just mentioned that they didn't have the technical uh, expertise. Thank you, Councillor. Have we formally asked Infrastructure Ontario to pay for a portion of this? Rob? Through Madam Chair, um, as legal mentioned, um, this is coming, uh, uh, there'll be a confidential report coming in the next uh, few weeks uh, to uh, discuss or to mention what our next move is as far Thank as uh, the, the latent defects. Thank you, Rob. Councillor? Councillor Ferguson raised a very good question with regards to the timing of this. Is it necessary to spend the 1.1 million now prior to hearing from Infrastructure Ontario? Or would it not be more prudent to wait for the meeting with Infrastructure Ontario to find out whether or not they're what they're going to agree to pay? Rob, are you prepared to answer that? <laughs> through Madam Chair and, um, and Councillor uh, Clark and all the council, um, this is not going to go away. Uh, it's frustrating from uh, our end facilities. Um, you know, we got the cracked and spalling precast joints that are happening. So it's an outdoor stadium. We're gonna have this problem next year. Um, why we came forward is because this is the best time to get this work done. And we're looking at it a health and safety um, for our, you know, next year, hopefully uh, we have full stadiums and uh, mass gatherings, but uh, that's unforeseen right now, but uh, it's a health and safety concern. And that's why we'd like to get it done now if we can. What Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Clark. And what prevents us from doing it in April or May? before the season starts for the, the stadium. Rob? Through Madam Chair. So we also have uh, a professional soccer organization, the Hamilton Forge. And their season, if everything goes well, starts in April. So um, it's been frustrating over the last five years because we've been dealing with uh, many various deficiencies in this building that we all know. And demobilizing and mobilizing in between games and events. So if you if you look at uh, uh, the field of play usage in 2020, um, in 2019, we had over 2,600 hours on field of play, which is the busiest stadium in North America. So it's hard for us, you know, in between games, plus, you know, other licensed events, the Ticats or the city, plus community events we have in the building. So in order that uh, to mobilize and demobilize, it's a lot of work. And that's where there's an extra cost associated with this, uh, this work if we were to do it next season. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Just to let you know, Dan McKinnon is also online. So go ahead, Councillor Clark, you've got the floor. Thank you very much. My last question, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the latitude. Um, I'm trying to understand why the two reports are separate. Why are we receiving this report on the actual uh, funding source and getting direction to proceed prior to receiving the legal report as to what infrastructure Ontario is responsible for or willing to pay. Thank you. Through Madam through Chair. Sorry, I can uh, say through you, Madam Chair, the only thing I would say is that in fact, council did receive and provided instruction in camera previously 
on the in-camera component of this. So while there may be further updates, we, we do have those instructions. And if we want need to go in camera to discuss those, I can pull up that report and, and remind council what that was. Uh, but we do have some direction on that front. So it, it has already been addressed, uh, at least on the in-camera piece. So I'm um, happy to, I mean, council's hands as to how you would like to handle that. So, Councillor Clark, a last question, please, because I I haven't been timing everyone, and I apologize for that. So, I'm assuming you're coming up to five minutes. Um, okay. My questions were less than five minutes, but the answers were more than five minutes. <laughs> I um, know. Um, I, I, I'm still puzzled because maybe I'm the only one here. I'm not sure I know whether or not Infrastructure Ontario is willing to pay anything based on the settlement agreement or is it has a responsibility to pay anything. And so I'm hard pressed to make a decision on $1.1 million when I don't have those answers to those questions. And I'm not sure legal is, is comfortable answering them in public at the moment. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Danko. And I'm starting the five minute timer, folks. Sorry, I apologize. Go ahead, Councillor Danko. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just listening to Council Ferguson's uh, site visit, I mean, clearly the stadium's six years old. We should not be in a position where we're spending $1.1 million of taxpayers' um, funds to repair something that was clearly uh, an issue from day one, um, whether that's the contractor, the designer, or whoever, it's not the taxpayer's responsibility. So. Um, I think it's premature to make a decision on $1.1 million now when the stadium's not even going to be in operation for uh, at least a half a year. Um, my understanding is Forge doesn't even use the upper bowl. So, um, you know, if it's a health and safety issue, I'd be fine with spending some funds now to just simply remove this railing and fence off the area. But uh, I'm not interested in spending the full amount without first getting... Um, a comprehensive legal report back on what our options are to pursue these costs um, legally, whether that's through a lawsuit or through a claim or however. So I don't know if Councillor Ferguson wants to put that on the floor as a as a referral to a future meeting following um, a legal report back. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll put that on the floor at the appropriate time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have Mayor Eisenberger, Councillor Wilson, Councillor Marula. So, uh, Councillor, oh, sorry, Mayor Eisenberger, please. And thank you, and uh, and I appreciate the report. And, you know, this has been a, it's now going to be an ongoing issue, and you know, like most issues with the stadium, ultimately uh, we have to keep the uh, stadium in good repair. And uh, so, on the issue of use. My understanding is there are people that have access to the stadium now. There are people in there. So the Tiger Cats can practice, I understand. Uh, the Forge, uh, so give, give me a sense of kind of the active use. Of so through Madam Chair, and uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor. So presently right now, the Hamilton Forge uh, is in a bubble in Prince Edward Island in the Island Games. So they were back in June for uh, phase one, phase two, and phase three back to training. The Hamilton Tiger Cats were back for phase one and phase two. Only 12 local players were on site their season. The CFL season is canceled, so no one's on site. The building is still considered non-essential and is on lockdown. So that's just a quick update. Mr. Okay, thank, thank you, you Mr. Mayor. And is there any reason to uh, Nicole that uh, I heard that there's a, an upcoming legal report um, is that is that happening, or is that you, you said it was has been dealt with already, but you're providing an update? Uh, through through Mr. Mayor, yes, um, we we did provide, and Council has provi provided direction in that, and I'm happy to to find the date on that. I apologize; I think it was either the last or two meetings ago. Um, regardless, um, we would normally, as that pro progressed, uh, provide Council with an update at some point in the future, and it would really depend on a natural time for that to happen. Um, usually it's at a various points once we start moving um, along the direction that council has been has provided. So um, we can do that. Um, we didn't have a specific time on that, but we can do that. Thank you, Mayor. Didn't I, didn't I hear earlier on that there was a report coming, upcoming? Nicole, upcoming report or the old report? 
uh, both. So we've provided okay. previously seen a report, but if there is um, additional information at various points, we would normally bring that back. We don't have a specific time on that at this point. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, so at some point we need to get this work done. I think uh, Dan McKinnon's on the line. I see him uh, maybe eager, eager to say something, but uh, if, he, if he chooses to, that'd be great. Uh, but you know, can we can we not uh, ask for the legal issue to be brought forward sooner than later, so in the next couple of weeks, so that we can uh, make a decision on this? Uh, you know, the, the railings are going to they're failing and they're going to continue failing, and it has to be dealt with one way or the other. Uh, you know, uh, working with I.O. Uh, <laughs> boy, you 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 know better than any of us uh, how difficult and complicated and uh, how frustrating it is to work with IO. Uh, so holding out hope that they're going to do something, you know, positive here is, uh, I think, a bit of a pipe dream. But notwithstanding, let's let's understand the legal issue before we make a final decision here. But ultimately, uh, this work needs to get done. This is this is our stadium now, and uh, it has to be safe. And I'm sure there are going to be liability issues if we fail to get it done. And what time? What kind of time does it take to get this work done, Rob? Rob. Madam Chair, Mr. Mayor, it's, uh, if we were to get the work done now, we would be able to get it done over uh, a three-month period. It would take three months to get the work done. Through, Ma through Madam Chair, Mr. Mayor, yes, that's correct. So, all right, well, that's important. That's important information. So, in a relative to that, I'm 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 open to asking legal to bring forward their report and uh, defer this until that report is done. Uh, seen by council and then hopefully make a decision as to how we move forward and given the timelines and hopefully, you know, April or May uh, of next year, we're, we're going to have uh, events happening at this uh, facility. So we need to be ready. And certainly this is an opportune time to get the work done. Dan, you have any additional thoughts? Thank you. Can I ask Nicole first, please, uh, the timing on this report coming forward, Nicole, so we have a better understanding if we're going to defer this to what time do we defer it to? Uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, I'm in Council's hands. Um, we can have, okay. something, you know, we can do it as quickly as Council needs to hear that information. I'm going to, I'm going to, Mr. Mayor, the next GIC, which is the 23rd. <laughs> we can get an update at that <laughs> uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Yes, if that's the will of committee, certainly. Okay. Thank you. GIC is 50 pages now. Okay, 51. Thank you, uh, Councilor Wilson. Please. I hope we got your microphone fixed up. Can you unmute her, please? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair Johnson. Can we, can... <laughs> <laughs> My microphone was still on BC time, I guess, at the beginning. Um, come home. Yeah, thank you. Mayor Eisenberger asked m most of my questions. I just uh, want to make sure I understand completely and I, I'm, I'm liking the direction of the discussion. Um, so if I can understand then confirm this facility now is not an essential facility and it's on lockdown and there's nobody using it, it at present and we don't will, would there be any normally any winter use um if there was no pandemic through madam chair um councillor wilson yes we would do room and um, room bookings inside the stadium mm. okay um but at present there is no one using it that is correct the outside Okay, um, just help me out on the room bookings. Uh, what's the relationship between the internal rooms and this work that needs to be done if it's a health and safety issue? Thank Through you. Madam Chair and Councillor Wilson, there's uh, nothing because it would be the exterior of the stadium that uh, the repairs would be completed. Okay, thank you. Um, and the a three month window, um, your remarks earlier um, you're saying perhaps the cost would increase if the work had to be done when the facility is in use. Um, would the length of time also increase then through you, Chair Johnson? Thank through you. Madam, through Madam Chair and uh, Councillor Wilson, that is correct. So if we were to do it over a three three year phase temporary, it would three be month three three month. <laughs> Yeah, but having said that, if we were to do it in a three-year period, oh. phased, three phases, temporary, the cost would go up to one point five million. If we were to do it in a, in a like say a normal year with mobilizing and demobilizing it, if we had to do it around events, tie cats, 
plus uh, the forge, plus any other community events. So that's why it would be three months because they would have the time now to take the panels off, take it, prefab it, and bring it back. Councillor Wilson. Okay, thank you. I, I, I want to make sure I clearly understand what you just said because I think you've said A, this is a health and safety issue, but B, you're saying if the facility returned to normal use, it would take three years to address a health and safety issue through you. Thank Chair. you, Rob. Through Madam Chair and Councillor Wilson, if we were not to get the 1.1 million, we would still have to do the work. And we would have to phase in the work pending on our budget. So that's why I was saying that if we were to do it over a three year period temporary, because what we would have to do is do it in between events. So that's where the problem is, right? Because you're mobilizing, demobilizing, and we would have to do it where, you know, we would do the high risk first and then the medium risk and low risk. We would have to, you know, look at it that way as an option. Councillor Wilson, we also have Rome online now. So if you have any other questions you want to ask, Rome may want to jump in. Councillor Wilson, the floor is still yours. Thank you. I, I'm just trying to understand um, whether we're opening ourselves up for risk, we're admitting that we have a situation that is at risk. This is the first time I've heard there's a high, medium and low risk. And this is the first time I've heard that um, we would still be operational. It, the work would be done and the risk would be present if um, all things being well, uh, the season was operational. Um, so I'm a, a little, concerned about that and um, balancing the increase in cost versus the opportunity cost that we could be using this whip money elsewhere, presumably, um, if the facility is not going to be in use between now um, um, and the spring. I mean, that's a best case scenario. Um, did, would anyone like to comment on that high, medium and low risk? And then presumably it's it would still be operational at that? Through the, through the chair. I'll Good morning, Rome. Question. Good morning, how are you? <laughs> Go I'll ahead. Take, I'll, I'll take that question. Uh, through the chair, um, the question was asked to us at one of the uh, GIC meetings if we can spread this out over a number of years and, and uh, do the work. And our report's based on, if you look at the different risks, uh, there's a high risk, medium risk, and low risk. And there's panels that are categorized in that manner. Staff are recommending that we do it all at once, opposed to phasing it over a number of years uh, through, and obviously your first year would be high risk panels to be done, and then you kind of go down uh, the lower risks and, and spread that out. Uh, because of the mobilization cost, it will cost prob uh, approximately 30 to 35% more if we uh, mobilize and demobilize over a three year period. Our recommendation right now is that we have a stadium that's empty and this is the best opportunity for us to get in there uh, to do it completely at the 1.1 um, uh, million dollar cost, which is a budget cost. We would go out to tender and with the hopes of that number being a little bit lower than the 1.1 million dollars. Uh, but that was a question that was posed to us at one of the GICs. Could we spread this over three years? and cash flow it that way based on the level of risks. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, one additional question. This work- Your five minutes is up, just to let you know. Thank you. Can, can, can this work, sorry. Can this work be done um, over winter months or is it seasonally dependent? You're, I think you said April, so it must be seasonally dependent. Through the, through the chair, um, given, given, the winds, given the different types of winds that come through that stadium, ideally, it would be better that we do it in the spring. And uh, through through the winter months or through the fall, we would start, start to go through the tendering process. Mm -hmm. And uh, with uh, lining it up probably uh, sh shortly after the winter season. Um, can it be done th through the winter months? Uh, Probably, but uh, not ideal situations to do it through the winter months. Uh, we would propose that uh, uh, we go through the administrative process of tendering uh, over the upcoming months with a target start date in uh, in early spring. Okay, Councillor, I want you. to be put back on the list. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Marula, please. 
And then we have Councillor Jackson. Councillor Marola? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. No. Okay, then. Thank you, Madam Chair. And on this point uh, to you, uh, to Rob, what I'm hearing quite clearly is that if we delay it, we're in essence delaying the inevitable. We're going to have to pay for it sooner or later. The question becomes, should the province in any way be responsible as a result of them constructing the stadium and taking ownership of the stadium during the period of construction? So through you, Madam Chair, to Rob, can you elaborate on that point? Rob? Through Madam Chair and Councillor Morella, that, that is correct. Like what... Um, you know, we've settled in litigation with Infrastructure Ontario, and uh, like Legal mentioned, we this would be a separate claim for latent defects. Okay. Thank you, so, Councillor Marilla. So, so we can go directly to a judicial process subsequent to dealing with the liability issue. So the question of whether or not, or whether or not we pay or the province pays, should be dealt with after we deal with the potential public safety issues. Uh, would you agree with that? Through Madam, through Madam Chair and Councillor Morello, that is correct. Uh, I believe uh, uh, solely that this work needs to be done. All right. Thank so you, not, Councillor Morello. I'm not quite sure why we're going through a protracted period of time to delay the inevitable. What we should be focused in on presently is getting the work done and then fighting to get uh, compensated by the province. That's the initiative that we should be focused in on and nothing else. So I, I'm not getting into a stadium debate, but we all know where I stood on that. And we all know where a lot of other people stood on that. You were warned and now we're paying the consequences. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. And we have Councillor Clark for the second time. So Councillor Jackson, please. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. And I think sometimes my, one of my purposes on council is to do a historical recap. Anyways, so 2016, speaker fell down, very embarrassing. Ontario Sports Solutions, under the uh, guidance of Infrastructure Ontario, uh, built a very uh, deficient uh, new stadium. So the skills, and I'm getting to a question to Director D'Angelo and or Manager Gatto, the skills, talent, and professional wisdom need to give kudos to Director D'Angelo and the whole Department of Facilities upon the speaker falling, did a full investigation and came up with the fact that we've got problems with the guard anchor and, every, and some other areas of the stadium need replacement and repair. So through you, Madam Chair, to Director D'Angelo or our manager Gatto, is that what triggered this report that has been brought forward for today? Through you, please. Uh, through, through, oh, wrong. Through, yeah, sorry. Through the chair. Okay. Uh, that is correct, Councillor Jackson. When the speaker fell, uh, we went into full gear of investigating everything overhead. And um, as a result, there were a number of items that we found that were uh, deficient and uh, hence the uh, term latent defects um, and uh, the end guards and the panels were part of that uh, original investigation. And we've extended our investigation to look deeper into those uh, anchors and uh, and the uh, the panels. Well, 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 yeah. Thanks, Madam Chair. Well done, Rome. Thanks for that confirmation, Rome. No additional pressures on our capital or operating budget. Aren't you using works in progress from other existing capital projects that have money available? Through you, Madam Chair, please. Thank you, Rome. Through through the chair, we work closely with corporate uh, services, and uh, one of the questions they asked is. Uh, if we could use our, our own whips, and that's what we did. We uh, dug deeper into our facilities and looked at the projects that were closed uh, with available funds, uh, as well as we are, we're using the uh, entertainment facilities. Now that we're, uh, we're divesting our, uh, those three facilities, uh, we're looking at um, managing those facilities with our maintenance dollars and freeing up some of those capital dollars to attend to the situation at St. Martin's Field. Very astutely done, Rome. That's excellent work looking at other uh, opportunities within your budget to get this 1.1 million done. Madam Chair, if I could do a quick comment within my five minutes. Um, Thank you. Yep. I just want to say, if you recall, during the peak of COVID time, the last six months, when different departments were coming forward, uh, recreational facilities with deficiencies, could they do some maintenance? I strongly encouraged, in fact, borderline insisted to staff 
get those facilities upgraded while they're not in use. Are we out of our minds? We're going to wait till next year and hopefully at the full season of the Tiger Cats and full use of the stadium is back in order. We're going to possibly collide by doing some of the work next spring or maybe getting into the next summer or fall if we delayed this. I, this is such a prudent course of action. Blame Ontario Sports Solution. Blame I.O., but for goodness sakes, don't punish our staff who have brought forward a very responsible course of action. I'm fully supportive. I will not support a deferral. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Second time speaker, we have Councillor Clark and then Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Clark, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate Councillor Jackson's passion, but I'm not trying to punish staff. I'm trying to make sure that we do it prudently and that we don't spend money until we've actually had a discussion with Infrastructure Ontario. Um, we went through this earlier this year with a discussion about spending money prior to having a communication with the ministry. It's prudent to have the discussion with Infrastructure Ontario first and then make the decision uh, on the expenditure. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson, second time speaker. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. And um, I was going to say exactly what Councillor Clark just said. Uh, it also, it's easier to negotiate before the work is completed. Once the work is completed, there's no tension on the system to try to get it resolved. We need to put this back on infrastructure in terms of the whole health and safety issue. Um, the, the facility is not being used. Just a, a quick question back to Rob. Rob, has um, the soccer ever used the upper level of the stadium for any games? Through Madam Chair and um, Councillor Ferguson, uh, they did for uh, in 2019. Uh, Thanks, Mayor. First, for the first uh, first game, they did the Hamilton Forge, but no lower bowl, east and west side lower bowl. My apologies, so, sorry, so Councillor Ferguson. Because of being put at risk, even if they start in April, and I heard Rome say that what he wants to do is prepare the tender documents through the winter, get it tendered, get it awarded, so they can commence as soon as winter breaks. And so we still have lots of time. I mean, if you try, if if the work gets completed, you know the the the, the lawyers are going to delay this thing for years to get resolution. Where if we can publicly hang it on I.O., who have the responsibility to do this before the work is completed and the health and safety risk, I think it gives us more of a lever. And we heard our our city solicitor says she can go back to us very very shortly. Um, yeah, I think I heard her in response to the mayor say she could even come to the next GIC. I'm not sure that's necessary, but two GICs out to give them time to get accurate. But, you know, I just looked up the definition of a latent defect or defined as defects in real property or an improvement to real property that a buyer could not reasonably be expected to ascertain or observe by a careful uh, visual inspection of the property and would pose a direct threat to health and safety of the buyer. Latent defects was in our contract. They, would, they say they don't have the expertise and they won't even come to a meeting. Let's not put this on them. Let's let the media uh, explain to the public that there's health and safety issues and they need to step up and look after it. So therefore, I'm going to put the motion right now that the matter be referred back to the legal department for a, a response uh, from Infrastructure Ontario and a formal position that they're going to take on fixing these latent defects. Okay, so even though you spoke to it, I'm going to allow that. Sorry, folks, because I know that's the direction most of you are headed anyways. Um, so Councillor um, Ferguson has put it forward. I believe Councillor Danko is willing to second that. I'm looking right, shaking his head yes. So first of all, folks, we need to receive 9.6A, and I'll get to you in just a second, um, Mr. Mayor. I just want to fill up the process. 9.6A, we're just receiving that. It's an information report, and then we'll go to 9.6. I'll go back to uh, Councillor Ferguson for his motion. So, uh, Councillor Marula, I've got you as well. Is this about 9.6a or about the deferral? The, the, for the motion. It's about the motion. Okay, so I'll come back to you in a minute. Okay. We're going to receive, first of all, 9.6a, Councillor Partridge, for the deferral, I'm sure. Or you just want to move that? I'll move it. Okay, so we just need to receive 9.6A first, folks. So let's just get that off the table. So we've got Councillor Partridge, I've got Councillor Clark to receive 9.6A. It's electronic vote, please. And then we'll go to, I'll go back to Councillor Ferguson and I have uh, I, Mr. Mayor and I have 
Councilor Marilla for, for that motion. Okay. And Councilor Pearson, Clark, Pauls. Things are pretty wonky here, folks, because it's going to be taking a while to come in, uh, Councilor Pearson. I'm assuming it's a yes anyway. I did it, yeah. Okay. Pro prove it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sorry, Councilor Pearson, your vote isn't showing. So were you in favor or against? I'm in favor. Okay, thank you. And I did vote electronically. Thank you. Okay. Again, folks, it's really wonky in here today. I don't know what happened, um, but be, please be patient. Okay, thank you. The votes are in. At 9.6, I'm going to go to Councillor Ferguson so he can reiterate his motion, seconded by Councillor Danko. Then I'm going to go to Mayor, Mayor Eisenberger and then Councillor Marula for, for speaking on this. Councillor Ferguson, you're on. I'd like to move that the matter be referred back to our legal department for an opinion on the I.O. position and do that by the uh, first GIC meeting in October. Okay, so it's not going to be the September 23rd. It's going to be the 1st October. I can just give them the benefit please? to have more time. So through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, I just need clarification. So if you are referring this report back to staff, it would go back to Public Works. This isn't a legal report. Did you mean to defer this report and wait for legal to come back with additional information? You put the right words to it, Stephanie, that uh, suit the process, but you, you understand what I'm trying to do. I want a legal opinion on IOS taking the position that they don't have any expertise in this area and therefore taking no responsibility. So. I'll let okay. you put the right words to it. All right, so then we're going to be deferring item 9.6, I believe, until the September 23rd GIC, and legal is going to um, provide a response for the 23rd. Can so I, we're can I come September just 23rd. Is, is there not one earlier than the 23rd, Stephanie, in October? No, it's, it's September, September 23rd. Councillor Ferguson, it's September 23rd. It's going to be referred back to. Okay. Next GIC. Okay. Is that, is that all right as the mover of the motion? Yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. All right, so now we go to Council, or sorry, Mayor Eisenberger, please. You just clarified what I was gonna to speak to, which, uh, you know, what, the way it started, his motion was open-ended and, you know, down the road, we'll get a report back. Uh, September 23rd works for me, so I can support that. But at that point, in my view, we need to make a decision and get this work done because, uh, you know, continuing to delay this thing. IO and the city of Hamilton and the province of Ontario actually signed off on uh, uh, an arrangement on all of the, uh, the work that was in the, that was in dispute, uh, save and accept, and potentially, and this is maybe where legal can come in later on, the, the latent deficiencies that weren't visible at the time. But I, I think it's a bit of a shell game to try and get this done through IO, but in any event, let's get the legal opinion, but let's have it sooner rather than later so that we can get on with getting this important work done and getting our stadium into shape in, 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 the, in the kind of the work season. It, it is a terrible time to do that, that kind of work in the winter time. Uh, it is better to do it uh, sooner rather than later. So I'm, I'm on for that. So I'll support it if it's the 23rd and I, I understand it is, so I'm, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marilla, uh, you're speaking to the motion, please. That's great. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, just on the motion, again, now I got clarity on the, on the dates, which helps a great deal. Mm -hmm. But I'm still trying to pinpoint what the purpose and objective is, considering there isn't a warranty not sure what we're waiting for with respect to an opinion. So if we could get clarity, maybe through um, through you, Madam Chair, to Nicole, we know what IO's position is, and that is that there this isn't part of the warranty. This would be a new legal claim. They've made their first decision to basically reject any involvement or responsibility. So we would actually have to take legal action at this point. Is that correct through you, uh, Madam Chair? Um, city solicitor McCulty, are you in the room? Yes. yes. And is this something you want to discuss out in open camera? Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. In fact, yes, this was the subject matter of an in-camera report. So if we're going to be bringing that back to the 23rd, I'm happy to provide council with that uh, further information and re review that uh, earlier report as well at that time. It's, it's okay, so maybe I should rephrase the question. Thank is you. there a warranty that we can activate at this point an existing warranty uh, that we can activate at this point with respect to I.O., which is, in essence, to, to not confuse the public, Infrastructure Ontario is the province of Ontario. So uh, just so everyone knows, it's Queen's Park, because for years we've had to explain that it wasn't our project, it wasn't our construction 
um, site. We literally gave up ownership to the province, then built it. Um, so can, can we just elaborate on the fact that we have no warranty that we can activate, that this would be a new claim, as Rob already concluded. And I'm, so, so that's all I want to know, is that we have no warranty to activate at this point. This would be a new claim. So Nicole, are you comfortable answering this right now, or do you want to go in camera to answer that? So through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, I think the challenge is that, that there's some legal issues around that, Councillor. Uh, I think the, yeah. the bigger picture is is simply getting Council's direction, which we have been provided, but I'm happy to either work okay. with uh, PW or how we respond to that publicly so Fair that enough. we can explain. But just so you know, we have no political clout at Queen's Park because we have all opposition members. So we're not going to get this, just like we've not gotten anything else we've asked for. So folks, we have to wake up. Let's not go through this protracted period of time, waste time, to know that we're going to get rejected at the end of the day. So I appreciate that it's on the 23rd, and that's the only reason why I'm supporting it. We can expedite this political stunt, but we're not getting any further. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. And the motion is now on the table. I don't see any more speakers. And it is to defer this to the September 23rd GIC. I'm sorry, Councillor Danko, I apologize. I was just given your name. And Councillor Ferguson again. So Councillor Danko, please. Now, just following up on Councillor Marula's point, um, that I just want to clarify that the legal options that will be reported back would also be options to pursue costs, whether or not IO is um, is uh, cooperative or not. Um, in, in this uh, in this situation, it seems there is clearly um, some fault here from the construction and the design. So, whether or not IO is is um, amiable to a warranty, or if that's part of existing warranties, I'd still just want to make sure with legal that all options will be uh, presented back. Okay, thank you. Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Ms. Madam Deputy Mayor, and I too uh, have greater concerns as Councillor Marula. Um, I, I am really terrified of liability and I believe we're gonna end up having to do this work anyways. I will support the motion just to go to the, the end of September, but uh, then we have to get on with this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson, second time. Yeah, just on the, um, the warranty thing, Senator Corner, Rob, there is latent provision, latent defect provisions in our contract. Uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, yes, I think the real challenge is that there's a lot of issues around it, Councillor. I'm happy to bring that report back and we can go through those in detail with you. So the latent defect provisions of the warranty are still in place then? In through camera. You, sir, yes, we will go through that, all of those in camera for you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. So the motion's on the table. It's moved by Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Danko, that this be referred to the September 23rd GIC uh, for more legal advice. Thank you very much, and please electronic vote. Got everybody? Okay, super. And I see that it is carried. Uh, we go with 9.7, folks. This is the grant increase to an existing environmental remediation and site enhancement. Erase. Redevelopment grant approval for 467 Charlton Avenue East, PED 16037. May I, I need a mover and a seconder. I've got Councillor Farr. I believe you also want to speak to it, sir. Yep. And Councillor, or sorry, Mayor Eisenberger is going to second it. And I'm going to go to Councillor Farr, please. Just uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, quick You're housekeeping. Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Yes. No. <laughs> Uh, while I enjoyed many years of uh, great public engagement on this very special Vista Condos uh, three mid-rise uh, project in a challenging spot, and I appreciated all the extra work that staff did over many years, so the proponents' investment uh, in that uh, historic property, and what I'm seeing now, and I think what the community is seeing and appreciating is actually a project that looks better uh, 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 now that it's uh, near completion than it actually did on the spectacular drawings provided by their architect, I regret to say, actually, with all those years and all the great uh, engagement, both from the public, from the staff, and from the uh, proponent, uh, that it's no longer Ward 2, so you got to change that to 3. And uh, oh. um, I, I completely understand, given all of the engagement, that we still have 2 there, but it's uh, Councillor Nan's uh, baby now. Thank you. 
Thank you, and we'll make sure to do, do that housekeeping, please. Thank you very much. And Judy Lamb is also online if we need any other questions, but I don't see any, so it is on the floor. Councillor Farr, seconded by Mayor Eisenberger. Uh, electronic vote again, please. Thank you. So it's finished. Now we're on to 9.8 federal and provincial government funding announcements update. Mike Segarik is so excited about this. So it is moved by Councillor Nan, seconded by Councillor Jackson to put it on the floor. Are there any questions respecting 9.8? I'm not seeing any. Thank you. So can we have an electronic vote, please? Oh, Mr. Mayor? No. Nope. I'm not seeing anybody else. Thank you very much. Electronic vote. It's coming. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So we're going to do one last item, and then we're going to try this again. 9.9 .9, Airport Employment and Growth District AEGD Wastewater Servicing Update and Capacity Allocation Policy PED 20040 PED 20055. I need a mover and a seconder. So if I can please have Councillor Ferguson, second by Councillor Pearson. Uh, we have Guy Paparella online if we need, Tony Sergi and Jason Thorne are present if we need any questions. Are there any questions or comments? We have Councillor Jackson, please. And then we have Councillor Danko. Thank you, Councillor Jackson, please. Madam Chair, just maybe a nice uh, overview because it's been a while since we've heard any updates regarding uh, airport development and airport land growth. And uh, we just saw a wonderful announcement through the mayor's office today regarding Amazon deciding on our Monroe Airport. Maybe that $250,000 uh, bidding to bring Amazon here has eventually paid off. Great news. Maybe just an update from staff as to what this report is about and why it's here. Through you, Madam Chair. And that's all I need to know. Thank you. Thank you. And so who would like to do that, please? Uh, oh, hello, Mr. Paparella. Hello, Madam Chair. Uh, through you uh, to councillors, uh, there's a lot of activity, obviously, in the uh, airport area right now. Uh, DHL is locating their, their large facility, their sort facility, right on the property. Uh, last year, um, AF, which uh, is uh, a, um, a maintenance and repair facility for uh, large planes, uh, expanded on the airport itself creating more jobs. Uh, they are also building a Mohawk College campus right beside them uh, so that they can actually hire uh, the students graduating from the uh, aviation program as employee, future employees in the area. So that's very exciting. There's also over 7 million square feet of development uh, in the AGD area itself. Uh, Panettone's announcement this morning with Amazon obviously is a big one. They have a number of other projects on the books. Um, it's probably 3,500 to 4,000 jobs uh, potentially linked to, to that. Uh, so there is quite a bit of activity uh, up there. And um, this report uh, delves into some of that and that's background for you. Councillor, if there's any questions regarding that, uh, I don't know if uh, Norm Schleyhan's online as well. He might, uh, there's there's a lot of activity going on up there. There's about 26 different applications. So there's a number of uh, 
exciting things happening and uh, a lot of opportunities uh, for Hamilton to grow and progress. Thanks, so direct Mike. and uh, Councillor Jackson, just to interrupt a bit, um, yep. Norm Sheelan is online if you want to further your nope. conversation. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Paparella, thanks for that uh, growth summary. So maybe between yourself and Director uh, Grice, now you can tie in this report of the wastewater capacity allocation policy and why you're hoping for committee approval today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, th through you, Madam Chair, uh, and I'll let Andrew speak to the uh, the development, the infrastructure de uh, development upgrades and rehabilitation component. But essentially, uh, as I've indicated before, they're due to the significant increase in development activity and, and uh, the unfortunate limit, uh, limitation or constraint that we have on wastewater uh, capacity in the area. Council, in their wisdom, uh, recently approved about uh, $15 million, invested $15 million in substantial capital improvements and rehabilitation of the wastewater infrastructure uh, around uh, the AGD in and around, particularly uh, three pumping stations uh, in the area uh, in order to support this growing, prosperous and uh, healthy uh, economic growth that we're getting in that area. So in order to maintain that provision of uh, wastewater capacity, conveyance and treatment, we, we felt uh, in the approval area uh, in growth management that we needed a, a policy or a guideline that was required to provide a consistent, fair and equitable uh, and financially sustainable process actually, uh, which uh, would guide how wastewater capacity can be managed and aligned with the growth strategies and priorities we have in the AGD and in the city in general. So uh, Appendix B outlines this draft uh, wastewater capacity allocation policy that we have. Um, it outlines sustainability criteria, it outlines uh, wastewater capacity allocation agreement concept where we would get financial upfront uh, costs uh, from developers as it happens uh, in order in exchange for allocation of, of, of uh, sewage treatment capacity. There's also an option uh, you'll notice uh, in Appendix B for a public interest project. So I, I know uh, council is considering a number of, of uh, things in that area, uh, things like schools or any other projects uh, uh, that are of community interest um, can also be looked at as a priority. But primarily, we want to put in place a policy that focuses and prioritizes non-residential development first, obviously, because of the municipal assessment and uh, job creation uh, objectives. Uh, it also would enhance the completion of, of communities, there are certain gaps in infrastructure which we want to complete. So certain developments will help facilitate that. And then any other employment type related uses, commercial and institutional uh, type of, of uses would be a third priority. And then fourthly, we'd look at residential because we feel that um, that is a lower priority and, and, and not as important as the others. And again, this is a short term um, policy that we want to put in place for this area until the uh, larger uh, Dickinson Road trunk sewer uh, is is commenced and completed. Uh, that'll uh, help uh, dramatically increase <coughs> our water capacity for the AGD to continue on this uh, growth path that we have at this point. So, um, thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Director. Thank you very much, Director, for that expansive response, Madam Chair. Uh, just a summary comment. Uh, the last, since amalgamation, the expert hands of Director uh, Paparella has nurtured the Airport Employment Growth District. It's an economic engine amidst the downtown renewal, everything going on in our city. I've been a strong supporter, and we're seeing the fruits of the labor, and John C. Monroe, the former late great minister, would be proud. Thanks, Madam Chair.
Thank you, Councillor uh, Jackson. Just to let you know, I let Guy go on like that because he's um, wrapping up in two weeks. He's retiring in two weeks, so he's just getting oh. his, his last his last hurrah. Way to go, Guy! And you can see his grandchild in the background, so you know what he's going to be spending his time doing. So, way to go, Guy! We're really proud of you. Uh, so now we're on to Councillor Danko, please. Thank you. I, I don't know how to to follow that up now. Um, I know. Is this your last meeting, Guy? Potentially, yes, I think so. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Um, quick, quick question for me. Uh, the 20 Road Westlands, which were originally part of the Airport Employment and Growth District and through a OMB settlement were taken out of that area and taken out of the urban boundary altogether. Does this policy include that 20 road Westlands at all, or is that part of a similar or a, a separate um, agreements? Right now, excuse me, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, right now, those areas are not included in the um, urban boundary, so they would not qualify for uh, sanitary uh, wastewater capacity at this point. So. What we're looking at is, is a situation where we need to make sure from a planning standpoint that those areas uh, have been included in the study area, for example, or in the area of influence for this policy allocation, but no allocation will be uh, provided to them because no development is permitted in those areas uh, at this time because they're still designated rural. But uh, obviously, when you're putting infrastructure in, if there are projects that uh, can be uh, um, expanded or in, in increased in terms of capacity for future development, then we have to consider that as part of that development. But right now, there's no intent to include those, uh, those three pockets at this time. Councillor? Thank you, Guy. That the, just wanted a clarification on that particular property. And as we know, the there's a urban boundary expansion application in for that that particular uh, site. And who knows what happens these days with minister zoning orders? It could turn around tomorrow and all of a sudden rezone yeah. it and expand our urban boundary against our our will. So, um, I think just reassuring for me to hear that uh, the priority here is non-residential employment growth areas and uh, that those those areas currently aren't within the, the plans. Thank you. Thank you. We've got Councillor Clark, please. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple of quick questions. So I understand that the Woodward Sewer Treatment Plant renovations and construction will be complete soon. Can I find out what the additional capacity for wastewater at Woodward will be from the, that construction? Are we increasing the capacity? I guess that would be for Mr. McKinnon or Mr. Grice. Yeah, through you, uh, Madam Chair, if I may, uh, Carrie Van Der Perk's on the line, but I will uh, take a run at that. The work that's ongoing at the Woodward Wastewater Treatment Plant right now is not for expansion of capacity. Uh, it's primarily uh, some big replacement projects as well as the construction of the tertiary facility. So that is really uh, there for the singular purpose of improving the quality of effluent leaving the wastewater plant. Uh, we continue to monitor uh, flows to the plant and on an annual basis determine the utilization of the capacity at the plant. Um, as it stands right now, we don't anticipate having to expand the plant uh, for at least a decade, uh, but even a decade away would require us to start doing some work now as far as pre-designs, uh, environmental assessments and that kind of thing. So as far as the capacity at the plant, uh, this this uh, uh, report in front of you has no impact on that and uh, we won't be increasing capacity for about another decade. So do we, yes, do we expect bypasses to happen at the plant? I know we've impro we're improving the quality of the effluent dramatically with tertiary treatment. So given what's been transpiring in the last two years, do we expect the plant to be able to handle the, the flow of wastewater that is coming in with these storms? 
Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the, the question that is always the follow-up question on that is what kind of storms are we gonna have? We certainly have lots of capacity to accept the wastewater flows that uh, this file represents. Uh, the challenge will be just understanding what type of wet weather we're gonna have going forward. Um, and that's always, that's always a, a challenge. Uh, the, the reality is, uh, my belief is that we're gonna continue to have wet weather events that are gonna require us to bypass at the wastewater plant at Woodward. Uh, certainly the investments that council's made over the last 20 years has uh, reduced the amount of contaminants flowing to the harbor as a result of increases in our primary clarification. Uh, the new uh, uh, high lift pump station that's being constructed there will also uh, minimize the amount of raw sewage that goes to the uh, goes to the um, to the harbor as well. And then under normal conditions, the tertiary plant will be treating to such a high standard. Um, that the ability for the harbor to recover uh, uh, during times of dry weather will also just generally improve the overall performance as well. Okay, so given the events of the 100 year storms, given the population increase and the increase in development that we're expecting in El Frida and now right across the entire city, um, and given that your own statement was in the next 10 years, we're gonna to have to look at capacity. Are we looking at capacity, building additional capacity at Woodward now? So Is we are, uh, through you, Madam Chair, we are uh, initiating the uh, studies that would uh, inform decisions around how to increase capacity and to what level we would increase capacity. Maybe just as a reminder, like typically we're, you we're usually talking about the combined sewer system when we talk about bypasses at the plant or overflows. And in a typical combined sewer, um, there's a very small portion that uh, is generally used by the, the wastewater and the biggest portion of that sewer is used by the stormwater. And so the, uh, the challenge is always just trying to find the balance between those two things. Not only are we gonna be looking at increasing the capacity at the plant, uh, but we're also going to be looking for ways to increase capacity within the conveyance system on the combined system as well, and as well as getting wet weather flow out of the combined system so that it never gets in there in the first place. In this particular file, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of work trying to get uh, what we call inflow and infiltration out of the, uh, the sewer that leads to the 20 road pump station in order to do just that, to try to minimize the amount of occurrence of uh, overflows and bypass. So um, quick comment, the uh, wastewater capacity allocation policy that was attached and fully support it, fully support what is being proposed um, for the airport employment growth district. I guess um, a quick question on my comment would be, is this the type of policy that we may be forced to undertake in other development areas? I'm thinking El Frida, um, because we simply do not have the capacity downstream to handle the flow. Through, through you, Madam Chair, I, I think I would want to defer to, to, to Guy on that. It, typically the operation kind of behind the curtain is that Hamilton Water tells development how much capacity we have in the system. And then uh, our planning uh, partners would allocate that uh, as they see fit uh, out in the development community. So maybe uh, Guy could uh, add a little more to that. Guy? Sure, uh, through you, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, the third recommendation, recommendation C, actually uh, recommends that we formulate a citywide wastewater capacity allocation policy and report back to uh, GIC and Council uh, on Q4 in 2021. So, yeah, we we presume that there is going to be issues in the in the future. Uh, we want to make sure that development uh, doesn't. Uh, um, you know, exacerbate the problems that might come up. I'm not saying there are problems now, but I think it's important to to have a belts and suspenders type of approach to development, especially if the pace of development increases dramatically, um, which hopefully after COVID you will see an uptick in development, uh, not just in the AGD, but across the city. So. We feel it's important to introduce that citywide policy to help address other hot spots in the uh, in the city uh, in in that fashion. Excellent, thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate that answer. Thank you. 
Thank you, and I allowed a little latitude there because we were talking about capacity allocation policy right across the board. Um, so folks, we have Councillor Ferguson seconded by Councillor Pearson that this be approved today. Electronic vote, please. <laughs> and as I mentioned before, folks, comes in, we are going to go back to the delegates and make see if we can get the videos to work. Maybe in the meantime, we can ask if Mayur has been online. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Partridge, my apologies. No worries. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, since this may be Guy's last uh, meeting, I just wanted to say, I mean, I'm, I'm being a member of the airport committee, uh, and you were a chair with um, with Councillor Ferguson. I just wanted to say how how um, the incredible work that Guy has done over the years. And I, you know, our our residents uh, in the city of Hamilton, they really don't get to see the negotiating and the working with companies, the building of the of the airport lands, bringing that on stream. And my lord, I think <laughs> I think those lands in particular have been in the works for, for 25, 30 years. And, and it's a, you know, the commitment and the dedication and the loyalty. And Guy, I just wanted to express my personal thanks. Um, you know, I don't speak on behalf of others, but uh, you're going out on a really fine note, sir. Uh, you, you've brought a lot to the city. You've done a lot. And uh, we thank you so much for the airport lands. Take care. Well said, Councillor Partridge. The airport's in my ward, and I do deal with a guy yeah. a lot, so I couldn't yeah. have said it nicer myself. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, seeing no one else, uh, Guy, thank you so much. Enjoy thank you. your ne your next journey. Thank you. Um, is the vote all completed, ma'am? Oh, Councillor Farr. He's saying no. He's not voting. <laughs> oh, he's there. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you. That was Guy's other half that was just speaking. Okay, folks, now we're going to go back to back meetings, delegations. Let's going to try the videotapes one more time. Tamara has been working feverishly here. Okay, Tamara, we're going to give this a try. And I believe, folks, that the names of the people are on the video. So instead, if, unless there's a pause in between videos, we're just going to let them roll. Hello, my name is Hey, Terrence, and I'm a resident in Ward 4. I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund Hamilton Police. The police do not keep us safe, and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. Even if police had the best of intentions, and there are many examples to show that that's not true of the Hamilton Police Service, the main problems of our city are not problems that police are ever going to be able to solve. The high cost of housing, systemic racism, precarious jobs, environmental degradation. At best, the police are unable to do anything about these problems, but more often, police make these problems much worse and are indeed part of the cause. In light of the city's affordable housing crisis and deep inequality in a range of areas, there are far more effective ways to spend public dollars. Think of how we could strengthen our city, build community by cutting the police budget by 20%. A 20% reduction is possible. Think about this. The city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget, but only 44.3 million will go to housing services. We spend $171 million on policing, but the city of Hamilton will spend only $158 million on social services. This is shameful. These priorities are out of whack. Hamilton police will spend $78,806 on ammunition and $61,409 on taser. The sole purpose of these things being to physically harm residents, and they could be spent on social services. The city and police should not have the power or the tools to physically assault residents and should not have access to these weapons or a budget for them. 
take the money from the grossly inflated police budget and invest it in affordable housing, in schools, in food pro programs, recreation, social services, safe injection sites, mental health supports, youth programming, shelters, climate-related issues, anti-racist initiatives. We're demanding an immediate 20% reduction in the police budget now. Full transparency of the police budget line by line. We want $30 million cut from HPS salaries, specifically from Division 1, 2, and 3. We want money cut from the mounted unit, action team, and victim services. The city councilor and council and, and individual councilors, I mean, you can make this decision. This is not impossible. It's a question of priority. Do you want to pump more tax dollars into the already bloated police budget that's failing to properly address and actually making worse the problems of our city? Or do you want to breathe life and energy and hope into the community? You're all facing immense pressure to cut in light of the COVID crisis. And here is an easy one. It's being handed to you. Cut the police budget by 20% and reinvest in our communities. Thanks for your time. So Tamara, we're just gonna keep going into the next one after that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, James, for uh, participating today. Councillors, it'll just take a quick moment for Tamara to switch over summer through links. So some she has to pull open from a site. Thank you. Hello, City Council. Um, my name is Emily Mayer, and I'm currently a resident in Ward 1, though I grew up in Ward 5, and I'm a proud Hamiltonian. Um, I have my Hamilton is home shirt on, and I'm sending you this pre-recorded video uh, in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. Why are uh, policing costs the highest costs to Hamilton taxpayers um, when we have an affordable housing crisis? Uh, wait lists hundreds long to access social housing. Um, the police do not keep us safe, and we are demanding that you reinvest in our community. So thankfully, a 20% uh Hello, City Council. Um, my name is Emily Mayer, and I'm currently a resident in Ward 1, though I grew up in Ward 5, and I'm a proud Hamiltonian. Um, I have my Hamilton is home shirt on, and I'm sending you this pre-recorded video uh, in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. Why are uh, policing costs the highest costs to Hamilton taxpayers um, when we have an affordable housing crisis? Uh, wait lists hundreds long to access social housing. Um, the police do not keep us safe, and we are demanding that you reinvest in our community. 
So thankfully, a 20% uh, budget uh, reduction to HPS is possible. Um, the police service budget went up 50% in five years, including the fact that Hamilton uh, police have 17 new full-time officers that work to violently oppress those made vulnerable in Hamilton, while Ontario Works lost 44 hires uh, who provided support to those same people. Um, similarly, the, action, uh, the city is spending um, money on the action police teams who disproportionately hard surveil and harass Black, Indigenous, houseless, and racialized people in our city. Um, we're spending $171 million on policing in Hamilton, while the city will only spend a comparative $158 million on social services. This is a shame. This is deeply upsetting, and it makes it really hard to be proud of and connected to my city, knowing that this is how taxpayer money is being spent um, so the HPS needs to be defunded because Hamilton has this $3.3 billion infrastructure deficit and a $23 million COVID deficit. So the answer to mitigate this deficit is very clear to me. It is to defund the police, um, the thing that our city is spending the most on. Um, so the city is spending, like I said, this $171 million on policing during a pandemic, while Martin prisoners are currently on another hunger strike for basic living conditions like access to outside books, daily yard access, um, and disinfectant and soap, um, all of which are such entirely reasonable demands, that contrast is just as troubling to me. Um, so as a graduate student and future teachers college applicant, I know it to be absolutely vital that education be well-funded. We must prioritize the safety and well-being of students over a perceived need to over-police them, which is why I was so um, grateful to hear on June 22nd uh, down at the sit-in at Maine and Bay that HWDSB trustees agreed to get cops out of schools, but this was really only the beginning. Um, so this tireless work of Hamilton's youth, especially the HWDSB Kids Need Help Coalition, provide city officials like yourselves with ample evidence to defund the police. The experiences that Black, Indigenous, and racialized students have with police inside Hamilton schools, as well as the experiences of um, LGBTQ plus people like myself and, and houseless folks in our city speak volumes. Um, the police cause harm. We have this evidence. Um, so defunding the police, on the contrary, means that affordable housing um, food programs, recreation, schools, social services, safe injection sites, mental health supports, uh, youth programming, shelters, climate related issues, anti-racism initiatives can all receive necessary funding. Um, so therefore, I fully support the coalition's demands, which are as follows. Um, this immediate 20% reduction to the HPS budget, full transparency of the line by line police budget, um, we're wanting 30 million cut from HPS salaries, especially from Hi. divisions one, two, and three. We want many cut from the mounted unit, action team, and victim services. Um, and these are all in complete solidarity with the Barton Prisoners Solidarity Project um, with their demands. So starting yesterday morning, August 5th, and I'm a resident resident in Ward 11. B at Barton Jail initiated a hunger strike, which was their third uh, in the past two months. Um, their most recent hunger strike in late July ended quickly when the administration agreed to meet their core demands, um, access to books from outside and more items available from the canteen. However, it seems that these were empty words as more than a week later, there had been no follow through. Um, so the demands, those uh, access to books, items in the canteen, um, raising the weekly canteen purchase limit, ending lockdowns, allowing anybody to visit. Uh, ending the delays in mail delivery, having daily access to the yard and to keep and improve the new phone system. All of these perfectly reasonable demands um, being made are also like I'm in complete support with them as well. Um, so delay and pushback in this case, I would say are not acceptable. Um, and I'm calling for you to fund communities, not cops. Thank you. Thank you, um, and sorry for that interruption before. That was a uh, another video getting started up ahead of time. Tamara's way ahead of the game here. Yes, ma'am. Tamara, if it's easier, just put them in any order that's easiest for you, as long as they all get presented. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Maddie Brockbank and I'm a resident in Ward 11 
and a graduate student at McMaster University in the School of Social Work. I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton Police. Why are policing costs the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and a wait list of hundreds for social housing? The police do not keep us safe and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. A 20% reduction to the police budget is possible. The city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget, but only $44.3 million on housing services, $4.8 million on unhoused people, and $158 million on social services. The women's sector, where I've worked previously, which includes women's shelters, counseling services, violence against women's services, and sexual assault centers, continue to be severely and chronically underfunded. And this is a shame. The Hamilton police need to be defunded because Hamilton has a $3.3 billion infrastructure deficit and a $23 million COVID deficit. The answer to mitigate this deficit is clear, to defund the Hamilton police. Taxpayer money, taxpayer money sh could and should be spent on providing housing for houseless residents and not a police budget that continues to criminalize poverty. I myself as a social worker have worked with at-risk and street-involved youths who have been stigmatized, pathologized, and criminalized simply for not having access to stable shelter. The city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on policing during a pandemic while Barton prisoners are currently on a hunger strike for basic living conditions like access to outside books, daily access to yard, and disinfecting soap. Frankly, the police do not keep us safe. On Saturday, my friend and I were walking around my neighborhood in Ward 11, and we experienced a hate incident where two white men yelled homophobic and sexist slurs at us as we walked around in rainbow and Black Lives Matter masks. Neither of us felt safe calling police after what happened at Pride Hamilton in 2019, and the ongoing escalation of violence from yellow vesters and the Hamilton police's failure to intervene adequately. As a social worker in Hamilton, I would like to see this money divested from policing and invested into our communities, grassroots organizations, and social services. A number of sectors that are chronically underfunded would greatly benefit, including housing supports and shelters, free legal services for at-risk and vulnerable populations, anti-racist organizations like the HCCI, the Hamilton Care Mongering Program, the Disability Justice Network of Ontario, Sexual Assault Centers, Women's Services, Mental Health Services, Safe Injection Sites, among many more organizations in Hamilton doing important work for our community. I've worked with these organizations, I've seen it firsthand, they continue to be underfunded and overworked and people need this money to provide adequate service. The people of Hamilton are demanding an immediate 20% reduction in the police budget full transparency of the line-by-line -line police budget, and we want $30 million cut from the Hamilton police salaries, specifically from Division 1, 2, and 3. We want money cut from the mounted unit, forces, action team, and victim services. Also, starting this morning on August 5th, prisoners on range 4B in the Barton Jail initiated a hunger strike, their third in the past two months. We also demand that the city of Hamilton end the Barton prisoner hunger strike by meeting their demands, and these demands are as follows. Access to books from the outside, more items on canteen, raise the weekly canteen purchase limit, end lockdowns, allow anyone to visit, finally end the delays in mail delivery, daily access to yard, keep and improve the new phone system. Prisoners continue to be isolated from their families and friends and the communities, and this has a severely adverse impact on their mental health and well-being. Please consider what the community has repeatedly been telling you to defund the police and invest in communities. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you, Maddie. I believe Jacqueline is up next. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Cantor, and I'm a resident in Ward 2 in Hamilton, and I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. Why are policing costs the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and wait lists of hundreds for social housing? The police do not keep us safe, and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. A 20% reduction is possible. 
The city of Hamilton will spend 171 million on the police budget, but only 4.8 million on unhoused people. The city spends money on action police teams who card, surveil, and harass black, indigenous, unhoused, and racialized people in the city. The police service budget has gone up almost 50% in just five years. The HPS needs to be defunded because the city of Hamilton will spend 171 million on policing during a pandemic while Barton prisoners are currently on hunger strike for basic living conditions like access to outside books, daily access to yard and disinfecting soap. This money should be going toward affordable housing, safe injection sites and services that would actually provide care for our communities. The demands being made, which I personally support are an immediate 20% reduction, full transparency of the line by line police budget. And we want $30 million cut from HPS salaries, specifically from divisions one, two, and three. We want money cut from the mounted unit action team and victim services. Also starting this morning, August 5th, prisoners on range 4B in the Barton jail initiated a hunger strike, their third in the past two months. Their most recent strike in late July ended quickly when administration agreed to meet their core demands, access to books from the outside and more items available from the canteen. However, it seems that these were empty words as more than a week later, there has been no follow through. We demand the city of Hamilton and the Barton prisoner strike, prisoner hunger, hunger strike by meeting their demands. The demands are as follows access to books from the outside, more items on canteen, raise the weekly canteen purchase limit, end lockdowns, allow anyone to visit, finally end the delays in mail delivery, daily access to yard, and keep and improve the new phone system. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you Jacqueline, and I believe, um, Actually, I'm just going to let Tamara do the list, whatever's easier for her. We'll see who's coming up. Yep, okay, we've got Matt Stesky. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Matt and I'm a resident in Hamilton Ward 9 and I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. Uh, as of right now, the city intends to spend $171 million on the police. Uh, this is an astonishing misallocation of funds in the midst of a serious ongoing crisis. Why are we spending $171 million on the police and only $44 million on housing services when the city is in the middle of a housing crisis? The 2020 budget allocates only $4.8 million towards the needs of unhoused people, but $171 million for a police agency with an appalling record of violence and oppression against that vulnerable population. And in the midst of a global pandemic threatening to put even more people out of work and turn even more people out on the streets, the Hamilton police are going to hire 17 new full-time officers while Ontario Works will lose 44 employees. Uh, to allocate taxpayer funds in this manner is nothing short of waging a war against the most vulnerable members of our community. The city has decided that rather than help poor people, it would rather criminalize poverty. It is unacceptable, it sickens me, and it cannot stand. I am joining many others in my community to demand an immediate 20% reduction in the Hamilton Police Services budget, a $30 million cut from HPS salaries, specifically divisions one, two, and three, the mounted unit, and the action team. We are further demanding a $2.5 million cut in the materials and supply budget and the demilitarization of the Hamilton Police. We are demanding that this money be reinvested in our communities, in affordable housing for the hundreds of people that are still on the wait list for social housing, in safe injection sites for people struggling with addiction, 
and in mental health services and education. Finally, we are demanding that the city end the Barton prisoner hunger strike by meeting their demands. The city has repeatedly promised to provide basic quality of life improvements, daily yard access, disinfecting soap, access to outside books, and these promises have proven empty. The city has a responsibility to all residents of Hamilton, and we cannot simply dismiss that charge if those suffering are locked away out of sight. An injury to one is an injury to all. If the city council truly does care about ensuring the safety of their constituents, please act on these demands immediately. Addressing the material needs of our neighbors in need is not only a more effective solution for deterring crime, but it is also our moral responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Atlas, thank you. Atlas is up next. Hi there, my name is Atlas, my pronouns are they, them, and I am a resident of Hamilton Ward 3. I am sending this pre-recorded video in support of defunding the police. Why are policing costs so high? The highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers. We are facing an affordable housing crisis, and I demand that you, you divest from the violent colonial policing institutions and invest in our communities instead. The policing budget is a whopping $171 million. This is a 50% increase over the past five years, well beyond the rate of inflation. This is Hello, enormous uh, my name compared is to Alex the minuscule $4.8 million that would be spent on unhoused people and only $44.3 million on housing services. I believe that this money should be reinvested in affordable and accessible housing for all. This actually saves money in the long run. A study by the University of Melbourne found that each bed provided by the government on average provided a net benefit of $10,800 per year. It is cheaper to provide housing for people than it is to criminalize poverty. As well, I think that this money should be reinvested in accessible and comprehensive mental health care for all. I believe that everyone should be provided the needed uh, mental health care that they need. Our demands are an immediate 20% reduction in the policing budget, full transparency of the police budget line by line, 30 million cut from the Hamilton Police Service's salaries, uh, 2.5 million cut from the materials and supplies in order to demilitarize the police, and 2 million should be cut from overtime pay. This is not the last step in defunding the police, but simply the first step in deep, uh, investing in our community. And this is only this is only the beginning, and we will continue from here on. Thank you, Atlas. I believe Alex is on next. In fact, I thought I heard that person's name earlier. <laughs> That's okay. There's Alex. Hello, uh, my name is Alex Kerner and I'm a resident of Ward 4 in the Ground Point area. I'm sending this uh, pre-recorded uh, video in support of the call to defund uh, the Hamilton Police and to reinvest in essential programs like affordable housing and other services that are key for ordinary and poor folk here in Hamilton. Um, one of the reasons I think we're, myself and many others, are supporting this call, uh, especially in the context as of uh, the council debating whether or not we're going to spend huge amounts of money uh, in the Commonwealth Games is about the priorities that we should have. Uh, we know that in Hamilton, uh, the Hamilton police budget is $171 million. It's gone up by 50% in the last five years. Uh, and compare that to other programs, uh, it dwarfs them. 
Uh, only $11 million is spent every year on children's services. Uh, only $44 million is spent on housing services. Only $4.8 million on unhoused peoples. Uh, yet, uh, while all those things are open for cuts, uh, police service budgets have gone up and up and up. And for us, and for me and many others, uh, that has not led to a safer city. It has not left to uh, left us with a better city. In fact, it's uh, left us a city where more and more people feel uh, threatened and scared, uh, knowing that police violence is a very real thing, especially for marginalized communities. Uh, so I hope today, as we're debating uh, whether or not uh, to support a Commonwealth expenditure that's going to only put more money into policing that we think differently. Uh, so what I'm calling for, and I think many of my constituents who live with me um, uh, are calling for, is for a 20% reduction in the police budget, uh, and that that money should be put for put towards services that benefit everyone, uh, especially housing and children's services here in the city. So I hope you take uh, this uh, thought, uh, along with all the other videos that are being produced in support of this, seriously and begin thinking about a city that uh, is safe and prosperous, not because we're armed to the teeth with police, but because uh, people are supported, people aren't in fear, people have services to support them. Uh, and those services that we need are not policing. So thank you, and again, once again, my name is Alex Kerner, and I'm a resident of Ward 4. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and I believe we have Brett on now. Hello, uh, my name is Alex Kerner, and I'm... Oh. And just to give you a heads up, some of these videos were difficult to, to download and some of them we couldn't at all, but we're just gonna play through them all just in case we have Lux on our side right now. Thank you everybody for your patience. Hmm? Sorry. It's five minutes, apparently four minutes, 59 seconds. Yeah, that's what I have down to. Sorry, folks, this is a big file coming up. That's why it's taken so long. Three. There we go. There's a call to defund the Hamilton police. Then a question at the heart of this discussion that I would like an answer from the city is why police are costing Can't hear it, Tamara. No, it, it started off very softly and now it's nothing. I don't know why. There's a call to defund Hamilton. Better. Then, in question at the heart of 
this discussion, I would like an answer from the city, is why police are casting Uh, there's nothing. You know what, let's nix that one. Um, and we'll just put it if you can work with that one. And then we can go to the next one. If you don't mind. Sorry, folks, we're just gonna put this one at the end of the list, we're going to get somebody to work on that. And we're going to go over to I believe it's Rick Roberts. Yeah, it is downloading. We're just waiting. Here it comes. Roberts, I'm a resident in Ward 3 of Hamilton, and I'm sending this pre-recorded video to add my voice to the call uh, to defund the police in, in Hamilton. Um, when I uh, first heard the phrase defund the police um, it, in the wake of the George Floyd murder in the States, uh, it, was a, it was a new concept for me. So I, I, I read about it, I read about it online, and I've uh, been reading a, a lot of books and watching interviews and uh, learning about, well, the history of this, this call and the history, the racist history of policing in the world and in Canada, which I'd always been aware of, but I didn't really know uh, the extent of it. Uh, and... Uh, began to become conscious of the strange uh, array of problems that we are asking uh, the police to address and how ineffective they are in addressing them and how they often exacerbate them. And that in turn allows us to not address uh, the root causes of uh, a lot of the problems we're facing, uh, systemic racism, underfunded mental health system, uh, a lack of uh, affordable housing, and why are we pouring more and more money into an armed response to these problems that we're not addressing, and we're actually making ourselves less safe and less happy in the process? Um, I also recognize that we are living in an historic time, and that people of the future will be writing about 2020 and the decisions we make right now and, and the changes that that do or don't happen right now and what we do will not only be noticed by our, our children and our grandchildren they'll be studied by them in school so i think it's really important um that we we, we do the right thing right now and that's another reason why i want to lend my voice to this call to defund the police uh given that the city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget, and that has gone up almost 50% in the last five years, I think it is entirely reasonable to ask for a 20% reduction uh, in that. 
uh, wherever you stand on this issue, and, and to, to redirect these funds to affordable housing, to food programs, to recreation, to schools, to social services, to safe injection sites, mental health supports, youth programming, shelters, climate change, anti-racism initiative. I mean, I, I think this speaks to the heart of who we are as a community, and we have to ask ourselves, really, that why, well, I ask myself this, why, why have I, or why have we normalized the presence of an armed force in our midst to the point where we don't really consider actually more effective and uh, healthier, more delightful ways of, of being together, uh, ways that will make us happier and safer. So I call on the council uh, to begin um, this, this turnaround, this new chapter of who we imagine ourselves to be by reducing the police budget by 20% and to redirect those funds into healthier, more effective ways into addressing the problems that we're, we're facing. And I thank you for listening and I feel deeply honored to be able to speak in front of my community on this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. And we have Adrian. I think we can all appreciate all the work that goes into these videos that people have to put together. It's not easy. And just to let you know that the clerks do let all the delegates know that there's a certain format they must follow to, to submit videos and not all the people have followed that format. So it's a little challenging for the clerks to reach into their computers and get the right program to display these videos. And that's why this is taking us longer than usual. Um, I think I'm going to, when we get to my year and call out my year again, if uh, my year is not present, I think that's when we'll break for lunch so that our clerks can have a, a quick bite and then we'll continue. Apologies. Oh, no sound, Tamara. No. So, yeah, we'll go to the next one and we'll come back. So there's two there. Before you do that, is Mayur available? This was our last WebEx um, delegate. I'm putting in a call out and see if Mayur uh, is on, online. I'm seeing the clerk shaking their head no. Okay, we'll ask again another time. So I think the next one's gonna be Ashley.
And then after Ashley, we'll, we'll call for lunch. Oh, Councillor Partridge. Can you unmute Councillor Partridge, please? Sorry, Councillor yes. Partridge. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, this week is our FCM, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, um, annual general meeting and board meeting, which is a four day event. So I will be jumping into a couple of meetings this afternoon and as well for tomorrow and for Friday. So I'll be in and out of, uh, of meetings, okay? Thank you, I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Okay, we'll put Ashley on and then when we're finished Ashley, then we'll be just in time for the, okay. Now another one. No. Hi, Council. My name is Ashley Letts. I own a public relations and copywriting consultancy. Um, I am one of the co-founders of the Steel City Inclusive Softball Association, which is a, um, a new softball league for the LGBTQ2S community. Um, we were supposed to have our inaugural season this year, but unfortunately we were waylaid because of the pandemic. Uh, the opinions that I'm going to share today are my own and not those of my co-organizers. Uh, I moved to Hamilton in 2018, but I had been visiting the city my whole life. My mom grew up here, she's from here, um, and moved back a couple years ago from BC. I've got a big extended family here, um, multiple family members who worked at Tefasco, and um, I moved here because I wanted to be close to them, um, but also because um, I just really love Hamilton. There's a lot to love about the city that it is, um, and so much to love about the city that it's becoming and the city that it could be. Um, I am the daughter of a former RCMP officer um, in Surrey, BC, and I'm the close personal friend of a newly minted RCMP officer in the interior of BC. Um, I know that a lot of people go into policing because they want to help people. Um, I also know that there is a culture of systemic racism within police forces. Um, and you know, I've, I fit the profile of somebody who gets to feel safe around police, but having worked with um, a lot of the youth organizers in our city and most of, many of whom are racialized, I know that that isn't their experience. Um, and it certainly hasn't been the experience of the queer community in our city uh, since before the events at Pride. Um, defunding the police to me is not about eradicating policing. It's about reimagining it. Um, it's about sending social workers to do wellness checks um, instead of police officers, people who are better equipped to deal with um, with mental health crises. Um, it's about, you know, actually giving aid and housing to people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, I live a couple blocks away from the homeless encampment on York Street, um, and it's deeply troubling to me that you would like to go in there with, um, with dump trucks and with police and evict people who have nowhere to go. Um, the same family member of mine who was a former police officer um, has also struggled with addiction and been homeless before. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that my dad uh, was going through that in Victoria where supports existed for him it, and not here in Hamilton where, uh, you know, a number of counselors would, you know, see him of, as you know, a disposable human. Um, so, when I ask you to consider defunding the police, um, I want you to imagine how it might be received if instead of meeting this movement with um, cynicism and dismissal, if you met it with curiosity, um, that is just something for you to consider. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ashley. So as promised, um, I'm going to call for lunch and I'm going to ask Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek, that we take a break and come back at 1230.
uh, electronic vote, I believe, on that. No, show of hands. Everybody, show of hands. I see a show of hands. Okay, we're good to go. Thank you, everyone. See you in 30 minutes.
in earlier, and I think that Tamara got his video sorted out. So we're going to do Brett. Then we're going to do Adrian. It was another one that we missed because it wouldn't download properly. And then we'll give a call out to my ear and see if if uh, he is available. Okay, so we're going to start with Brett. Chair Thanks. Johnson, I'm going yes, to sir. have to I'm going to have to reboot my computer because it's now spread to my other systems. So oh dear, I'll come back in a minute. Thank you. Okay, see you soon. No, we've just lost quorum. We have quorum now, thank you. Okay, we're ready, Tamara, whenever you are. in support of the call to hello my name is brett clausen i'm a resident of uh, ward three i'm sending a pre-recorded video in support yeah this is brett clausen i'm a resident of uh, ward three i'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the hamilton police the burning question at the heart of this discussion I would like an answer from the city is why police are costing Hi, folks. We just realized this wasn't our program. Apparently, there was a problem with Brett's video, so we're going straight over to Adrian's video now. And Councillor Clark is back. Adrian Underhill and I'm a resident of Ward 1. I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. I guess my main question right now is why are policing costs the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and a wait list of hundreds for social housing? The police fundamentally do not keep us safe and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. A 20% reduction is possible. The police service budget has gone up almost 50% in five years. Is that because policing has become more important priority for the city? I literally do not understand. We spend 171 million on policing, but the city will only spend 158 million on social services. Again, we're spending 171 million on policing, but only 44 million on housing services. This is completely untenable for the people of Hamilton. The HPS needs to be defunded because Hamilton has a 3.3 billion infrastructure deficit and a $23 million COVID deficit. The answer to mitigate this deficit is clear defunding. Taxpayer money could and should be spent on providing housing for houseless residents and not a police budget that continues to criminalize poverty. Instead, our city is thinking of spending between 100 to 200 million on the 2026 Commonwealth Games. These games will also spend money on policing to the tune of about 100 million. There are much better ways Hello, my name is Juliana. I'm
sorry, counselors, Tamara's working very hard at getting the next video up for you. Ward one, I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. I guess my main question right now is why are policing costs the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and a wait list of hundreds for social housing? The police fundamentally do not keep us safe and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. A 20% reduction is possible. The police service budget has gone up almost 50% in five years. Is that because policing has become more important priority for the city? I literally do not understand. We spend 171 million on policing, but the city will only spend 158 million on social services. Again, we're spending 171 million on policing, but only 44 million on housing services. This is completely untenable for the people of Hamilton. The HPS needs to be defunded because Hamilton has a $3.3 billion infrastructure deficit and a $23 million COVID deficit. The answer to mitigate this deficit is clear, defunding. Taxpayer money could and should be spent on providing housing for houseless residents and not a police budget that continues to criminalize poverty. Instead, our city is thinking of spending between 100 to 200 million on the 2026 Commonwealth Games. These games will also spend money on policing to the tune of about 100 million. There are much better ways to invest in our community. This money should be going towards affordable housing, food programs, recreation, schools, social services, safe injection sites, mental health supports, youth programming, shelters, climate related issues, and anti-racism. Our demands are an immediate 20% reduction, full transparency of the line by line police budget, and 30 million to be cut from HPS salaries, specifically from division one, two, and three, and also from the mounted unit the action team and victim services. I'd also like to speak out in favor of the Barton prisoners solidarity. So starting on August 5th, prisoners on range 4B in the Barton jail initiated a hunger strike. And this is the third uh, hunger strike that they've had to do in the past two months. Their most recent strike in late July ended quickly when the administration agreed to meet their core demands of access to books from outside and more items available from the canteen. However, more than a week later, there has been no follow through. We demand that the city of Hamilton end the Barton prisoners hunger strike by meeting their incredibly reasonable demands. Their demands are access to books from outside, more items on canteen, raising the weekly canteen purchase limit, ending lockdowns, allowing anyone to visit, ending the delays in the mail service and the mail delivery service, daily access to yard and keeping and improving the new phone system. Thank you very much and take care. Okay, thank you and we're on to Elizabeth. Hi, my name is Elisabetta and I'm a current resident within Ward 3 and I'm sending this pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund Hamilton Police Services. 
The funding for Hamilton Police Services is currently one of the highest costs to Hamilton taxpayers, and yet this money can be used in so many ways to better serve our community. For example, as of December 2019, 45% of Hamilton renters were living in unaffordable housing. The Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives also reported that someone earning minimum wage would have to work 54 hours a week to afford a one-bedroom apartment in Hamilton. One can see that the city continues to become increasingly expensive and unaffordable, which will result in more residents experiencing homelessness. And despite these facts, the city is choosing to spend $171 million on the police budget and only $4.8 million on unhoused people. This type of funding results in over-policing for those who are unhoused and minimal support systems for them to turn to. Just in April of this year, a Hamiltonian man who was unhoused was ticketed $888 for breaching order against gatherings of five or more people. Police justified this by saying they are using discretion when ticketing. However, how can you use discretion in cases when being on the street is the only place unhoused people can turn to? To continue, something I'm very passionate about is protection and care for those struggling with mental illness and mental health problems. Just in October of 2019, it was reported that 27% of high school students surveyed in grades 9 to 12 reported poor mental health. This is a 13 to 16% jump from reports of 11 to 13% of students reporting the same response in 2007. This same study reported that mental health and psychiatric issues are the fourth leading cause of hospitalizations in Hamilton. Speaking from past encounters, when someone is going through a mental health crisis and police show up to the scene, I have witnessed firsthand the lack of experience and knowledge officers have had when speaking and talking to a person in crisis. Therefore, moving funds from the police to social services, whose main priority is to safely handle and care for those in crisis, we will be able to see people being truly helped instead of criminalized and all around have increased safety for Hamiltonians. Ultimately, the Hamilton Police Services budget receives more funding than the funding towards the city's child services, housing services, and services for unhoused people combined. And it is for these reasons that I believe a 20% immediate reduction to their budget is more than possible. I thank you for the time you have taken to listen to my concerns, and I hope to see you consider this as much of a priority for Hamiltonians as I do. Thank you again. Thank you, Elizabeth. And we have Abadar. Thank you. Again, my apologies, folks, if I'm not getting the names properly right. Hello and thank you for hearing my deputation. My name is Abadar Kangari and I'm a resident in Ward 1. I'm calling on you to defund the Hamilton Police and instead, our, instead invest our tax dollars in affordable housing and other social services. Why are policing costs the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and a wait list of hundreds for social housing? The police and city are continuing to criminalize poverty and mental illness while ignoring the root causes of these social problems, often a lack of access to basic needs like safe housing, good food, recreation, and mental health services. I'm demanding that you reinvest in our communities so that we can have our basic human needs met. Apart from the loss of jobs and increases to the price of food due to COVID-19, Hamilton's rents have increased 33.5% from June 2019 to June 2020, the highest jump of any city in the entire country. And yet, the city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget, but only $44.3 million on housing services. And yet, the city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget, 
but only 4.8 million on unhoused people. As someone employed full-time in a study position that pays me well above the minimum wage, I still find, myself, find it hard, incredibly challenging, to find rental housing I can afford in this city. I can't imagine what it must be like for those forced to live paycheck to paycheck, single parents, people on fixed incomes, or ODSP. Hamilton has a 3.3 billion infrastructure deficit and a significant COVID deficit. The answer to mitigate this deficit is clear. We fund the police. Hamilton Police Service CEO has been approved for a $10,000 raise on his already extremely high salary of over $300,000 in 2020. This is ridiculous. With half of his salary, we could employ three full-time mental health support workers to serve houseless communities. The Hamilton Police Services have 17 new full-time officers who will work to violently oppress those made vulnerable in Hamilton, while Ontario Works has lost 44 hires to provide support to those same people. The city of Hamilton will spend $31,300 on a pipe band and police choir, but will reduce funding for food for prisoners by nearly 6%, totaling only $31,500. Right now, the police, uh, the Barton prisoners have been on their third hunger strike in two months, asking for basic living conditions like access to outside books, their mail, daily access to the yard, and disinfecting soap. This is incredibly shameful. Taxpayer money can and should be spent on providing housing, food security, mental health supports for residents, and not on a ballooning police budget that continues the criminalization of poverty. I'm demanding an immediate 20% reduction to the Hamilton Police Services budget. I want to see 30 million cut from HPS salaries, specifically from divisions one, two, and three. I want money cut from the mounted unit forces, the action team, and victim services. I'm calling for full transparency of the line-by-line -line police budget released to the public from now on. I want to see an urgent and long-term investment in affordable, geared-to-income and supportive housing, in food programs, anti-racism programs, safe injection sites, and mental health supports. The question should not be whether it's possible to cut 20% from the police budget. Of course it's possible. We have seen many other cities do just that. With 20% of the police budget, we can do so much for our communities. This is about our priorities as a society. Do we cast people aside, or do we create communities that care for and create space for all kinds of different people? This is about making a conscious decision to invest in the health and well-being of our communities, rather than in harassing and criminalizing them for being poor. This is about making policy and budget decisions that support the humanity and livelihood of all of Hamilton's citizens, especially those who are most vulnerable. We are asking you to invest our tax dollars in affordable gear to income and supportive housing, in food security, anti-racism programs, safe injection sites, and in mental health services. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next one we have, I think it's... So it's, is it Haiva? Or Hiva, sorry. I'm hearing two different versions. I'm probably not the person to be sitting in this chair doing this. I'm Atolahi, and I'm a resident in Ward 12. Hello, um, my name is Hiva Nimatolahi, and I'm a resident in Ward 12, also known as the Ancaster and West Farnborough area. I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton Police. It's important to ask ourselves why policing costs are the highest expense to Hamilton taxpayers when there is an inevitable housing crisis and waitlist for social housing. The police do not keep us safe nor prioritize these populations, and it's time to reinvest in our communities. The 
it's important to note that a 20% decrease is possible when the police services budget has gone up almost 50% in the past five years, while social services have been increasingly deprioritized. With Hamilton residents facing different adversities, it's vital to implement complex social services as well as a proper social safety net in order to ensure safety and stability in their lives. Unfortunately, the city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget, but only $11 million on children's services, $44.3 million on housing services, and only $4.8 million on unhoused people. These numbers are not only shameful, but clearly speak for themselves. I believe the Hamilton police should be defunded as the city of Hamilton has a $3.3 billion infrastructure deficit and a $23 million COVID deficit. Deficits should only be met with the utmost immediate response of clearing them in order um, in case of an emergency. I believe the answer is clear. We must defund the police and reinvest in our communities. Taxpayer money could and should be spent on providing housing for homeless re houseless residents and not a police budget that continues to criminalize uh, poverty. poverty. Instead, our city is thinking of spending between 100 to 200 million of the and the 2026 Commonwealth Games. These games also spend money on policing to the tune of about 100 million. And there are better ways to invest in our communities. Ideally, the relocation of the policing budget should go towards our affordable housing, food programs, and food banks, ensuring food security for all. Varying social services, cultural programs for our indigenous population in Hamilton, safe injection sites in order to ensure safety for those experiencing addiction, mental health supports as Hamilton residents are experiencing long wait lists for private and publicly funded mental health services. Um, we need youth programming and shelters, climate related issues, help for our um, climate and anti-racist racist initiatives. Uh, similar to the amazing work taking place by the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion and Diversity. It's time to reinvest in the people who have been neglected by oppressive systems. It's time to uplift them, and the opportunity to do so is now. Specifically, we demand an immediate 20% decrease in the Hamilton Policing Services budget, full transparency of the line-by-line -line police budget. We want $30 million cut from HPS salaries, specifically from Division 1, 2, and 3. We want $30 million cut from HPS services and salaries. Specific, oh, sorry. We want money cut from the mounted unit, um, volunteer forces, the action team, and victim services. These responsibilities should be placed on those without the means to deadly weapons that further steer Hamiltonians from reaching out for help. Those with proper crises and de-escalation skills must respond to the needs of our community. More funding would ensure proper training for those on the front lines, to say, in order to provide equitable and culturally appropriate services to the residents of Hamilton. I'd also like to speak in regards to the Barton Prisoner Solidarity that I'm in full support of. Starting the morning of August 5th, prisoners on Range 4B in the Barton Jail initiated a hunger strike, their third in the last two months. Their most recent strike in late July ended quickly when the administration agreed to meet their core demands. Access to books from outside and more items available in their canteen. However, it seems that these were empty words, as more than a week later, there's been no follow through. These empty words are unacceptable, and we demand the city of Hamilton meet their demands, which include access to books from the outside, more items on canteen, raise their weekly canteen purchase limit, end lockdowns, allow anyone to visit, finally end delays in mail delivery, easy access to the yard, and to lastly, keep and improve the new phone system. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope that you'll consider um, investing in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Hiva, and we're on to Laura now. Why are policing costs the highest to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and a wait list of hundreds for social housing? The police do not keep us safe, and we are demanding that you re-
My name is Laura Howden and I am a Hamilton resident in Ward 1. I'm sending this video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. Why are policing costs the highest to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and a wait list of hundreds for social housing? The police do not keep us safe and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. The city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget, but only $4.8 million on unhoused people. We spend $171 million on policing, but the city of Hamilton will only spend $158 million on social services. As a social worker working in mental health and addictions in this city, I can tell you that my job to help people has become almost impossible, not only because our social services have been decimated by funding cuts, but because people can't recover from mental health problems or manage addictions when they don't have safe or affordable housing. What these people need for safety is not police. They need homes, food, a stable income, and a community that cares about them. When I read about $100,000 police salaries, I think about how many people you could put in an apartment for that cost. When I read that Hamilton police will spend $78,000 on ammunition and $61,000 on tasers, I think about personal experiences of police violence that I've been told about from the clients that I work with and from other members in our community. I think about the concerns that the Two-Spirit and LGBTQ plus community and that the Black and Indigenous communities have repeatedly shared with city officials that have been repeatedly ignored and remain unaddressed. Our city has so many problems and so many people suffering. $171 million should not be spent on policing. We will have a safer community when all of the needs of all of its members are met. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. We have Lauren or Lauren up now. Hello, my name is Lauren and I am a resident of Ward 7 in Hamilton. I'm sending a pre-recorded message in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. Why are policing costs so high and the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and wait list of hundreds for social housing? The police do not keep us safe and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. A 20% reduction is possible. The Hamilton Police Services CEO has been approved for a $10,000 raise totaling a $308,000, $250,000 salary in 2020. That's ridiculous. The city spends money on action teams who card, surveil, harass Black, Indigenous, unhoused, and racialized people in this city. The Hamilton Police Services budget has also increased 50% in five years. 50%. Where is this money going to? Why are we not investing in schooling? Why are we not investing in housing? Why do we have kids going back to school with the same class sizes in COVID? We can't hire more teachers. We can't put more money into education. But we can put more money into the Hamilton Police Services. We can put more money into the Police Services CEO pocket. That's not okay. We are demanding a 20% reduction in the Police Services budget in Hamilton now. We want full transparency, line by line, of the police budget. $30 million to be cut from the Hamilton Police Services salaries, specifically in Divisions 1, 2, and 3, with money being cut directly from the mounted units and the action team. Thank you. Thank you. And the next one is Shanice. Or My name is Shanice Barron, and I'm a resident in Ward 3. I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the police. Why are policing costs the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers 
when the city has an affordable housing crisis and wait lists of hundreds for social housing. The police do not keep us safe, and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. The Hamilton police have 17 new full-time officers that work to violently oppress those made vulnerable in Hamilton, while Ontario Works lost 44 hires to provide support to those same people. Hamilton police will spend $78,806 on ammunition and $61,409 on tasers, whose sole purpose is to physically harm people while they could be spent on any social services. The police should not have the power, nor should the city have the power or tools to physically assault residents and should not have access to these weapons or a budget for them. The city spends money on action police teams who regularly card, surveil, and harass Black, Indigenous, unhoused, and racialized people in the city. The HPS need to be defunded. The reason being because taxpayer money could and should be spent on providing housing for houseless residents and not a police budget that continues the criminalization of poverty. Instead, our city is thinking of spending 100 million to 200 million on the 2026 Commonwealth Games. These games also spend money on policing to the tune of about $100 million. There are much better ways to invest in our community. The money should be invested in things such as mental health support, affordable housing, shelters, and finally towards anti-racism initiatives. These are our demands. An immediate 20% reduction. Full transparency of line-by-line -line police budget. We want 30 million cut from HPS salaries, specifically from division one, two, and three. We want money cut from the mounted unit, action teams, and victim services. In addition, starting from August 5th, prisoners on 4B range in the Barton Jail initiated a hunger strike, their third one in the past two months. Their most recent strike in late July ended quickly when the, administrative, the administration agreed to meet their core demands, access to books from outside and more items available from the canteen. However, it seems that those were empty words as there was no follow-up afterwards. We demand that the city of Hamilton end the Barton prisoner hunger strike by meeting those demands. Here are the demands as follows. Access to the banks, sorry, access to books from the outside, more items on the canteen, raise the weekly canteen purchase limit, end lockdowns, allow anyone to visit, finally end the delays in mail delivery. All this to say, there are so many avenues where the money that taxpayers are using in Hamilton could be better served. Rather than over policing or funding police violence towards our community. We know that a 20% reduction is possible. We've seen it happen in our neighbors across the border in the States, as well as in certain parts of Canada. A policeman's job is to serve and protect. And for a very long time, that has not been the case. Police have been a threat to racialized people in the city, as well as pover poverty in the city. And people, citizens of the city deserve to feel protected, deserve to feel safe, deserve to feel like they matter. And right now they don't. This is why we are asking for a police defund. Defunding the police is the best and the only option available for us. If we want a protective, peaceful, and thriving society, we need to defund the police. It's time. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Shanice. And we're on to Holly, I believe. So, Marissa, Holly, thank you. Along with the emails that I've sent in support of defunding Hamilton Police Services, I am additionally submitting this pre-recorded video today. My name is Holly Pochai, and I am a Ward 2 resident. And for the past 12 years, I have run a retail business on James Street North called White Elephant, which some have attributed to being a key factor in the rejuvenation of downtown Hamilton. We are undergoing a transformative shift in our society right now in how we approach the idea of community. 
Our old ways are not sustainable. They are harmful, and we are being presented with the opportunity to make changes to truly work towards a better future for all. I believe that the only way that we can have a more equitable society is by defunding the police and reallocating those funds into community care initiatives. Police and policing tactics have never made me feel safe. And I know that that experience is much worse for people who don't look as I do, who have not had the same privileges that I've had in life. I have witnessed community care and nurturing collective mindset grow a city into something wonderful, block by block, which you certainly took advantage of once you could form economic development committees around it all. You already believe in a future without policing. You've built your marketing campaigns about that idea of community for the past 10 years. I am calling today to demand City Council to defund the HPS budget by 20% for a total cut of 35 million. I have personally witnessed the negative effect and harm the action team has had on the downtown core and believes they serve no other function than to scare and harass the racialized, poor, unhomed, or mentally distressed members of community. They have no place here. I am also speaking in solidarity with the Barton, Barton Prison hunger strike and asking that their demands are met. We are in the midst of a pandemic. We have a housing crisis that requires immediate attention. Our collective mental health is suffering, and we can no longer ignore the effects that we've had on our planet. We simply cannot afford to continue funding police and prisons. We need to begin putting our money into initiatives and ideas that heal us. Continuing to allow a $171 million budget for the police is absurd. The police protect no one but themselves. If people responding positively to Hamilton in the past decade has inspired you or made you proud as a city councillor, I can promise you that the values in that society are based on taking care of each other, which is exactly the transformative justice work we are asking you to believe in now by defunding the police. We need change and we need it now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Holly. Uh, we we'll have Marissa up soon. We're about halfway through, folks, just to let you know where we are in the on the sheets. Um, I've written down a couple of things that I'd like to talk about today. My name is Marissa Gilmore, and I am a resident in Ward 9. I am sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. Why are policing costs the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and wait list of hundreds for social housing? The police do not keep us safe, and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. The city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget, but only $44.3 million on housing services. The Hamilton police have 17 new full-time officers that work to violently oppress those made vulnerable in Hamilton, while Ontario Works has lost 44 hires to provide support to those same people. We spend $171 million on the police budget, but only $11 million on children's services. This doesn't make sense. Taxpayers' money could and should be spent on providing housing for houseless residents and not a police budget that is continue that continues the, the criminalization of poverty. Instead, our city is thinking about spending between $100 million to $200 million on the Commonwealth Games. These games also spend money on policing to the tune of about $100 million. There are better ways to invest in our community. We are demanding an immediate 20% reduction in the police budget, full transparency of the line-by-line -line police budget, we want $30 million cut from HPS salaries, specifically from divisions one, two, and three. We want money cut for the mounted units and the action team. This money can be put towards affordable housing, food programs, recreation, schools, social services, mental health supports, youth programs, shelters, climate related issues, and anti-racism. Also, we are demanding the city of Hamilton end the Barton prisoner hunger strike by meeting their demands. Access to books from the outside, more items on canteen, a raised weekly canteen purchase limit, 
end lockdowns, allow anyone to visit, end delays in mail delivery, daily access to the yard. Listen, prisoners are human too. They are still human, okay? Um, and to keep and improve the new phone system. I hope that you're able to take what I've said in, into consideration. This is a real issue. Um, the police budget is way too inflated. It's absolutely ridiculous. They do not need this, um, this amount of money. So I really hope that, again, you can take what I've said into consideration. And um, thank you for listening. Have a good day. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, we have Mariel. Ariel and I'm a resident of Ward 1. This pre-recorded video has been created in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. Our city has an affordable housing crisis. But the cost of policing in Hamilton are the highest to taxpayers and the police service budget has increased by 50% in only five years. The police do not keep us safe. Divest from policing and reinvest in our communities. In order to flourish, our communities need support support they are not receiving as the city of Hamilton spends 158 million on social services while the police receive 171 million. We spend $78,806 on ammunition, 61,409 on tasers. This is money that the city of Hamilton has used to weaponize the police force against the communities they have underfunded and left unsupported. Taxpayer money has been used to inflate the police budgets, thereby continuing the criminalization of poverty rather than providing housing for houseless residents. Hamilton has a 3.3 billion infrastructure deficit and a $23 million COVID deficit. Our communities are suffering, yet our city is floating the idea of spending upwards of 200 million on the 2026 Commonwealth Games games that would see even more money and resources spent on policing. What are the priorities of this city? There are better ways to invest in our communities that aren't expensive sports events and the continual overfunding of the police force. I would like to see our city invest in social services that aid communities separate from the police force, invest in affordable housing, fund food programs, fund recreation, Focus on harm reduction by creating more safe injection sites. Invest in mental health supports and youth programming. I stand with the demands being made to Hamilton City Council, which are an immediate 20% reduction of the HPS, full transparency of the line by line police budget, 30 million cut from HPS salary, salaries, specifically from division one, two and three. We want money cut from the mounted unit, action team and victim services. We are demanding a $2.5 million budget cut for materials and supplies in order to demilitarize the police and 2 million should be cut from overtime and part-time pay. And finally, I stand in solidarity with prisoners from the Barton jail who have been on a hunger strike since August 5th. By supporting these prisoners, the city of Hamilton can help end this hunger strike. Their demands are as follows. We demand access to books from the outside, more items in canteen, raise the weekly canteen purchase limit, end lockdowns, allow anyone to visit, finally end the delays in mail delivery, daily access to yard, keep and improve the new phone system. Thank you. Thank you, Mariel. Um, Kayla is up next. And we keep uh, looking for Mayer, but uh, we don't see him coming online. So just to let everybody know, we're, we're keeping our eye out.
Kayla Whitney. I live in uh, central downtown Hamilton. I'm a small business owner and um, I am submitting this video because I would like to defund the Hamilton police. I think that uh, you guys are all familiar with all of the facts and the numbers, which are ridiculous, but I think on a personal level for the average police officer to ask them to be prepared to at once go into a situation where they would risk their life uh, facing a weapon um, and also be equally as mentally and physically prepared to walk into a situation where they need to be uh, helping someone with mental health issues or de-escalating a situation is just uh, an unfair ask for the average police officer. Um, if we could take some money that we've allocated to the police and put it into community resources, then we could have community members or trained professionals responding to situations that need delicate de-escalating. And then we could have police officers who are trained in to be afraid and to view the public sometimes as enemies. They would respond to situations where that mindset is necessary. <clears throat> I just think it would be better for the community, it would be better for the police officers. Because um, currently we're asking them to respond to everything from a dog being locked in a hot car, to a mental health crisis, to someone with a knife, to someone armed robbery, to domestic assault, and no one individual with such limited training, that's a separate issue, but should be asked to respond to something like that and to respond to every single one of those situations and do it appropriately. Like that's just not, there's no reason for that. So we should defund the Hamilton police and distribute the funds into the community in support places to prevent crime from the ground up, but then also to other professional organizations who can support uh, the police officers where necessary or perhaps the police officers can support those community engagers where necessary thank you so much for your time and for listening to us and uh, support the cause and defund the police thank you thank you kayla and we're on to emma Everyone who has taken the time to listen to these video delegations. My name is Emma Barrett and I have been a resident of Hamilton for over 20 years. I want to say that personally I am appreciative of the opportunity to share my thoughts with the council and whoever else is viewing this recording. I am submitting this video delegation as part of the widespread call from the public to defund the Hamilton Police Services. To clarify, I am of the stance that our current municipal budget shows, based on funds allotted, that the priority placed on policing and criminal justice has been to the detriment of other necessary social and economic infrastructure. In 2019, the Hamilton Police received $165 million in funding, a $4 million increase over 2018. That's $120 million more than was given for housing services and is $152.6 million more than was given for public health services. Both the housing services and public health services budgets are down from 2018. According to the documents available on the City of Hamilton's website, we live in a country that claims to value health. We value equality. We reject undue violence in all its forms, and yet we are not putting our money where our mouths are. Every year, the city approves to increase the funds given to police, while other necessary services and infrastructures are left to scrounge through the relative scraps. This clearly does not demonstrate appropriate adherence to the values we claim to hold. In the news, through the internet, and on our televisions, we have heard overwhelming accounts from people who have been irrefutably harmed 
by the way we conduct policing in this country and in the city. We owe it to those people as fellow human beings to take their needs seriously. Regardless of the intentions of any given member, the fact remains that the Hamilton Police Services operate within a framework that is proven to perpetuate racial inequality. The police operate within a cycle that relies on an exchange of trauma and an imbalance of power, and which was built on, on the principle of improving life for some while worsening the lives of others. We owe it to our fellow citizens to realign our focus and prioritize systems of care. This call for the radical transformation of our justice system is not an attempt to create imbalance. It is the wake up call that we do not have balance now. This is a call to hold those in power accountable and to honestly reassess the institutions and systems that we have leaned on for far too long. These unfair systems are not broken. They were never built right in the first place. And when a house isn't built well, sometimes all you can do is take it apart, face all the raw, ugly details, fix them properly, and then see what's worth keeping. We the people are calling on you, our representatives. We need you to work with us and for us to examine what is caring and what is unjust and to begin the work of creating something better. I stand with those demanding that city council make a significant cut to the budget for Hamilton's police services and that those funds be reallocated to anti-racist care-focused initiatives. Those of us who hold degrees of privilege above others have the moral duty to use that agency to create a fairer world. We have a human obligation to be a foundational part of that change. And so to close my delegation, I repeat the demand, defund and eventually abolish the police. Thank you, Emma. And we're on to Amani. Hello, my name is Amani Williams, and I am a resident here in Hamilton's Ward 3. I am sending this pre-recorded video in support of defending the police. Um, money should be reallocated to housing um, and homeless issues that we are dealing with here in Hamilton. Um, why is it that the Hamilton police are given $171 million, but we are only giving $44.3 uh, million to, to housing? when clearly we're struggling with that. Um, why is it that we're giving $171 million um, to police, but only 4.8 to address unhoused people, um, which we can both agree is a very um, large issue here in Hamilton. Um, I am very shocked that the police budget has raised over 50% in the last five years. Um, meanwhile, here in Hamilton, we're still struggling with um, social working, um, mental institutions, housing, food programs, shelters, schools. Um, I feel like that should be definitely the top of our priority of what to deal with here in the city, especially if um, the money is coming from the community's taxes uh, and that the police are clearly disproportionately um, affecting and impacting the black and indigenous community um, very negatively. Um, we are demanding a 20% reduction. Um, 
we need full transparency of the police budget. We need line by line um, as to where every dollar is going and anything that's unnecessary needs to be reduced 100%. Um, we're asking for a $30 million cut. This needs to be coming from the action team. This needs to be coming from the mounted team, AKA the horses and also victim services. Um, the money needs to be real reallocated into housing, um, service, um, social services, food programs, anti-racism, anti-racism courses, shelters, schools, recreation centers, things that can benefit our community um, and that will help out with the moving forward of what needs to happen here in Hamilton. Um, I stand behind our Barton prisoners that are requesting better treatment. Um, they're on hunger strike because they aren't being treated correctly and they have a list of demands. I stand behind what they are demanding and I definitely stand behind the defunding of the Hamilton police. Um, in order to re reallocate the sources, reallocate the money, so that we can actually make real life change and steps in the right direction here in Hamilton to make sure that um, we are doing what needs to be done for the better of the people. Um, so yes, please defund the police 20%. I'm standing behind my brothers and sisters and um, we hope that we can get this done. Thank you, Amani. Now we're on to Rachel. Hello, Council. My name is Rachel Cuthill. I'm a resident of Ward 4. I'm a parent, an educator, and a member of a local faith community. I'm sending in this message in support of an immediate budget reduction to the Police Services Board budget. A budget is a reflection of priorities, and it is clear that Hamilton's priorities are imbalanced. As a bare minimum, Hamilton must reclaim any budget surplus that the Hamilton Police Services have posted in years past and reinvest that money into community housing and other social services. Those investments will do more to create a safer Hamilton and to reduce violent crime than an increasingly militarized police service. It is time for City Council to show bold leadership and immediately reduce the police service budget by 20%, not to participate in yet another study but to take bold action. Reallocating money from the Hamilton Police Services budget to community investment will do more to create the kind of Hamilton that we all want to live in. A Hamilton that is safer and more inclusive for communities of color, for people living in poverty, for people who are experiencing homelessness, and really for everyone. Thank you for accepting video delegations and making these meetings accessible to your constituents, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Rachel. And I think next up is Juliana. Hello, my name is Juliana. I'm an RN here in Hamilton. Um, this is a video for the General Issues Committee meeting on August 10th regarding defunding the police. By no means do I think that the police are not a necessary service or that defunding means abolishing, but what is really important here is the reallocation of funds uh, to services that can better support the needs of our population. Um, when you look even back at one, Bill 124 from earlier this year uh, and you see the discrepancies between uh, money allocated to nursing where they had like a 1% wage increase versus firefighters and police officers that had a, above 2% wage increases, um, it's a glaringly obvious reflection of where the priorities lie um, and shows that we're not focused on the health and well-being of our population. 
um, which is something that we should be, and especially in this time when we have a greater emphasis on health, um, I think now would be a great time to reallocate funds to mental health services, uh, social supports, low-income housing. Um, there's a big gap being filled right now by the police as far as, um, you know, first responders for mental health crises and those types of things. But that money could go elsewhere um, because when we talk about having, you know, a healthy population uh, that is well, uh, in nursing especially, we talk about the social determinants of health. So the very basics, you know, housing, um, insecurity, and, you know, substance use issues that go along with unemployment and uh, low income and poor education uh, are obviously going to promote crime. And if we want to improve things, then we have to start at those basic levels. Um, um, and if those services are not receiving the funding that they need, then we can't begin to see change. Uh, while, while the police right now are filling, you know, part of that gap, uh, it's not in a way that is effective. It's in a way that kind of criminalizes that population, um, and a lot of the, you know, resources uh, provided to the police even for fulfilling that need are are not adequate. You know, we increased mental health training, all kinds of uh, cultural sensitivity and safety issues that need to be addressed. So because they're filling that gap funding, we're not looking to just chop it all at once. I'm not suggesting that either because they're the only paddle uh, in the boat right now. And so if we remove that, then we're just floating with nothing. Uh, but funds need to start being redistributed in a way that we can see uh, necessary services supported. And then with a decrease in the funding to the police, um, Sure. Thank you. I think that was the end, folks. Uh, we can't seem to retrieve that. So Ishan is on next. Okay, let's give Tamara a couple minutes here. Thanks for everybody's patience. Okay, you can stop sharing. Okay, everyone. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to jump ahead to 9.10 until we can get this technical difficulty out of the way. Oh, maybe we got it.
Okay, we're kicking Tamara out. And we're going to go to 9.10, and I'm going to talk a few minutes before we can get Paul Johnson and uh, Dr. Tran and uh, Jeanette Smith back online. So I don't know if Paul is there. I see Dr. Tran. Good afternoon. Oh, there he is. There's Paul. So, Paul, we're jumping all over the place today, uh, thanks to technology, which makes our meetings so interesting and fun. Um, so I'm going to go to you, Paul Johnson, General Manager of Health and Safety Communities Department, and Dr. Tran, Associate Medical Officer of Health, will provide the verbal update respecting COVID-19. Paul, you're on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and, and through the chair, uh, appreciate these opportunities to share a few things from our perspective. Uh, Dr. Tran will actually have a fair bit of information today, uh, some of which I, I know has been of interest to council around the data um, with the shift to the new provincial system. So I'll keep mine uh, a little bit short from the Emergency Operations Center. But just to say that we continue to go down this path of reopening uh, various public facing services at the city of Hamilton. You've seen the updates that come out. Uh, we are focused this month, uh, particularly on our recreation facilities and getting back to providing uh, a number of recreation opportunities for Hamiltonians, uh, a ability to sign up for uh, some of the programs that uh, people enjoyed uh, pre-COVID and that uh, will be done in a uh, safe way. It will be done with far less numbers uh, than we've had in the past, but uh, we're going to get back to the operations of our recreation facilities. I have talked about arenas in the past, so I'm not going to talk about that, but what has been new uh, this week is that um, we undertook a process in August of talking with all of the boards that manage the work of our seniors clubs and senior centers. And uh, for the public consumption, um, uh, there's only one seniors program that the city of Hamilton sort of manages alongside our, our older adults, and that's at the Bernie Morelli uh, Recreation Facility. The others have boards and uh, they uh, manage uh, the, the work of these senior centers. Uh, they actually uh, contract a lot of the services and, and activities that come in. And so we've been meeting with them them and asking them the question about when they would like to open up services. And so as you saw in the update that went out uh, earlier this week, um yesterday, I guess, that uh, some seniors clubs and uh, senior centers are opening, but many are not. Uh, they are choosing to wait until January as the next uh, available time for them to consider uh, whether they'll uh, reopen their services at that point. The reasons for this are a couple. Uh, first all, of all, that uh, they did review all of the guidelines and things that they would need to be doing uh, in order to make their, their clubs or their programs uh, safe, and in some cases felt that it just wouldn't provide a great opportunity, and they weren't clear on how they would allow opportunities for all of their members because of such of the reduced numbers. And in some cases, some of the clubs don't offer a lot of services. They provide some general social activities, uh, some of which really aren't allowed at the moment, and so their ability to open was actually fairly um, set in stone for them already. So I don't want you to think for a minute that uh, we, uh, you know, we're taking a, an approach of only, only open a couple from a staff perspective. This was done in direct uh, consultation and we let the uh, the boards of these clubs and, and centers uh, decide how best to uh, proceed. So for those that are proceeding, uh, they have our full support and, and we will work with them to do everything we can to make them successful. Uh, and I know that you will as well. And for those who chose not to, uh, they also have our full support. Uh, I know that some may hope that they would have opened in September or October, but their choice to open in January was done uh, for the best interest of their members, and we support that 100%. So the other piece I'll touch on just briefly today, I don't have the specifics for you yet, um, but I have had conversations with uh, Rome uh, D'Angelo in, in uh, fleet and facilities about uh, council chambers. I know this is a question that comes my way uh, quite regularly and Jeanette has fielded a, a number as well, is when will we get back to in-person meetings or the possibility of in-person meetings in council chambers? Uh, we have a notional plan in place. Uh, Rome has uh, shared some of that with me about how physically we could reorient uh, council chambers to be safe from a physical distancing perspective. Of course, the big challenge is how we get technology and microphones and things to places that uh, in the past were never designed to have um, uh, the ability for microphones and uh, also how we do this within a cost structure because we don't expect this to be forever. So we don't want to overspend, completely change council chamber and then have to you know, spend again and get it back to where, where it was uh, pre-COVID. So uh, those plans are, are coming to the EOC uh, for a review on Friday. And uh, we, we are really still working on the time frame of November that we would be able to see council chamber open for the possibility of in-person meetings. Uh, and that's based 
a lot around the cycle of council meetings. So the reality is to get it ready for the second cycle in October, we would have about a month, which is not, not realistic. And what I don't think is helpful is for us to do some standing committees in and some standing committees out. Uh, the other piece that needs to occur, and there's lots of conversations happening with uh, with clerks, is that there will be some procedural bylaw work that needs to take place in order to allow for the possibility of both uh, a remote and virtual attendance, as well as an in-person attendance for a variety of reasons, and you'll have a chance to debate those. So we're pushing forward on that policy work, procedural work, uh, but also pushing forward on the technical work that needs to happen from a physical plant perspective. And um, uh, so we expect that before the end of the, the year uh, that we'll be able to, uh, you will be able to contemplate having in-person council meetings should you and committee meetings should you wish to, uh, and we'll have all of those details. So I think at our next verbal update at the GIC in two weeks, um, you know, we'll have, uh, we'll be able to share some of those and uh, I'll invite Rome to, uh, to join me and, and share some of what it's gonna look like as you start to prepare to come back into an in-person session, but wanted to give you a bit of a verbal update today. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Tran, who's got a bit of an update on our numbers. Um, and uh, just as a transition to him, of course, we're all uh, concerned that uh, we seem to be stuck a little bit at a, uh, it's, it's not a tremendous number of new cases per day, but it's but it's stuck at a slightly higher amount than we were enjoying uh, in the early part of August and uh, certainly into July. So we have seen a more regular case count that is, um, that is slightly higher than we've enjoyed uh, through some of the summer. And I know that that's of concern to public health, particularly as we move into the reopening of schools. So Dr. Tran, over to you. All right, thank you, Paul, and through you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so here's my COVID-19 uh, update. Uh, I, I do want to uh, qualify the update that it is uh, different in terms of numbers compared to what we have in the past as, there, as we're transitioning into um, a new provincial system and we're working out uh, some of the data issues and the compatibility issues um, for our own systems, uh, that these are uh, that this includes a 48 hour uh, delay. So these numbers are as of uh, end of day, Sunday, uh, September 6th. So as of that date, uh, we have 1,017 cases that includes both probable and confirmed. We remain at, uh, fortunately, at 45 deaths uh, with COVID and we remain at zero outbreaks. So I think that's that's certainly the the good news uh, uh, regarding our numbers. As Paul has indicated, um, what is um, what we're noticing is a you know continuous uh, small uptick in cases. I think when I last uh, gave the update here uh, in August, we were you know going from one to two cases a day to three to four. We are now at five cases, approximately five cases uh, per day, um, and and that's. You know, it's been variable in terms of the the age group. It's generally we're seeing more recently, um, you know, numbers that are a bit increasing in the adult population. That's changed from young adults to adults. And I think it's something to also um, be careful in terms of interpreting too much of the data. As I mentioned, when we have low cases, and we still do have relatively low cases, um, any small changes in numbers can make a a disproportionate uh, increase in in, per, in percentages, um, and and so what we are seeing is that um, that the that there's and we're still seeing uh, prolonged contacts uh, in households that are amplifying it, and uh, we are seeing uh, individuals um, socializing more. So a lot of family and friend gatherings uh, that are. Uh, of uh, larger numbers um, that are helping driving uh, uh, this increase in numbers. Uh, the the other update I want to mention is that uh, as we all know, um, and and some of us uh, have kids uh, uh, going to school or grandkids, um, that uh, school has started uh, as of this week. It's uh, certainly a staggered uh, uh, introduction uh, by both of the the public and the Catholic school boards. Um, so we've been uh, engaging in a lot of conversations with them uh, over the summer. Uh, we have uh, uh, our public health uh, nurses in place that are provincially funded. Um, and you know we have a system and a mechanism in place for uh, the school boards and the principals uh, to 
uh, contact us uh, with questions and to help um, stick handle any uh, situations uh, within the school. And, and they've got the con relevant contact information for that. And the province has also uh, released, you know, a long awaited uh, provincial guidance document in terms of uh, managing COVID uh, cases and outbreaks uh, in, in school settings uh, with, uh, you know, a significant amount of details in terms of different rules uh, for the health sector, for public health, uh, uh, for schools. Um, and um, so that's where we are um, for that. I mean, I do want to contextualize. I think it's, it is important that that's, uh, school resumes for all of the health benefits that there is. And I know Dr. Richardson has mentioned this is that, and we've seen with the numbers we've, we've, we've you know, throughout the summer have had uh, cases in school aged children that uh, we would expect, you know, throughout the school year, there are going to be uh, cases uh, and what we, you know, and they will likely originate from uh, being acquired somewhere in the community. And what we want to do is you know, work uh, very closely and quickly with our school boards to, uh, you know, limit or minimize any uh, transmission that's happening in schools and keep it as safe as, as we can. But um, just to, to highlight that. That is it for our, my update. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tran. Uh, I've not been watching the screen as closely as I have in the past. Tamara's been busy uploading videos. So I, all I have so far is Councillor Ferguson and Mayor Eisenberger and Councillor Jackson. So we'll start with Councillor Ferguson, please. Yeah, thank you, Brenda. And, and uh, Neam, thanks for that update. Um, I should call you Dr. Tran publicly. So Dr. Tran, thank you for the update. Um, we always, we've been hearing all summer about the fear of a second wave. And with this uptick we're getting now, would you define this as a second wave? No, I mean, we're still at, um, you know, significantly, you know, when we, if you think about our peak, you know, we were getting in the double digits cases uh, per day. Uh, so now we've crept up to five. Um, so we aren't in a, a uh, second wave. Uh, I wouldn't call that a second wave, but uh, you know, we we always will keep an eye out on on things and trends, um, and particularly uh, with fall and winter approaching, uh, school reopening, and as people you know uh, are indoors a bit more, I think we we need to pay particular attention to to those numbers. Okay, so a good definition of second wave if we if we start to get over ten per day. We don't have a specific uh, definition, but it's one of those things where you know, we'll we'll definitely <laughs> let you know when we're there. Okay. The other thing is, uh, we heard last week that you couldn't report numbers. You see, other municipalities all reporting. We weren't. Is the 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 new software you had to use from the province? You couldn't get it to function properly. Properly. Why did we only have that problem, and other municipalities didn't seem to? Because they were all reporting. Yeah, so I'll give you some context. I mean, I don't want it to be sounding like we're blaming, you know, a, you know, particular software or, or a particular group. Um, so it's it's been rolled out in in a staggered manner. Um, so uh, not all health units have started. So we are probably in the middle of the groups that have uh, have implemented the, the, the software. Uh, to my knowledge, there are um, you know some other health units that have started. Mm -hmm first uh, that have had some issues. Uh, so I think it is, as I mentioned, it's a combination of issues. So some of it is uh, issues that are likely inherent to the provincial software that we've provided some feedback to. Uh, some of the issues is actually for us in terms of um, with any new technology, understanding you know how to best use the, 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 the technology. And then there's a combination of uh, compatibility or platforms where you know, in terms of if we're transferring information from one information system to another uh, locally, eventually, uh, sometimes there's, you know, a high level, there's some type of compatibility issues. That so it sounds some like the, the, the big end. So hang, on, hang on, please, let him finish. Go ahead, Dr. Tran. I thought he was. Yep, and Dr. then I think some some health units, one I've heard of, uh, have done some, their own local workarounds uh, to, to manage it. But, uh, I think it is one of those things that sort of that are inherent uh, when we, you know, start new major technology initiatives and we find some of these things. I think ultimately there are significant benefits to it. I think right now it's. I think the timing's unfortunate in terms of you know, seeing the cases sort of go up, 
um, you know, starting school, um, you know, everyone's particularly anxious about you know, getting up to date numbers. We're working as hard as we can uh, uh, internally, but also with our provincial, uh, the province to sort some of this out. Councillor Ferguson. Okay, I apologize, Dr. Chan. I thought you were done before. So um, it sounds like the, the one of the principal reasons is that we've uh, uploaded and started using the new provincial system before other municipalities have. And they may or may not have the same issues that we did when they start to run with it. Yeah, so I would say that I don't know, I don't have a specific number or a list of who exactly have gone before us, who's like now, but uh, not all uh, municipalities uh, have uh, started the, the system yet. So they, they've been implementing it in different uh, stages or, or ways, and we're, you know, roughly somewhere in the middle of that. So there's some that have gone before us, some that are, um, you know, with us right now, and then there are some that are yet to come. Okay, and my last question, and it's going to sound like a broken record here, is that we don't report over the weekends, same as Halton does, but all our other neighboring municipalities do. And of course, over this was a three day weekend. And so we see this big double digit number come out this morning. Um, is there any movement to go back to reporting daily so we can compare apples to apples? Uh, so we, we aren't leaning towards that way at, at this moment. I do want to highlight that and you know there are a lot of municipalities uh, out there that uh, aren't reporting on the weekends either. But uh, it is one of those things that we'll continue to discuss and revisit. But at this time, we're not recommending going back uh, to reporting on weekends. I think our first priority, is to, frankly, is is to sort out this um, uh, you know forty eight hour delay in, in reporting first. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, that's all. Okay, thank you. I have Mayor Eisenberger, Councillors Jackson, Clark, Danko, and Wilson so far. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the uh, update, uh, Dr. Tran. And uh, one of the uh, one of the questions I'm getting asked uh, right now is, McMaster Mohawk students potentially coming back to town, and and uh, the uh, spread of COVID wherever it is is more prevalent now uh, in the in that cohort than uh, than anywhere else. And so, are we targeting some specific messaging to? those even though you know there's a lot of online learning going on i think there's still a lot of students coming back into town from other places and uh, they need to you know be mindful of the 10 person bubble and the social distancing and all the things that are going to be important to avoid any continued spread are we targeting that particular cohort at all in terms of additional messaging dr tran sorry i had um some technical issues. Uh, I'll just for the last other the question, and hopefully, if I missed something uh, earlier, let me know. Um, so, so certainly, we, um, as you mentioned, in terms of the the young adult and the, the student population, uh, we've been working closely with uh, Mohawk and McMaster uh, in terms of looking at uh, a number of their uh, infection prevention control measures and, and processes, and providing uh, you know feedback on that. They've been in consultation with us. They've sent us some of their uh, SOPs uh, for us to review. Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, a, a good working relationship we, we continue to have. Uh, the, the other part in terms of, you know, that that age group of like the, young, the youth and the young adults, as you remember, uh, a month or two months ago, um, we, we noticed a bit of a, an increase. So uh, we, we are continuing with that physical distancing campaign for youth and young adults that will happen throughout the, the fall. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, reinforcing that message, um, we'll you know continue to work with um, the you know, McMaster and Mohawk in terms of any additional messaging or IPAC measures. I think I, I, the number of students they actually are having uh, in the residence and the amount of uh, online. Um, you know, work that they have, but uh, we'll, we'll be, you know, continue to be in, in dialogue uh, with them uh, for uh, any advice or any common um, initiatives we want to do. Okay, thank you. And 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 the other, uh, and, and this is coming up even in my own family, uh, the bubble, the bubble of 10, which, uh, you know, far too many people in my opinion, and even in, in my own family have, uh, have gathered up multiple bubbles of 10 and uh, and have, have deemed that to be appropriate. And I think clearly there needs to be some discussion around uh, 
people, uh, you know, protecting that 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 number and not creating multiple kind of uh, groups of ten that they're uh, close with. And so, uh, can you repeat again and remind everyone again, you know, what what the standard is that uh, will help avoid you know any additional spread going forward? Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, I think it, it's critical uh, uh, because I think this is where we are starting to see the, 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 one of the driving forces in in our increase in numbers is there's been a relaxation of that bubble. Um, so the idea is that you're generally supposed to, you know, be physically distant, uh, distancing, and the bubble of ten is where you can let your guard down a bit, uh, and you know, you can provide hugs, you know, uh, but it is supposed to be, as you mentioned, you know, a, you know, one singular bubble of 10. So you start with your household. Um, I mean, if you have a household of 10, there, there's your bubble. Um, if you have um, anything fewer than that, then you, you know, add a, you know, an, an additional household up until you get to. Okay, I think Dr. Tram's freezing up on you, Mr. Mayor. It's, uh, the it's, first time. It's, it's freezing at my <laughs> office as well, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, just, just, just to close it off. I mean, I, I you know, I, I think it's important that we continue the messaging. And one of the, uh, you know, the good news items is that we have less people being hospitalized today. And I think uh, after Dr. Trans hearing that, that'd be my last question. I mean, uh, we're we're much better able to deal with uh, cases that are coming up, especially because we have public health nurses, nurses now, uh, you know, hired up to go into the schools. So contract tracing is much improved and certainly the apps were all out there. So less people are today hospitalized, as I understand it, Dr. Tran, than, than we had before. So do you have any stats on that right now? Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, so from uh, the numbers, again, there are 48 hours ago, but we, to my knowledge, we only have, two uh, individuals currently hospitalized. So we're certainly doing uh, very well uh, in that right now, which uh, is you know, significant uh, for our hospital partners. Much appreciated. And I guess my time is up. The alarm just went off. I, I, I wanna thank the community at large for their good work. I mean, uh, even though we see breaches and, you know, on occasions, uh, you know, we're, we're in a good position because the public at large has listened to the good advice of our EOC and our public health and have done a terrific job of listening and, and putting into practice some of the things that we've asked them to do. And we, we encourage them to continue doing that. Um, you know, this is very much still out there and, and uh, very important that this work continues. And, uh, and, and, and thanks again to Dr. Tran and EOC for, for all your good advice in terms of uh, getting folks to take those important actions. So well done all around. Thank you. Thank you. And I've got Councillors Jackson, Clark, Danko, Wilson, and I'm going to start Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I'll just piggyback on, to start with, I'll piggyback on the Mayor's uh, uh, compliments supremely all around once again, given the severity of this pandemic. Just to thank again uh, the head director of the EOC, Paul Johnson, Dr. Richardson, yourself, Mr. Mayor, and the entire team for the outstanding job that's been done in our community these last seven months. Um, one question for General Manager Johnson, Madam Chair, and one question for Dr. Tran. Paul, um, the seniors I know, um, they're guardedly optimistic to hear that Sackville Senior Center will reopen, I believe on October 5th. I'm delighted uh, with that decision, of course, with prudent precautions going forward. Um, and the seniors that I talk to regularly, uh, one senior, she called me recently just to digress for a moment from her apartment building to just tell me how proud she was in the seniors apartment building that they haven't had any outbreak in these seven months, Councillor Jackson, and we're all doing our very best. And I congratulate her. So question to you, Paul, about Sackville. And I hear, and I think there were three or four other centers you're opening uh, with the seniors participation. Can you in more detail just, um, describe and explain how you're going to roll that out as you know many of them have classes of workshops um, exercise classes just even a social time together uh, in the lounge can you maybe for public consumption just roll out how uh, you're uh, hoping that we're going to reopen Sackville because I know President Marianne Lee will be listening closely through you Madam Chair 
Sure, and through the chair, uh, in terms of the the actual programming, I mean, they're still working through that. They've really just made the decision last week. It was only approved at the EOC yesterday, so uh, they'll be working through exactly what they are. But in general, we are going to try and use larger spaces to accommodate um, more people, but it is still going to be far fewer people able to access uh, Sackville on a regular basis than would be in normal cases. Uh, and some of the activities of, of the food and everything else will, will not exist. So these are are opportunities for people to come in and yep. and experience um, some level of programming. We'll try and use things like uh, uh, the the larger gym spaces or the uh, the large room that we have at Sackville. Turn that into more programming space and less about uh, sort of cafeteria space, and encourage people to be doing the activities in a physically distanced way. So all the full range of services yet to be determined. Uh, yes, they're opening on October 5th, so that's the work that's happening feverishly over the next four weeks, and and. And there'll be more online about how that looks. But I can say in general, what people will do when they arrive is they'll see all the same things they're seeing in other places. Uh, that, um, uh, you know, masks will be required. People will be more physically separated. Uh, the types of programs that brought people in close contact together. Some of those will not be available. It will be more about some uh, general social activities and some recreational activities that can encourage people to get out. So this is right now, I would say in the next month as we prepare a real balance between getting people in and seeing what's possible and seeing how we can deliver some of those services. And I have no doubt over the coming months that more services will be added. I'll just remind folks that um, at the regulations from the province when it comes to recreational centers of all kinds, including our senior centers, uh, do talk about each individual space. So there is the opportunity as we go forward to have numbers that reflect each of the spaces where we can deliver service. It's not sort of 50 people or 100 people in a facility. It's uh, by the rooms and what we can accommodate while uh, having the physical distancing and the physical separation that uh, is required. Lots of extra cleaning in these facilities, lots of uh, sure. hand sanitizer and, and all the rest, and an encouragement, regular encouragement for people to be washing their hands or using the hand sanitizer sanitizer as they as they come and go so you know it's 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 like everything else we're doing we're going to try and make it feel as normal as possible uh, but i i think to your point about what can people expect fewer people in uh, we'll be using more of the larger spaces to do activities that potentially in the past weren't in those larger spaces but that will allow us to have more than two or three people participate it'll get us 10 12 people participating that we used to have but the old room okay. that we used to use might just be too small and what we don't want is to say well if you want to do it in that room then only two people can do the activity because that's the space size it doesn't make a lot of sense so we're going to use larger spaces wherever possible Perfect. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Terrific answer, Paul. Uh, thank you. And um, please, wherever possible, uh, the executive team of President Marianne Lee and her volunteer executive team, whatever you can do with staff, include them in rolling out your program because I know they'd, be, they'd love to be part of the messaging. Uh, Madam Chair, if you allow me the one question, Dr. Tran, please. Okay, hang on. I'd have to shut my alarm off. It was just about to go off on you. All right. Then put, me back, put me back on the list and I have a question for Dr. Tran. Put me down for a second time then for Dr. Tran, please. All right, thank you. I have Councillor Clark. I'm chair and thank you, Councillor Jackson. You always do stick to the rules. You're a good guy. Um, quick question for Dr. Tran, I think. Uh, so the schools are now opening up. Um, if we have outbreaks in the schools, do the school boards have to report the outbreaks to public health? And are those outbreaks then reported to the public? To you, uh, Madam Chair. So the short answer would be uh, yes and yes. Um, I mean, certainly we are informed of every um, a single confirmed case, uh, and we should be also be, uh, and that's through labs, through the schools. There's a number of variety of mechanisms. Um, the and it was actually it would be up to uh, us really to decide. Um, you know, you know, in keeping with some of the provincial sort of guidance documents, whether we have an outbreak. And, and an outbreak is actually defined, uh, it, you know, it, to more, we typically call outbreaks where you need to have at least uh, two cases. Uh, so two cases in a certain period of time where we there we have reasonable, on the reasonable belief that it, there's acquisition or transmission that's happened in the schools. So certainly, um, uh, you know, there's certainly an interest in this. And then, uh, so we would be actively managing the outbreaks and working with our, our school board. And you, you certainly, 
the public would would hear from it. I think there's an additional um, type of uh, transparency that you should be aware of is that the province has also required uh, through, I think, the Ministry of Ed uh, and boards that they are expected to post, um, you know, or cases uh, without any identifying uh, details of the individuals uh, uh, on the school board website. So I think they'll that's also going to be uh, available publicly. I think it will save um, school and uh, whether it has a case or not. Thank you, Dr. Tram. Maybe if you don't mind, if you shut your video off, it might make your um, broadband a little stronger. And also your video was getting a little blurry anyway, so this might be helpful. Sorry, Councillor Clark, go ahead. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because um, the, uh, rumors in the community, at least in Ward 9, is that the schools were not going to be re sending home notices to parents that there is an outbreak. And so that had me a little bit concerned because if we're operating in a bubble of 10 and I have four granddaughters and two and two of them are in school and they're parts of my 10, then my bubble just grew to 250. Um, and it's important that we understand what's going on in the school. So you're, you're saying that um, if there is an outbreak of two or more in a school that the public will be notified um, and that's public health's responsibility. Thank you, Will, through you, uh, Madam Chair. Do you want to sort of clarify? I think there's, there's always levels of cases and outbreaks, but certainly we, we want to, you know, do the appropriate uh, risk communication and transparency of the public. So there's, there's individual cases, and then there can be an outbreak. And the outbreak, like we see in many other settings, can be you know very localized uh, to just two people within a class uh, versus you know what we you know, we you know clearly don't want it to happen is anything that goes beyond that. Um, but certainly, anyone that that would be clearly affected um, uh, would would be communicated first and foremost. But then, from a transparency perspective, we. We certainly know there's an interest in terms of uh, uh, outbreaks. And I think we would start off uh, a bit more cautiously, um, just, you know, just to see what the situation is like uh, first before uh, we take any additional steps. Thank you, Councillor Clark. But to be clear, if there's an outbreak in a school, the parents are going to be notified and the public are going to be notified. That's what I'm hearing. Is that correct? It'll be communicated, yes. Thank you. I appreciate that verification. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Uh, let's see. And I have Councillor Danko, then Wilson, and then Nan. Councillor uh, Danko. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I'm just going to follow up where Council Clerk left off. Um, most kids are going back to school as of next week, including my own. So I know it's top of mind for many, many uh, parents and caregivers in our community. So just on the issue of an outbreak in schools, I'd just like to dig a little deeper on that quickly, if I may. So say it's not an outbreak, that is just one single confirmed positive case. Will parents be notified in that case of a child in their class or cohort? Uh, Dr. Chan? Yeah, through you, Madam uh, Chair. I mean, the general answer would be yes, like, you know, within that class. I think the, the only... I mean, the short answer is that just generally yes. I think the the only exception might be that uh, if the the student has uh, never stepped foot in the class while they were uh, infectious, then I think it would be very different because there's no exposures. But certainly, if there's been any exposures within a classroom settings, we you know we, we clearly the, the general rule of thumb uh, would be you start with the entire class. Um, as the as the cohort for uh, both communication and in terms of you know sending them home, isolating them, that type of thing as as a starting point, and you can adjust uh, from that. But that's uh, that's where we'd be going. And as I mentioned a moment ago, I think we want to start um, you know probably being a bit overly cautious early, and uh, you know any adjustments uh, later if if we get reassured by what we're saying. Councillor Kodanko. And for my own clarity here, who would be responsible for actively 
notifying the parents and how would that notification be um, communicated? Would that be a phone call, an email, or would that just be a posting on a website that parents would have to check? And is that Hamilton Public Health or is that the school board's responsibility? Sure. Um, to you, Madam Chair, uh, it's depending on the situation, be a combination of both. I do want to to uh, state that in terms of how we manage cases is that once we have a confirmed case and we identify you know, who are uh, considered you know, close contact, had significant exposures, we as Hamilton Public Health uh, take the lead in notifying uh, those cl close contacts uh, just so that they understand and that they understand the instructions of their identified close contacts that they are to quarantine themselves uh, for 14 days and then we'd be checking in on them periodically to, to see how they're doing and whether they're developing any symptoms so for you know if if we make the, the you know the general assumption that let's say we the whole class is considered a close contact you would expect that uh, the children and the, the parents that would be uh, notified by uh, if we generally do that uh, by phone because we we want to inform them and then I think the the public health action we want is that um, they are quarantined if they're close contacts uh, for the 14 days of following exposures in the event that they're um, they've been exposed and, and incubating the virus um, and and to pre prevent any further spread. Thank you, Councillor Danko. Thank you. And a couple questions on the uh, the 19 new school nurses that the the province is funding and obligated us to hire. I heard you earlier say that they've they've all been onboarded so those nurses have been hired is that correct uh through you madam chair that would be correct i do want to um so we've got them recruited um they are you know we've got nurses ready to go to respond to to schools as needed i think um as some of you know in terms of our school program uh if you do a more health promotion model it's it's a bit different in terms of a nurses to specific schools. I think we want to have a bit of that approach, but we do know that COVID-19 is uh, is very it is very demand driven. So you have a case and you have certain issues with symptomatic children, so you have to be able to uh, respond accordingly. In terms of the, the 19, um, so I think the, the, the other sort of good news is that, as, as you know, that the, the federal government had uh, provided some additional funding uh, to the to the, the and uh, and then they flowed through some of the municipalities. Uh, so we are actually at 23 nurses, including uh, one francophone nurses, uh, nurse. Uh, so I think that's the, the, the other uh, uh, update. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Danko, you're down to 10 seconds. W one quick follow-up then. Um, can I put you on the second? Only because we have Councillor Jackson who's received, who's six, um, conceded. So I'd like to do the same for you if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you. I can't shut this off once it's on. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> okay, you get to go. No, th I'm kidding. Um, Councillor Wilson, please. Huh? Councillor Wilson, you're unmuted on our end, but you're muted somehow on yours. So do you want to check the middle part just to see? The red circle should be off in the middle. Are you plugged in on all sides or maybe you need to change the port? Because I can see you talking, but we can't hear anything. So I'll do this for now, okay? Perfect. So I won't Perfect. hold Thank up you. anybody. Thank you. Uh, so my apologies. I know um, the question was asked about wave two planning and I, I likely missed it or misunderstood the, the answer. Um, the wave two planning, uh, Dr. Tran, I would take it that the province sets the threshold of uh, what would kick in wave two. Uh, can you confirm that and whether there would be an allowance for regional difference in that? Um, and uh, what is what would that threshold be? So through you, Madam Chair, uh, I mean, the, the, so my response earlier was asked directly by Councillor Ferguson whether we are in wave two and I would not consider that to my knowledge, there isn't an exact threshold, a number um, triggers wave two. Um, and um, so that's why I don't, there's not an answer I can give you right now in terms of what's the number that would, 
a trigger officially wave two. I do know that from the provincial standpoint, they're, um, they've been more open and moving towards more of a regional approach uh, in terms of measures um, and allowing municipalities, regions to you know, take uh, additional actions or tailor some of their approaches based on local regional epidemiology. Um, but um, to my knowledge, there isn't a magic number uh, provincially or regionally that kicks us automatically in, in wave two. Okay, thank you. Um, to the city manager or Paul Johnson, the um, reference was made to the EOC. Could you just confirm um, whether it's in stage one or stage two act activation? Uh, so through the chair, we're in uh, a stage uh, st stage two activation, a full activation. It might actually describe it as, as stage three, which doesn't mean there's any extra people, but it means we are virtual. We don't meet in person. So we have uh, we have a full activation of our EOC that continues, uh, but we do meet virtually only. Okay, thank you. And the third question I have is um, now or perhaps in the future, could, could you comment on the role um, uh, the capacity of our bylaw enforcement. My understanding is they're they're quite busy, and whether they're able to respond to um, uh, what they normally respond to, whether it be uh, in our public health officials, are they able to um, be doing what they regularly would do pre-COVID? Uh, so through the chair, I can certainly work at bringing back some some capacity issues. I think uh, our next update, it's actually kind of a nice timing because we're settling in now to what might what this look like for the next few months. So I'll work with uh, Ken on, in terms of bylaw. And as you know, bylaw and, and public health inspectors are working together on certain things and then public health inspectors have their own role. I do know that public health inspectors um, are are stretched. They are, um, they are not... Uh, want to put this uh, in, a, in a way that doesn't worry people, but they, they do have to prioritize where they're going and they have been pulled in a number of directions through to COVID um, related activities. So they are not always able to respond with the same uh, level of, of uh, swiftness to, um, to some of the things that would have been responded to if this had been September of 2019. So we can certainly have Kevin McDonald uh, also provide a bit of an update uh, at the next meeting about what our public health inspectors uh, uh, are feeling these days, uh, although I will say that you did approve in the hiring of additional staff that more public health inspectors would be part of that cohort. So that's why I say it's probably useful to get an update um, in a couple of weeks time on that. And then I'll also ask on the bylaw side of it. But I can tell you, generally speaking, everyone is stretched to continue to do what they used to do because there aren't a ton of new resources, but there are an awful lot of pieces of extra work. If you're a public health inspector, uh, all sorts of extra work in terms of congregate settings and, and restaurants as they open and, and those types of issues. And then on the bylaw side of things, uh, continuing to try and respond to the COVID-related issues that people raise in the community alongside all of the general uh, bylaw-related uh, issues that um, that are always there in our community. Thank you. Councilor? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and in that report back, would you also be able to clarify if there are any um, services that were provided by public health or bylaw that are not being provided at all now? Um, because of, of COVID, because uh, we've had some experiences with that. So I'd just like some clarification on that. Yep, through the chair, Thank for you. sure. Just before you answer, Paul, this will be your last question, uh, Councillor Wilson, and then I can put you back on. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Yep, for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Wilson, you're five minutes now. Would okay. you like me to put you back on? Um, I well, think I can, and then you can decide not to after. I think I have some questions uh, that may uh, be for Dr. Tran when we get to the public encampment report. So I'll, I'll think I'll hold. Okay, thank you. Councillor Nan, you're on. Councillor Nan, oh, no, I can't hear you, sir. Oh, now I can. Thank you through the chair. My apologies. I hit the button when my daughter was in the room earlier. Um, so just a couple of follow-up questions to Dr. Tran. One was in terms of the continuous uptick that we are seeing of the five cases a day, are we noticing any patterns in terms of the types of um, locations or activity uh, or establishments where that spread is taking place in terms of a Hamilton pattern? 
Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, not to that level. I think the, the pattern tends to be similar to what I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, several weeks ago, where um, and it's it's more of a general pattern of of you know a significant amount that's happening in households, but also um, in expanded social circles. So people, um, you know, are having uh, or attending parties or, or gatherings so sometimes we're going to the cottage um and you know that's you know driving the you know the, the uptick in, in cases so it gets introduced somewhere um uh, within that setting and amplified to the the you know the social gathering numbers or or bubbles i guess that uh, expanded bubbles that people are, are doing so just so I'm clear through the chair, then um, we're seeing the uptake in social gatherings or are how are we categorizing the activity? Because um, my understanding from the contact tracing is that we get pretty specific um, in that interview process in terms of those cases that are positive. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, so we, you know, for each case, uh, you know, we do ask and try to de determine where they have been and, and and you know our three broad categories for acquisition has been travel related. We've seen you know, a little bit of an increase in that. Uh, uh, close contacts, uh, as well as what community acquired, which is really we we can't pinpoint it. Uh, you know, so we're still seeing significant amount of of uh, exposed to contacts. Um, I think where it used to be is that 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 was driven by. One member of the family got it. The other household have gotten it. Now we're seeing being you know associated with other contacts uh, that have uh, occurred in other uh, non-household settings, more social settings. Like people have gone to a significant party together, um, and you know, you're seeing a few cases there, or they all went with uh, you know a couple you know a bunch of people to a cottage or a backyard party. So uh, there's still a lot of it's still happening in terms of you know contact to a case, but uh, it gets amplified a bit more when you're you know, not only within your household, but you're um, attending or being participant in other uh, larger social gatherings. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Cotnan. Yes, um, I guess then the other questions that I had, uh, one was in follow up on the safe bubble protocol um, as some residents were inquiring with me about once their kids start school, the possibility of making a new friend, is it or is it not recommended practice to uh, ditch somebody out of your social bubble and adopt somebody new into your social bubble? And I just wanted to make sure that we had a public health response to that question as it was a pretty interesting one. Thank you, Thank you Council, or Dr. Tran. Sorry. <laughs> to you, Madam Chair. I don't think there's any particular rules. I mean, I, I also don't want to weigh in in terms of like <laughs> public health told you like to ditch me as a friend. But uh, uh, no, I, I think the, the idea of, of, of bubble is that, um, I mean, as a rule of thumb, they should be constant for as long as they can, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you're going to stay in that bubble, you know, for weeks, months, like, like years on end. This is the, you know, I think what, what we don't want is people, you know, changing bubbles very frequently. So I think if it's, you know, uh, a thoughtful approach in terms of, yes, you know, we spend a lot of time here. You know, I like to switch my bubble. Um, you know, the other folks in, you know, are willing to commit, you know, to a different bubble um, you know, sort of time period. And it's, and it's you know, again, stable uh, for a period of time. I think that's, that's very different than I'm going to have a bubble of 10 this week and I have another bubble of 10 the next week. Right? I think it's, I don't think there's a, a clear black and white answer, but I appreciate it. Helps. Thank you. <laughs> and final question is on the equity health data uh, stats uh, related to COVID, as we had um, discussed as a council previously and at, at Board of Health previously, it was in relation to preparation for uh, potential wave two and what that might mean in terms of where we allocate resources and how we might be able to support uh, specific communities that have been uh, disproportionately impacted in terms of the COVID cases. So just a quick update on that and when when we'll be receiving that uh, information. Sure, so through you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I think I uh, spoke last time with almost uh, up-to-date information, but not quite. So I think when um, I last provided an update, the, the plan at that time and uh, was 
there would be two separate reports and uh, preliminary uh, analysis report in September Board of Health and a final report in November. I think what's changed now is actually ultimately a better uh, solution that there will just be one report in the October Board of Health that will have the final results. Uh, that's to my so rather than hearing some preliminary information then two months they're getting, I think the, the plan now is one report with the the final results and it's, it's on track to my knowledge in October. Thank you. Those are my Thank questions. You. Thank you. Right on five minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, hang on a second. I'm just learning. There, sorry. Okay, I have Councillor Pauls and then I have second time speakers coming up. Councillor Pauls. Thank you. Dr. Tran, you started off by saying that we've had a thousand uh, tested positive for COVID. When did we start uh, the stats? Was it February or March? Uh, to you, Madam Chair, uh, I, our first case was at some point mid-March. Uh, so that's uh, when the, the case counts have started. And you also said we have uh, 45 death. When was the last time we had a death? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I'd have to look. It's definitely been uh, well over a month now because I think at the last uh, DOC that I was involved with, uh, we, we, we remained at 45 deaths. So it was some point uh, in June or July that we had the most June. recent death. So that's uh, good news. I was wondering, out of the 1,000, do we keep stack? How many uh, stats, how many had severe symptoms? How many have gone to the hospital? How many um, were just symptomatic and didn't feel anything? Do we have those stats as well? After you, Madam Chair, yes, we do. Um, so did the same report, I think, in terms of hospitalizations, I'd have to look at that. I think in terms of ever been hospitalized, it's about 14 to 15% that have ever been uh, hospitalized. Um, so 14 to 15%, that, roughly how much is that? Uh, uh, oh, let me check. Twenty. Just give me a moment here. Okay, so ever hospitalized, it looks like um, one hundred and forty-eight have ever been. Yep, have ever been hospitalized. Okay, and. The oh, yeah. And quick math, 14, 15 percent of a thousand is right. 15. Sorry. So, and they've all recovered, uh, except like the 45 deaths we've had, right? Correct. Correct. I was wondering, I don't know if Paul, um, Paul Johnson knows, so you know, I had a question from a constituent. When somebody gets tested and they are positive, is their name on the record forever? Are they going to be put on that record? What? what record? The record of they had, we have a thousand people that test the po positive, right? So will they be on that list all the time, right? Yes, Even so you, Madam Chair, yes. Those are have ever been uh, diagnosed, um, confirmed with COVID. So I had a question from one of my constituents that says, I, maybe you don't know this, or I, I don't know if Paul Johnson knows. Uh, if we download the, the map, uh, the um, the new app that's out to know who had COVID. If I had COVID, let's say back in March, would that app show that I've had COVID? And do you know that? Or they asked me that question and I did not, not download, so I do not know the answer. Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, so my understanding um, is that you would be entering that information um, uh, yourself, so whoever has it, if you've been diagnosed, you would put that in. So it should only be, um, on, I mean, I don't see a reason why as uh, someone who had it in March would enter that information in now because they've, they've clearly recovered. So it should be, um, you know, active uh, 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 cases right now, uh, you know, but it is it is based on the user um, in entering the information on their own uh, app that will help okay. notify alert others that have been uh, around them. Okay, I misunderstood then. So the app, uh, in your knowledge, is I would enter all the information, not the city or the province 
Like we know we had a thousand people that had COVID. We do not enter those in the apps, right? Madam, through you, Madam Chair, that would be correct. I mean, the, the idea is to identify people who have been uh, recently exposed that may not have uh, uh, known. Okay. All right. Uh, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, I, I did not download the app. I don't know if any of my colleagues did, but uh, uh, I, did, I did not know much about it. So thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we're on to second time speakers. I have, and Councillor Clark, I'm, I apologize. I don't know where you are on this list. I had Jackson, Councillors Jackson, Danko, and Wilson during the conversation, um, but I have Councillor Clark. That's the the uh, the clerk had me put down. I think at the very beginning. So if you don't mind, I like to do it with my list here. I'm getting thrown out a whole bunch of names. You will get, uh, you will be put in, I promise. Councillor Jackson, thanks for your patience. Thanks, Madam Chair, and I dig that alarm. Anyways, um, Madam Thank Chair, you. through you to Dr. Tran. Um, Dr. Tran, uh, from time to time now, in light of again, how well our community has done these seven, eight months, I'm having some people ask me if we'll reach a threshold where things will, we can carry on life as we once knew it. In other words, using as a comparison, influenza. We know every year there will be X number of the population that will get influenza, will get the uh, household flu. We have a vaccine for it. Is, is that the main difference? I'm not trying to sound glib or um, I'm not trying to sound, um, uh, 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 making light of this matter, but is the main difference why we can't carry on life as we once knew it. The fact that there isn't a vaccine that's proven yet so that we can reach the threshold of the everyday flu that we have lived, lived with for generations where we expect X number of people will get the flu, but we're not shutting down the city over that because there is a vaccine. Madam Chair, because I'm getting a few people asking me, when can we reach a threshold of returning to normalcy? I guess, is it mostly because of a proven vaccine? Through you, Madam Chair, and that's my only question. Yeah, through you, you. Madam, yep, through you, Madam Chair, I mean, the short answer would be yes. I think the, the main concept is that um, it's the, the number of uh, Hamiltonians as well as Canadians and, and other citizens that have immunity uh, to this. So if you think of 5,000 uh, Hamiltonians, I mean, I mean, certainly there's gonna be some that have, haven't been identified or, or tested. The vast majority of Hamiltonians um, have never had uh, COVID. So they're, they're clearly uh, susceptible. And we've seen, you know, yeah, for most people um, healthy, they, they do well, but we do know for some people they don't. I think that that's the main difference uh, with this and the flu is that there's a significant amount of immunity that people have with the flu and a lot of that is it's also been seasonal unfortunately with the flu and then and you have vaccines that sort of you know significantly raise that number up i think we can start thinking about you know having parallels to you know living with covid versus living with the flu um when we you know, have vaccines or something like that where we can be much more confident that you know, a significant amount of, uh, of Hamiltonians, of citizens have immunity. So I think that's the biggest challenge is the vast majority of us uh, don't have it um, and and it uh, can, we can get it. Thanks, Dr. Tran. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks again. And Councillor Danko, thank you for your patience. You're on second. Oh, you're off. Sorry, my apologies. Councillor Clark, second time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Councillor Paul's uh, brought up some very interesting questions with regards to um, the identity. And I think it's important, um, Dr. Tran, that we stress the anonymity of contact tracing, um, the app that's out there right now, um, and in all of our public health data we don't share the identity of anyone that has uh, been infected with COVID. We simply identify people who may have been in close contact to that individual and we never use their name. Is that not all correct? Uh, through, um, that's generally the rule of thumb. We, we do the best uh, to you know, maintain 
of privacy and we share the minimal amount of information needed. And then generally that is, you know, uh, you know, you've been identified as a contact. I think it becomes very different in like in a household where it becomes clearly not <laughs> um, a, a secret anymore, but for, for most cases, yeah, I think we, what we want to do is um, we want people to come forward and get tested. We want people um, you know, to feel comfortable to, to, to get tested, to, you know, be open and honest uh, with uh, us in terms of their interactions and where they've been. Uh, so it is absolutely critical that we, you know, we uphold the privacy and confidentiality of individuals as best we can. And the app that um, the Premier and the Prime Minister have been talking about, um, if we can just talk about that for a second. The app is, is actually kind of interesting in that um, you log yourself into the app um, if you find out that you're positive for COVID, then when you go to the testing clinic, they will give you a one-time key to enter into your app on your phone. You enter in that one-time app key, and then the the app actually uh, reaches out to anyone that may have been in your proximity and notifies them, but it doesn't say who the person was. So it's totally anonymous and so far it's worked very well. So I'd encourage people to to utilize it. I know Quebec didn't utilize it, but uh, there has been great uptake in Ontario anyways. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, second time. Thank you, Madam Chair, can you hear me now? No. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I was kidding. <laughs> I love it. Oh, you're rocking today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm something, I'll tell you. Uh, timer woman. Okay. I uh, just uh, to follow up on Councillor Clark's question about database and access. There was a story in one of our uh, media outlets um, a week or more ago, I've lost track of time, in which it was uh, reported that uh, the HPS had accessed. Um, uh, a COVID database, uh, but paramedics hadn't. And I was wondering if Dr. Tran uh, or Mr. Johnson could respond to that, please. So, I mean, I'll start, I think, uh, through you, Madam Chair, and I'll have Paul you know, speak in terms of paramedics. Um, I think what I'll, I'll sort of comment in terms of the database is that it is um, a, a provincial, or was, I suppose, a, a provincial database um, that was set up uh, and the it was legislation was made accompanying uh, to grant access to uh, first responders, uh, whether it's firefighters, uh, police, or paramedics, with the intention of trying to do their best to uh, protect um, you know, first responders as best they can from being exposed to, to COVID. So they were granted both legislation as well as access as they. Uh, needed to with a certain, you know, significant levels of uh, sort of policies and safeguards to you know, try to you know, protect again, maintain confidentiality as they can. Um, you know, that intention. I think what changed uh, you know, more recently is that that legislation was uh, you know either expired or was uh, re rescinded. I forget the exactly uh, happened from a legal perspective, but it is no longer. Uh, uh, in in place, and uh, I, I can't comment in terms of uh, you know the use of it by uh, organizations. So through the through the chair, the paramedic service uh, did not need to access it. The uh, chief Sanderson operationalized our responses to calls in a way that um, uh, this is purely uh, my terms of it and not the technical terms the paramedic chief would use, but essentially we treated all uh, calls at that COVID level. And, and so he went to a more universal approach to PPE and things, which um, I believe was the intent behind the province's move. Uh, this was not a municipal move, but a provincial move, but our paramedic service didn't need to, to go that route. Um, fire on a handful of occasions where they were the immediate responder uh, did. And then um, the police uh, numbers were reported as well. 
And, and the other important piece that, that Dr. Tran indicated is our public health uh, officials at no time facilitated that access. Uh, this was done through provincial access to a portal and not through our public health services. So uh, it was not a, a work together at the municipal level and have your public health services provide the access. It uh, was uh, those organizations through their provincial representatives having access through a portal. And in all cases, it was uh, for communication staff, uh, which is generally referred to as the dispatch folks not for all paramedics, not for all firefighters, not for all uh, police officers. It was meant as a communication tool for those dispatching uh, first responders to the scene. Councillor? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so obviously I have additional questions, but it, it's not within the, our realm to know or perhaps answer those um, and uh, what happened with that access and where it was housed or kept and for how long. So. Thank you for clarifying that. Those are my questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, timer's off, folks. And so I need a mover and a seconder, please, to receive the COVID update. Councillor Pearson, second by Councillor Pauls. And electronic vote, please. Yes, Councillor Farr, I see your thumbs up. Thank you, sorry. I've got Councillor Johnson and Councillor Partridge. I don't see Councillor Partridge, so I'm gonna mark her. Okay, thank you. Oh, I must have. So we have uh, about 15 more videos to go through and then we will do the encampment as the last um, item because we will be going in camera after that for the encampment. So I would like to keep those two topics together if you don't mind folks. I'm at the will of the committee, we still have about 15 videos to do. Okay, so Tamara, are we set to go? It's actually switched over to uh, me right now because Tamara was frozen out. So bear with me, folks. I'm going to try from my computer. If you look at Tamara's computer, it's smoking right now. There's smoke coming out of it. Okay. I'll sit down. Okay, we ended up with, um, we didn't see Ishan.
sorry, Councillor. We're having a little bit of fun in here with technology today. Hello, my name is Ishan Morali and I'm a resident in Ward 1. I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton Police. Policing costs should not be the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and a wait list of hundreds for social housing. The police do not keep us safe and we're demanding that you reinvest in our communities. A 20% reduction is in fact possible. The city spends money on action police teams who card, surveil, and harass Black, Indigenous, and unhoused and racialized people in the city. We spend $171 million on policing, but the city of Hamilton will only spend $158 million on social services. This is a shame. The city of Hamilton, like I said, spends $171 million on the police budget, but only $11 million on child services. The HPS needs to be defunded because the taxpayer money could and should be spent on providing housing for houseless residents and not a police budget that continues the criminalization of poverty. Instead, for example, our city is thinking of spending money um, on the 2026 Commonwealth Games, somewhere between 100 to $200 million. These games also spend money on policing to the tune of about $100 million. There are better ways to invest in the community. This money can instead be used for food programs, social services, shelters, mental health supports, and many other programs that work to benefit our communities, which the police do not do. I, as a Ward 1 resident, support the demands of an immediate 20% reduction, full transparency of the line-by-line -line police budget, and a $30 million cut to HPS salaries, specifically from Division 1, 2, and 3. We want the money cut from the mounted unit, action team, and victim services. Additionally, starting the mo morning of August 5th, prisoners on range 4B in Barton Jail initiated a hunger strike, their third in the past two months. Their most recent strike in late July ended quickly when the administration agreed to meet their core demands, which were access to books from the outside and more items available from the canteen. However, it seems that these were empty words as more than a week later, there's been no follow through. We demand that the city of Hamilton ends the Barton prison hunger strike by meeting their demands, which are as follows. Access to books from the outside, more items on the canteen, raise the weekly canteen purchase limit, end lockdowns, allow anyone to visit, finally end the delays in mail delivery, delivery daily access to yard, keep and, and keep and improve the new phone system. Thank you, and I hope you take these demands into consideration. Thank you, Ishan. Uh, we now have Kinsey. I am a resident in Ward 2. I am sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. Why are policing costs the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an affordable housing crisis and wait lists of, of hundreds for social housing? Please do not keep us safe, and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. A 20% reduction is possible. Hamilton police will spend $78,806 on ammunition and $61,409 on tasers whose sole purpose is to physically harm people while they could be spent on any social services. The city and police should not have the power or tools to physically assault residents and should not have access to these weapons or a budget for them. The police service budget has gone up almost 50% in five years, and the city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget but only $44.3 million on housing services. The HPS needs to be defunded 
because taxpayer money sh could and should be spent on providing housing for houseless residents and not a police budget that continues to the cr criminalization of poverty. Instead, our city is thinking of spending between 100 to $200 million in the, 2020, on, on the 2026 Commonwealth Games. These games also spend money on policing to the tune of about $100 million. There are better ways to invest in this community. The City of Hamilton will spend $171 million on policing during pandemic, while Barton prisoners are currently on a hunger strike for basic living conditions like access to outside books, daily access to the yard, and disinfecting soap. Instead, this money should be directed towards affordable housing, food security programs, recreation, schools, social services, safe injection sites, mental health supports, youth programming, shelters, climate-related issues, and anti-racism. I'm asking for, and the community is asking for, an immediate 20% reduction in the Hamilton police uh, budget, full transparency of the line-by-line -line police budget, $30 million cut from the HPS salaries, specifically from divisions one, two, and three, money from the mounted unit forces, uh, an action team, and victim services. Demanding a, we are demanding a $2.5 million budget cut from materials and supplies in order to de demilitarize the police, and $2 million should be cut from overtime and part-time pay. Um, we demand the city of Hamilton and the Barton prisoner hunger strike by meeting their demands. Um, the demands, which are as follows, access to book from the outside, more items on canteen, raise the weekly canteen purchase limit, end lockdowns, lockdowns, allow anyone to visit, finally end the delays in mail delivery, daily access to the yard, keep and improve the new phone system. When we invest our money into police rather than our community, we are communicating that we choose to treat people as criminals rather than as community members. Defunding the police in Hamilton is a necessity and the only possible little avenue for creating a better, safer, and more care-oriented community. Thank you. Thank you, Kinsey. And on to Lisa. My name is Kinsey Robertson. Ward 6. I am sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton police. Why are policing costs the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city has an unaffordable housing crisis and wait lists of hundreds for social housing? The police does not keep us safe and we're demanding that you reinvest in our community. Why does the city spend $171 million on policing and only $158 million on social services. That is shameful. Why did the police service budget go up 50% in all five years? What's the reason? Why is it necessary? Why is the Hamilton police going to spend $78,806 on ammunition and $61,409 on tasers? Their sole purpose is to physically harm people. Th these money could be spent on social services. The city and the police should not have the power or tools to physically assault residents and should not have access to these weapons or a budget for them. Hamilton has a $3.3 billion infrastructure deficit, 
and a $23 million COVID deficit. The answer to mitigate these deficits is clear. Defund the police. Taxpayer money could and should be spent on providing housing for homeless residents and not a police budget that continues the criminalization of poverty. The city of Hamilton will spend $31,300 on a pipe band, police choir, and chorus, but is going to reduce the funding for food for prisoners by 5.97%, totaling $31,500. That is absolutely despicable. And the city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on policing during a pandemic while Barton prisoners are currently on hunger strike for basic living conditions like access to outside books, daily access to yard and disinfecting soap. Explain yourselves. I demand an immediate 20% reduction of the Hamilton police service budget. I want full transparency of the line by line police budget. What are they spending their money on? We want $30 million cut from HPS salaries, specifically from Division 1, 2, and 3. We want money cut from the mounted units, horses, action team, and victim services. I love Hamilton, and I want Hamilton to thrive as a city. And I believe by defunding the police, we can do that. We can reinvest the money into social services, into making the city a better place to live for everybody. And that is going to reap economic benefits. It's going to reap social benefits. And it's going to just make Hamilton the place to be that everybody wants to be. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And we have Jessica and Connor together. Bennett, and we live in Ward 2. We are making this video to express our concern with how much city funding is being allocated to policing. The police budget is the largest expense to Hamilton taxpayers, and we believe that funding would be much better spent on affordable housing, food programs, mental health resources, shelters, climate protection, and anti-racism initiatives. The City of Hamilton needs to immediately reduce police funding Hello, uh, my name is Hannah McDonald. I'm a resident in Ward 3 in Hamilton. Thanks again for everybody's patience. We're almost home, folks. And taxpayers, and we believe that fund. Hi, my name is Jess Glegg. My name is Connor Bennett, and we live in Ward 2. We are making this video to express our concern with how much city funding is being allocated to policing. The police budget is the largest expense to Hamilton taxpayers, and we believe that funding would be much better spent on affordable housing, food programs, mental health resources, shelters, climate protection, and anti-racism initiatives. The City of Hamilton needs to immediately reduce police funding by 20% and reallocate these funds to programs that will help the people of our city make ends meet. The City of Hamilton's priorities are clear when 171 million is spent on policing and only 44.3 million is spent on affordable housing, 11 million on children's services, and 4.8 million on unhoused people. We desperately need to change our priorities in order to serve everyone in this city. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Jessica and Connor. And we're on to now Hannah. I think you've got a sneak preview over earlier. Hello, uh, my name is Hannah McDonald. I'm a resident in Ward 3 in Hamilton. Uh, I'm sending a pre-recorded video to support the call to defund the Hamilton police. Uh, Hamilton has so many issues that take precedent over the exceedingly high costs of the police budget, namely our housing crisis. Um, the police do not keep us safe and we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities. Um, a 20% reduction is possible. Um, I think you're just not using your imaginations if you don't believe that. Uh, the police service budget has gone up almost 50% in the last five years. We spend 171 million on policing, but the city of Hamilton is only spending 158 million on social services. I think that is shameful. Uh, the city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget, but only $11 million on children's services. Um, the reason I think the Hamilton Police uh, Services budget should be defunded uh, is because Hamilton has a $3.3 billion infrastructure deficit and a $23 million COVID deficit. The answer to mitigate this deficit is clear. Defund the police. Uh, taxpayer money should uh, and could be spent on providing housing for houseless residents and not a police budget that continues criminalizing poverty. Instead, our city is thinking of spending between 100 to 200 million uh, on the 2026 Commonwealth Games. Don't do that. These games also spend money uh, on policing to the tune of about $100 million. There are better ways to invest in community. The city of Hamilton will spend $31,000 on a pipe band, a police choir, and a chorus, but will reduce funding for food for prisoners by 5.9%, totaling $31,500. The city of Hamilton will spend $171 million policing uh, during a pandemic while Barton prisoners are currently on hunger strike for basic living conditions to access like outside books, daily access to yard and disinfecting soap. Uh, the money could go to affordable housing, to food programs, recreation, schools, social services, safe injection sites, mental health supports, youth programming, shelters, um, climate action and anti-racism action. Um, we are demanding a 20% reduction immediately in the Hamilton Police Service budget, full transparency of the line-by-line -line police budget, and we want a $30 million cut from HPS salaries, um, specifically from Division 1, 2, and 3. Um, we want money cut from mounted unit uh, or horses, uh, the action team, and victim services. Uh, I also stand in solidarity with, solidarity with the Barton uh, prisoners uh, and support their hunger strike and their demands uh, and I think that they should be taken seriously and not just paid lip service too. Uh, thank you so much for listening and uh, yeah just do the right thing. Thank you Hannah and now I believe it's Kaylee up next. Hello, my name is Kaylee Cotillo and I'm a resident of Ward 8. I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton Police. Why are policing costs the highest cost to Hamilton taxpayers when the city currently has an affordable housing crisis and wait lists of hundreds for social housing? The police do not keep all Hamiltonians safe and rather endanger many of our communities, so we are demanding that you reinvest in our communities and in our city. A 20% reduction is possible for Hamilton. The city will spend $171 million on a police budget, but only $11 million on child services. The HPS have currently 17 full-time officers that work to oppress those made vulnerable in Hamilton, while Ontario Works just lost 44 hires to provide support to those same people. This city spends money on action police teams who card, survey, and harass Black, Indigenous, unhoused, and racialized individuals in communities in this city. Our budget reflects 
this city's priorities and there is no justifiable reason that the Hamilton police budget has increased 50% over five years, but our city cannot find a way to reduce that budget by 20% to support and sustain social and community programs. Taxpayer money should and can be spent on providing housing for houseless residents, for example, and not a police service that continues to criminalize poverty. There are many public services in Hamilton that require additional funding to support their communities, and an investment back into those communities will do far more good for our city than increasing a police budget. I am recording this to demand an immediate 20% reduction in HPS annual budget, full transparency of a line-by-line -line police budget, and a cut of $30 million from police salaries, specific, specifically from Departments 1, 2, and 3. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Kaylee. And Joanna, we heard from earlier today, uh, WebEx, and I still don't see my ear online, so we're gonna keep going. Uh, Jeanette is up now. Hmm? Yeah, just to warn you, Jeanette is going to show sideways. You might wanna Hi, tilt. My name's Jeanette. Hi, my name is Jeanette and I'm a resident of Ward 2 in Hamilton in the Beasley neighborhood. And I'm sending this video in support of the call to defund the police. Please do not keep us safe. We're demanding that you reinvest in our communities. I want to highlight some of the facts that have been put together by organizers in Hamilton, including the HWDSB Kids Help. The city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget but only 44.3 million on housing and 4.8 million on unhoused people. I work in supportive housing and I know how much more funding and resources is needed for this. The city spends money on action police teams who card surveil and harass black indigenous, unhoused and racialized people in the city. And I've seen this time and time again in my own neighborhood downtown. The police service budget has gone up almost 50% in five years. And we spend far less money on social services. This is a shame. Taxpayer money could and should be spent on providing housing for those who have not an adequate shelter, who have no home. They should be spent on services, other services like food security, social services, women's services that are constantly underfunded, youth programs, mental health, which is an addiction support, which are its own crises in our community. Um, I want to see our city invest in what's actually going to improve the well-being and quality of life of our community members. We're asking for a 20% reduction in the budget, full transparency of the budget, and we want um, 30 million cut from HPS salaries. I also wanna highlight the Barton Prisoner Solidarity demands supporting those as well. The pandemic has amplified pre-existing inequities in our society and woken many up to the violence and harm that occurs daily. Our city can do better. We can reimagine ways of keeping our community safe that has nothing to do with policing. We can support organizations and programs that care for and empower our most, most vulnerable. We can step up and actually serve our people. Please listen to the organizations who are already doing this work locally. I've been so impressed by Disability Justice Network of Ontario, especially during the pandemic. Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion, Keeping Six, HamSmart, HWDSB Kids Help, Hamilton Community Legal Clinic, Supporting organize, supportive housing organizations and more. The answers lie within our community. Um, yeah, so we can do better. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jeanette. And next up is Ken. Community, on behalf of CCAR, the Community Coalition Against Racism, which was founded in Hamilton in 1989, I would like to weigh in on the issue of defunding the police. In our view, defunding the police means reallocating the funding currently transferred by Hamilton City Council 
to the Hamilton Police Service. For decades, we have railed against the fact that in an excessive amount of nearly 20 cents on the dollar is transferred by the city and its budget to policing. For that kind of money, Hamiltonians should get premium policing, free of systemic discrimination against uh, racialized and indigenous people. But we don't. Instead, we get racial profiling, over-policing of racialized neighborhoods, carding, and police killings of racialized people and people suffering from mental illness. CCAR believes that police funding in Hamilton should be cut by 50% to 10 cents on the tax dollar. The police should demilitarize and sell off the armored car, the horses, the SWAT unit equipment, uh, the assault rifles installed in many patrol cars to raise the money to buy body cameras. The money freed up by defunding police should be allocated to social programs, social housing, and anti-racism initiatives geared to helping youth of color and indigenous origin, all of which are likely to reduce crime in the long run. To read CCAR's statement regarding police brutality in North America, from George Floyd to the six indigenous people who've been killed by police in Canada since March 2020, please go to CCAR's Facebook page and read our statement, which can be found there in a note. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Ken. And the next one is Amasha, Imasha. I sorry. As a city council, we need to defund the Hamilton Police Service. This is a matter of life and death. A couple of days ago, I listened to a CBC podcast where they spoke about how 2020 has been the worst year for police using violence on people in a mental health crisis. We saw this with both Ijaz Chowdhury and Regis Korchinski in Toronto. We don't want this to happen in Hamilton. It is ridiculous to think that armed, untrained police officers are being sent to de-escalate a person in a mental health crisis. A mental health crisis is a health crisis and it should be treated like one. The solution to the rise in police violence that we saw in 2020 is to defund our police service and move those funds towards services that work to prevent situations, situations such as this, such as mental health programs. Hamilton City Council, we need to defund our police and move those funds into other services that help to make our community a better place. So please defund our police service. Thank you. And next up is Sarah. Hi, my name's Sarah. Thank you for letting me speak today. Uh, today, obviously, we're speaking about the uh, Defend the Police movement and the request to remove 20% of the Hamilton Police Service budget um, and reload allocate it, I guess, to social services in the community. I think that's great. Um, lifelong resident of Hampton, raising my children here. Um, I'm an addictions counselor by profession. I have additional education in criminal psychology and behavior, so I know that the vulnerable population in the community does need more resources. I'm very familiar with that. And I think it's great that a lot of residents are on board saying, we need more money put into social services people, um, but I don't think it should be coming from the police. Um, I'm gonna let you know why. In Hamilton, uh, there's domestic violence that happens here and we need uh, frontline workers. We need officers to be able to respond to those calls in a timely fashion to protect lives of women and children. You know, there are some men as well, um, they need to be readily available to do that. We have a lot of people who are dying from fentanyl overdoses or, or any drug. We need officers available to stop mass traffic, you know, small drug deals, large drug deals. Those 
And we need frontline officers available to do that, right? So we need to think of, we need boots on the ground on the frontline working and officers taking calls. When you start removing officers available, um, the times you get to those calls and the available manpower to do these things drops, which means crime increases, which means victimhood increases, which means a whole lot of problems that we don't want to have, right? If we're trying to deal with the after fact of stuff that's happening with social services, you know, the police respond to frontline calls that deal with those as well, right? Um, child abduction, you know, Amber Alert can respond to those. Uh, recently has come out that the, a lot of hotels, motels in the uh, surrounding area, there's trafficking going on and prostitution. Um, police need to respond to those. You know, those are the young women and men. And that's that's not a good thing. We need officers responding to those calls, right? This, this is social services. Police are essentially social services in a way. Um, I've seen firsthand um, Hamilton Police Services. I've seen officers pick up the members of the homeless population, take them down to the Sally, take them to the hospital, respond to those kind of crisis calls. And, uh, you know, when we talk about, you know, the negatives about police, um, and I'm not trying to be an apologist, but human error is in every profession, and we have to expect a certain percentage of it. Um, there are people who are going to gravitate to uh, professions of power, like the police, the government, other things like this. And so the police do need to have policies that are going to be you know, able to keep people accountable when they're in the role of the police officers. Uh, Hamilton police have shot seven people in the past 20 years. I don't know what that looks like comparison to surrounding areas. I know it's relatively low compared to the United States where this kind of movement started from, right? So we have to keep that in our minds as well. We need to remember that we do need to have police not pigeonholed or generalized. Um, we do need to be upset when something bad happens, but we'd have to look at the positives as well, right? We can't, we can't fall into this mentality, right? Um, the police save lives. We, we need to let our children know and removing police from the schools where that might be a positive role model that children have. That might be the safe person that a child who's being abused at home goes to school and sees that officer. And because they see them frequently, they become a familiar face, a friendly face, and they can speak to them about what's happening to them at home. So when you think about social services and vulnerable populations, please keep that in mind, right? Um, I think it's great people want to invest into social services. Um, this is my ask. Uh, please contact the CRA. Uh, inquire about starting a charitable organization, a nonprofit. And please start more agencies in the city by doing that. Right? We need that. We know that there is an issue right now with drug abuse, uh, homelessness, uh, domestic violence, violence against women, uh, children, right? We need these services, but I don't think it's helping by removing it from the police budget because the police essentially are also a social services. They are sometimes the first contact, the first responders to stuff, right? When we want to say addictions issues, we have a woman who needs housing and has an addiction. It's because she might have come from domestic violence. We need the officers to get to her to protect her as well. Please remember these things, all right? Um, thank you. God bless. Thank you, Sarah. And now we have Claire. I'm sorry. Um, it turns out that Claire's video didn't work last night or this morning, and it's it's keeping up the good work, so it's not working right now. So we're going to go with Dania. I'm sending in this prayer. Hi, my name is Dania Guerra, and I'm a resident of Walter Creek. I'm sending in this prayer for your video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton Police. My experience is with the police are racially profiled, surveyed, powerless, and afraid, but never safe. They go far do not feel safe around Hamilton Police. To us, to me, they are a symbol of white supremacy. They are allowed to do what they want to us, harass us, and continue to enslave us. It's not a contentious fact, 
I would ask that if you disagree to please point me in the direction of people that have actually been held accountable for their own crimes. But, you know, let's just say one cop was held accountable, that wouldn't change the fact that the police must be defunded. And the reason for that is systemic racism, which means that even if, you know, theoretically there were no bad apples, the system would still continue to marginalize and disadvantage people of color. I would like to see the money from the city of Hamilton's $175 million police budget reallocated to addressing the affordable housing crisis in our community. There is no reason that people would be houseless during a pandemic or ever. It's unacceptable that the city of Hamilton will spend $171 million on the police budget, but only $4.8 million on unhoused people. It's a reflection of the disconnection that our politicians have from actual community members, because I'm sure if they went and spoke to the houseless members of our community, that this wouldn't be the case. So why are we keeping around the police? So that some white people can feel safe? What does safety really mean when it necessitates the subjugation of other people? I think here, being safe really means retaining privilege, that is, unearned advantages. Being safe here means maintaining a system of reality that lies in denial of other people's humanity. I'm talking about the fact that black and people of color, black people and people of color are saying that they feel unsafe, are being explicitly harmed, and that's what needs to be addressed right now. Lastly, I want to end by manifesting something. The Hamilton Police Services will be defunded. It is simply a matter of when. How many more deaths are needed for you to act? One should be enough. And that means this should have happened yesterday. One is enough. And I guarantee you, if you had your father, your brother, or your sister murdered by police, you would feel the same. At this point, calls to defund the police are a call to our collective humanity. Let's do better, Hamilton. Thank you very much. And we have Danielle up next. Stop investing so much in these militarized practices and in a system that continues to fail. Please stop investing so much in these militarized practices and in a system that continues to further oppression and instead start investing in housing, social programming, children's services, and infrastructure all those derelict building downtowns Hamilton, there must be something that can be done there. Invest in people instead of systems of oppression. I also stand with the prisoners on range 4B. They are people. They do not have to do a hunger strike. They deserve for their demands to be met. Please, please give them what they need. And I just have one more thing to say from these two here. Okay, what do you guys say? I think that one was my favorite. Uh, we have uh, Catherine up now. My name is Katie King. I live in Hamilton, Ontario. I grew up here and I'm currently working full time. I live in Ward 3 and I wanted to submit a video to be viewed before the general issues meeting on August 10th at 9.30 a.m. with three demands that I have as a person living in uh, Hamilton for the city of Hamilton. Number one, I think that the Hamilton Police Services should be defunded by 20% immediately. I think that um, there should be full transparency, I, transparency, i.e. line by line disclosure of the uh, police budget. And number three, I think that 30 million should be reduced from Hamilton Police Service salaries, uh, specifically in um, divisions one, two, and three, and also salary cut in the mounted mounted unit, the action team, and victim services. I think that this 20% should be reallocated to four specific places. Um, not, except for number one, the rest aren't in order of urgency 
in my opinion. But number one, I think, is number one and is affordable housing. Uh, we currently spend $171 million on police and only $44.3 million on um, affordable housing or housing services. And I think that folks should be off the street. Um, number two would be public education to support teachers, staff, and students um, returning to school in fall. Number three is mental health services. And number four for me would be climate action, even though this demand is kind of overarching for me. And um, so the first three redirections could be done in a way that is sustainable, done so in a way that is sustainable. But I think that there should be um, immediately a collaborative community effort with, as well as the city um, to create a, a urgent climate strategy. And that I think that this climate strategy for the city should um, also like weave through the entire city plan and that it should be intersectional in nature and should involve, like it should prioritize the voices of black and indigenous people of color. Um, and those are my four demands. So thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to the police being defunded by 20% immediately. Thank you. And our last video presentation today is Carly. My name is Carly Rogerson and I'm a Beasley resident in Ward 2, as well as a professional working in Ward 3 and 4 communities. I'm sending a pre-recorded video in support of the call to defund the Hamilton Police. I am speaking today to express that I support Councillor Nana Wilson's call to defund the police and prioritize investment in community safety and well-being. I will also be including a brief outline of my reasoning for supporting by highlighting my concerns about our current structure, as well as some suggestions as to where Hamilton can reallocate funds. My first concern is around wellness checks. I'm concerned about the amount of fatal encounters that have been happening in our very own country when it comes to law enforcement doing wellness checks. More specifically, here in Hamilton, I'm worried about our systems currently in place for wellness checks. My causes for concern in this area are one, I'm someone who has been in crisis before and I've experienced firsthand how relevant services have been overloaded with calls and do not have the capacity to provide essential care. Two, I am someone who works with vulnerable people in our communities. I'm aware of relevant services to access if someone is in crisis and upon attempting to access those services on their behalf, I was directed to call 911 where police were dispatched. My suggestions for this area are first to reallocate funds into services such as Coast and Barrett Center so they're able to provide relevant care to our population that are in crisis or in need of a wellness check. Second, to reallocate funds into our mental health services such as St. Joe's West 5th Campus, as well as Youth Wellness Center, allowing them to continue to provide preventative care, resulting in less people being in crisis. And third, to reallocate funds into community services that can provide frontline workers in all relevant fields training on how to safely connect a person in crisis to appropriate crisis services that are not law enforcement, such as Coast or Barrett Center. My second concern is around the state of the neighborhood action strategy, the NAS. Our priority neighborhoods outlined in the NAS have been in limbo with no concrete plan or guidance as neighborhoods have been stripped of their community development workers. These community hubs were put in place for a variety of reasons, one of them being to ultimately lower crime rate, lowering need for law enforcement by engaging communities in meaningful ways and allowing their residents to feel connected. My cause for concerns in this area are one, many communities under the NAS developed concrete strategies for crime reduction within their communities. These hubs are not provided enough resources to, to, to fulfill all of these identified strategies. The NAS has been in limbo with little guidance. The last report was published in 2017 and residents are still unsure about the state of the hubs limiting their abilities to develop their communities. My suggestions for this area are first to reallocate funds back into community hubs, allowing them to hire community development workers 
with a focus on community safety and well-being, and second, to reallocate funds into hubs, allowing them to engage with residents in conversations and events focused on community safety and well-being, especially amongst our community residents who have been experiencing systemic racism, empowering resident-led approaches and enabling their voices to be heard. My third and final concern, um, while working in both McQuesson and Keith communities, I have heard stories firsthand from many youth between the ages of 12 to 24. These stories involved their experiences with law enforcement, municipal services, and uh, publicly funded services. My cause for concerns in this area are one, youth who were sharing these experiences were sharing experiences that highlighted examples of structural racism and other forms of discrimination based on their identities. I would especially like to highlight that many of these discriminations were toward our LGBTQ plus populations. Two, youth do not feel safe sharing these experiences with individuals who are part of other systems, including the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board and the Hamilton Wentworth Catholic District School Board, as they have also faced similar structural racism and discrimination based on their identities within other services here in Hamilton. Three, youth felt comfortable sharing their experiences in community-based programs, but many of these programs are severely underfunded and struggle to maintain the capacity to offer these spaces. My suggestions for this area are, one, if and when reallocating funds, we need to involve the community in evaluating where to send funds to ensure that we are not funding alternative systems of systemic racism and other forms of discrimination. Two, communities should be consulted to identify priority service, service providers and organizations they feel confident to help ensure safety and well-being of their communities. Three, funds should be reallocated to grassroots organiza organizations and service providers who are providing meaningful spaces for vulnerable people impacted by systemic racism and other forms of discrimination. Four, a motion to evaluate our municipal government, our municipal services, as well as other major service providers that are publicly funded to identify systemic racism and other forms of discrimination with a commitment to develop an action plan to eliminate systemic racism and other forms of discrimination from our city. In conclusion, I believe I have showcased some concerns as well as some suggestions to help guide discussions on and explain what I mean when I say I am for defunding the police. When I say I am for defunding the police, I am not saying I am for eliminating law enforcement. Mental health and wellness checks and community engagement to reduce crime should be reallocated to professionals in our city who are already doing that work. A major concern is that police are offering too many services and many of these services are overlapping. In terms of systemic racism, it is an issue facing multiple sectors within our city, including but not limited to Hamilton Police Services, and we as a city need to commit to fixing and eliminating it. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. Um, and that wraps up our video presentations today. I just want to take a moment to thank all the 40 presenters. We had 38 video presenters, and two of them were done by WebEx. And I know a lot of work has been done in that. It shows clearly um, some people just aren't uh, videotape people, but you really did a great job. Thank you so much. So now we're finished with our video presenta presentations, and we are going to move on to now 9.11. So I'm going to get Councillor Farr, and I'm seconding it by uh, Mayor Eisenberger, to put the item 9.11 on the floor. This is an information report, folks, to be received. We will be going in camera uh, for legal advice uh, and an update, so please keep your legal questions um, for our in-camera session. Uh, I believe that Paul Johnson is available for any questions, and I don't know if anybody... I saw Mayor Eisenberger's hand up, and I saw uh, Councillor Farr's hand up earlier sorry so I'm gonna I'm going to okay so let's do this I got Councillor Nan and I got Councillor Nan Councillor Danko I got Wilson did I ever get Wilson no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I think that's it for now just a okay bit. sorry a question through the chair uh mm -hmm. did we need to receive those delegations <gasps> way to go yes you're absolutely right. I was more was more concerned about thanking them than doing the process. Sorry. So it is moved by uh, Councillor Clark and seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek that we receive all the presentations that were done today. And thank you again, everyone, for your patience in our technical problems. We think we have it sorted out for the next time. We promise. And we need an electronic vote on that, please. <laughs> Madam Chair? Yes, sir. We should also indicate to the delegates that this item is coming back on the 23rd. 
mm-hmm. but when the police chief is coming. And so right. there'll, there'll be discussions at that point and we'll likely be referring to some of the delegations that we received today. So, okay, we're not, I, we're not, so we're not ignoring them is my point. This issue is still gonna come back up. I agree. Why don't you say that? I think I just I'm did. Kidding. I'm teasing. Yep. No, absolutely. Thank you for that, pointing that out. So to all the presenters and to anyone else who is interested in listening at home, this item is coming back on September 23rd with 9.1 to 9.5, which is all this, the police reports, along with uh, the Chief Gert, who is also joining us. And we can refer all that discussion to those reports. Thank you, Councillor Clark. And I'm still waiting for Councillor Ferguson and Councillor Marula's vote, please. Yeah, mine didn't come up either. Okay, so thumbs up, everybody. Receive. So we're going to have thumbs up from everybody, please, Stephanie. Okay, thank you. And now we're back on to 9.11. Councillor Farr, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeet. The item is on the table. So far, I have Mayor Eisenberger, Councillor Farr, Councillor Nan, Councillor Danko, Councillor Wilson. So we'll start off with Councillor Eisenberger, please. Or sorry, oh. Mayor Farr. Farr. <laughs> Okay, get it together. I know. I get Mayor Farr, Councilor Eisenberger. Okay, it's Dr. All good Eisenberger. Me. Thank you, yeah. Doctor. Yeah, call me Doctor. Doctor. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm. Just going to talk peripherally about a meeting I had with the uh, Premier uh, this uh, past week. Uh, a very positive meeting. It uh, touched on uh, long-term care, higher order transit, and encampments. Uh, it's something I raised with him, and uh, something that we put uh, before him in terms of some funding opportunity that the government uh, might be willing to step into. Uh, as uh, they informed us the night before that they wanted to uh, get some thoughts on, you know, uh, announceables in the city of Hamilton. So uh, Paul Johnson had put together a, a, a bit of a proposal that we put before the Premier. I'd like Paul to kind of just give it that overview as to what we put before him in terms of how the uh, provincial government could uh, provide some funding that would help the most marginalized in our community. And certainly that, that would be the folks that are in encampments now. And second to that, I, I did raise this issue with the greater Toronto Hamilton area mayors um, to you know let them know, and they're all having encampment issues at some varying levels, but none of them uh, have an injunction. And it certainly, it certainly was news to them that uh, this was happening in Hamilton and certainly sought out their support because, uh, you know, our injunction here could be their injunction there tomorrow. And so uh, clearly they're, uh, they're now aware and certainly some dialogue will happen relative to, to that issue with the Greater Toronto or Hamilton area mayors. Uh, but Paul, to, to you, uh, we put uh, a proposal before the Premier. Uh, and maybe you could just give us a, a snapshot. And this was this was an off the cuff, uh, you know, opportunity. We were informed the night before that uh, the premier wanted to hear something about where where he could help almost immediately, and uh, certainly the encampment issue was uh, top of mind. And and so Paul uh, and his team put put a little something together they thought would be uh, something that could be doable. So Paul, did you want to kind of go over that for us? Yeah, through the, through the chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And and uh, the timing of your meeting couldn't have been better because as I reported to, uh, to council a couple of months ago, uh, I had asked that our Hamilton health team, which is uh, your call is the approved Ontario health team for this, for this area. And as Ontario health teams are meant to look at an integrated approach to health, uh, social services, and the overall uh, wellness and well-being of, of the community. And I had asked our mental health and addictions table through the Hamilton health team uh, to look at the issue of the encampments and in particular that population which we've talked about uh, often which is uh, difficult to serve in our shelter system and at times uh, we are unable to serve in our shelter system or hotels who require a level of support that is beyond what a municipality would typically be delivering and I had that table wrestle a bit with what they might be able to do in short order and and um, they are looking at some ways that they can reallocate some of their time and energies to help out on on the ground but uh, more particularly, they focused in on the opportunities that may be there very quickly with some expansion of some, uh, you know, very well-founded, very successful local programs that deal exactly with some of the issues of that uh, core group of people. 
And what it was is a two-pronged approach. One is to expand and enhance the capacity of a program that is called the HOMES program. It is uh, housing with on-site mobile and engagement services. It's a uh, target population is those with serious and persistent mental health issues and also uh, often a concurrent addiction issue with that. Uh, it has operated in this community for uh, at least a couple of decades and actually came about as a result of this community saying rather than having a piecemeal approach to supportive housing and mental health, we would actually do it as a, a single entity. The expansion of that program could happen very quickly. Uh, the cost of that would be about $900,000 and it would allow uh, another 20 people to be part of that program. It is very successful and it is a program that we often look to when we're engaging with people who are sleeping rough and we are often waiting and waiting and waiting. The second component of it is another program that I'm sure many here have, are familiar with because uh, it happens in communities across this country and they're assertive uh, community treatment teams. And again, this is a wraparound multidisciplinary approach to help people with housing stability and help them to deal with uh, addictions, mental health issues. And uh, St. Joseph's uh, Healthcare here in Hamilton has been a leader in this area for many years. And again, with more resources, they would be able to expand it. It isn't about setting up new services. It isn't about setting up new overhead and administration. It is about actually helping more people. These are all programs funded currently by the Ministry of Health. Uh, and again, that uh, to me made them very attractive because oftentimes the due diligence of a new agency coming on board to receive transfer payment from the province of Ontario is difficult. Those two programs, uh, if uh, funded, would, uh, would, would allow us to take on at least 40 people, like we think it more, maybe more like 70 people, and provide them with the opportunity for that wraparound support. The other interesting piece is we do have a number of housing units that are affordable in this community that would be available to help people get directly into housing. The challenge is without the supports, uh, we cannot just put people in the housing today because without the supports, uh, we have a strong uh, sense that the housing and the tenancy would be uh, unsuccessful. And so we have a, an opportunity uh, right now in our community if uh, we can receive some additional health dollars to help fund the support the supports, the, the human service side of it, and match it up with some existing capital. And so that was the uh, proposal that, uh, you know, just happened to be right ready. It uh, sometimes timing works out that way. And um, that's come from a number of, of uh, mental health and addictions providing organizations that sit at what we call our mental health and addiction secretariat in the Hamilton Health Team. It includes organizations like uh, uh, CMHA. It includes uh, Good Shepherd Centers. It includes our hospital systems. It includes um, folks like Wayside and Wesley Urban Ministries. So folks that have experience and understanding and the kinds of things that work and so while there are lots of other th ideas people have, those are two things that could immediately be impactful for some of those with a higher level of acuity. And the last uh, piece I'll say to wrap this together is I, I did ask our folks to give me an example of a higher acuity person that's, that's on the street, somebody that's real, not in terms of generalization, but somebody who's actually in our system today. And wouldn't you know it that uh, this person's been engaged a number of times. They actually thought they could get them into the Holmes program. Unfortunately, the person had a period of of incarceration. Uh, when they came out of incarceration, uh, that homes place had, had obviously been taken by somebody else. They're now waiting for a homes placement. Um, their time in shelter has been uh, unsuccessful due to behavioral issues and, and addictions issues. And so it just wrapped it up for me that these are the kinds of connections we could be making uh, very quickly for a part of the population that sometimes calls the streets uh, their home. Thank you, thank you, Paul. And uh, so, so we had the opportunity to put uh, a proposal before the premier. I think the the number refresh my memory, uh, Paul. If you could, one point two million dollars, I think, is what. Uh, one point nine. Through one point nine million was the ask that would uh, fund uh, that portion of the existing programs, expand them so that we could actually accommodate more people in the system as as a whole. So we were able to put that in front of the premier. Didn't get an answer. Obviously, we were going to follow up. And uh, hopefully uh, we can we can encourage them to provide that kind of funding that uh, would have some immediate impact on the encampment issues for sure. That's that's over and above the the whole injunction issue. Uh, this is really actually helping uh, people with more resources, which is exactly you know ultimately what what's going to need to happen to uh, to to be able to accommodate all these folks. Uh, beyond that, a great meeting with the premier. Uh, a, a good promise to uh, continue to work together. Uh, in harmony on some of the, uh, the very important things that uh, that the city has been advocating for and his commitment was uh, he wants to help Hamilton. So 
I'm going to take him up on that and uh, promise to work uh, collectively together to uh, to do that, whether it's on the higher order transit side or whether it's on the, uh, the encampments or uh, long term care. And I think, uh, you know, their commitment on long term care uh, has uh, is really huge. And uh, they're looking for, uh, you know, land or existing opportunities where new long term care facilities could be built uh, sooner rather than later. And so any city property or anything that uh, that uh, we might have that we may, may make available could certainly are enhance our ability to uh, increase our long term care capacity in our city. Thank you for that. And thank you, Paul, for uh, providing that update. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you did go away a little bit over. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, it was very important that we get that update, though. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Farr. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that update, uh, Madam Chair, from the mayor, and I look forward to a response from the province hopefully soon. Uh, just on this report, I would like to focus on the um, the group work that's been referenced in this report. Um, this is a, a group of outside outreach workers meeting weekly, it appears, with our staff and other agencies related to housing and homelessness. And uh, I first want to make it clear that I really do appreciate and I hope everyone else does, um, everyone who is working in outreach and who's working collaboratively on this encampment issue um, since the pandemic. And this is an update from yesterday I received from one of our staff, 177 interactions. And of that approximately 128 homeless and encamped individuals accessing shelter, thanks to those interactions. Uh, hotels, thanks to those interactions, and eight housed directly from encampments with more coming in the next few weeks and maybe even more if we get a call back from uh, Premier Ford, and I hope we do. The report says, quote, groups work concurrently to facilitate increased connection to community agencies to provide direct housing support, emergency response, and social and mental health services to all those experiencing unsheltered homelessness, end quote. So the goal uh, of the ongoing group work is to ensure active encampment sites are known in a timely manner, uh, allowing person-centered stuff, housing plans. It provides an opportunity to identify gaps in response efforts and assess risk levels of the encampment to determine steps that may need to be taken based on our bylaws. First question through you, how many bylaws are we referring to? And are we including planning, planning policy that isn't law, but it isn't policy as well? Through the chair, I'm going to ask David Buckle, who's on the call. Uh, David, of course, is a supervisor within our housing services division and has been uh, uh, closest to the ground coordinating some of this work. So today, a uh, combination of, of Edward, Grace, and uh, David and myself will be answering questions. And um, uh, I think David's been doing a lot of work collating some of this information. So I'll throw it to David Buckle first. Uh, thanks, Paul. So through the chair, I can provide the following update on encampment. So we have 15 known active sites throughout the city. Oh, sorry. Uh, sure. Sorry, Dave. Yeah. Through you, Chair, the question was, I'm not even looking for the names of the bylaws, just how many bylaws are we referring to in the report? And are we contemplating planning policy that actually doesn't exist? There is no planning policy that um, associates tents or encampments anywhere in our city unless it's a, a campsite as I understand it. So I'm only looking for the number of bylaws in this question that we're referring to in this report. Thanks, David. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, is Dave able to answer that or is it Mr. Johnson will have to take that back? So the exact number through the chair, uh, you know, maybe we'll have to sort that out. I'm not sure, Edward, whether we have a, a discussion about exact bylaws, but uh, there is an understanding it's more than just one bylaw that uh, is there. We don't talk about planning issues, uh, I would suggest, at these meetings either. But, uh, Edward, is there a number of bylaws that uh, we've shared with the group? Uh, through the chair to the council, we can report back in terms of the number of bylaws. Obviously, we're looking at a number of issues from fire and, and health, as well as uh, municipal law enforcement in terms of uh, littering and other matters. So there's a number of aspects that we're looking at in and above just the uh, no overnight camping. Um, so certainly we can report back in terms of what oversight we have. Those discussions are at our working group. So we do have municipal law enforcement there. You know, we have uh, a kind of a, a role of, of things to look out for within the encampments that speak to some of those bylaws that Certainly from a health and safety perspective, we, we want to make sure we're on top of, you know, open air fires, those types of things. Thank and you, Edward. As a former planner, now housing director, Ed, uh, can you confirm that we don't have any planning policy that permits encampments? You know, there's no secondary plan out there anywhere in our city that says there's certain areas in our city where, where this can occur. Edward. 
uh, chair, through the chair to the councillor, uh, you're correct. We uh, we have zoning regulations which apply only for those campgrounds and areas designated for uh, overnight uh, recreation and other purposes. Councillor. Okay, the report, and again, focusing on just this group work that's referenced, it's kind of later in the report. Now, um, the intent, it says, is not to identify encampments in order to dismantle, but rather to provide an opportunity to engage with clients and provide linkages to supports. And again, you know, 177, approximately 128 uh, successfully navigated to safer and more humane conditions, shelters, hotels, eight housed, more to come. Can we confirm through you that our task force efforts have always included and will continue to include these options to safer and more humane living conditions than sleeping rough? This may be repetitive for you, Mr. Johnson, but I think the public needs to hear it again. So through the chair, uh, absolutely. That is our, our goal and uh, has been our goal for a number of years as we've dealt with encampments over the years and, and continues to be that at this stage. Uh, we are learning though different ways. We've never seen a volume of this, uh, so we are trying new ways, but at the core of it, uh, what you suggested uh, will remain. And Councillor? The, chair, the group meets weekly, my understanding. The, I asked for some um, um, uh, meeting minutes the other day. Um, I, I understand there's not extensive minutes um, no robust minutes anyway, and that's fair. You guys, these uh, community outreach meetings all the time. And in fact, staff have meetings with all sorts of partners on all sorts of fields all the time. And we don't do robust meetings and minutes. I, I meet regularly all the time and don't have robust meetings. Given the extensive nature of the growth of the encampments, particularly since the court injunction, it's, it's, and the acute issues that have followed, can we begin to take minutes uh, going forward that maybe can be referenced and referred to with these group meetings through you? So through the chair, uh, just to go back, these these group meetings really became this weekly check-in uh, once uh, we got into the crisis of, of coronavirus and uh, it's taken a number of different, um, you know, not iterations, it's been the same group, but the discussions have moved along as the pandemic has moved along. I would suggest to you that uh, the structure of how these conversations occur, their frequency and what the purpose of them are is something that we're, we're looking at. And as we know uh, what the situation is going to be moving forward, uh, these, these meetings would, would change in, in, in focus for sure. And uh, we can look at the structural pieces. So that's something we're doing. I would say we're a number of weeks away from that uh, because we need to know a little bit more of what we're dealing with. Is it a short-term piece in, in this injunction uh, scenario? Is it uh, what the longer term looks like and exactly what the purpose of those conversations would be? Uh, but yeah, you know, documentation of decisions as we move forward, well, because we're no longer in that crisis of day-to-day, -day, minute to minute decisions uh, is something we can certainly take away and look at. Okay. Thank and you, Councillor Farr. Yeah, I'll let others have, I'll let others have uh, yeah, I actually gave you a couple of extra minutes yeah. at the beginning because of the screw up. So can I put you down for a second time speaker then, please, sir? Absolutely. I'm going to look at uh, when I return and I will return. Um, <laughs> yeah. we don't look to dismantle, but yet the report also talks about how we do dismantle. So I'll try to get some clarity on, on those two potential contradictions. Thank you for the time. Okay, thank you. And I have Councillor Danko, Councillor Wilson, Councillor Clark, and Councillor Nan so far. So, Councillor Danko, please. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, I have a couple questions from the report on the Encampment Homelessness Task Force and the Social Navigator Program. Um, so, to get started, uh, I guess I just recognize that there's always been encampments in Ward 8 and uh, in throughout the city. Um, historically, they've just been tucked into out of the way corners of parks or under bridges or on the escarpment. And uh, they've kind of been out of sight and out of mind. And uh, since the injunction's been in place, uh, we've noticed our first encampment out in the open in Ward 8 in Southam Park. And, uh, you know, obviously that's raised uh, some concerns with, uh, with residents. And I expect that there's just going to continue to be um, more uh, people sleeping rough in tents uh, in public, um, on public property uh, throughout the city. So um, while this injunction is placed, um, um, I just I just see that continuing to, to escalate citywide. So my question um, 
Maybe I'll just ask a couple questions first on the, on the injunction, just to make sure that I'm clear and the public's clear about some of the timelines involved. So this came into place, I believe it was July 30th, and uh, this council has passed a resolution to challenge the injunction in court. Is there a timeline that staff can share with us publicly for when we expect that to be heard and uh, and and what the next steps are? Thank you. And I believe, um, Nicole, you're on, but I believe you have somebody that's going to be speaking to this. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So if you'll give me just a moment, I'll, sure. I can pull up those dates. But I mean, if you want to come back to me in a couple of seconds, I'll see if uh, if I have those available. Councillor Danko? Yeah, I can just follow up maybe with uh, um, General Manager Johnson in the interim. Mm -hmm. So. Again, just to clarify for the public, while this injunction is in place, the city is restricted from forcibly removing tents on public property. So when residents call and say there's a tent in the park by my, my house, what can we do and what can we not do under the terms of the injunction? Uh, so through the chair, uh, they cannot be removed under our bylaw. Uh, that's what the injunction uh, stops us from doing. What uh, the communication about where they are, and because as you noted, they are growing and, and we're every day updating. You'll note that our report is out of date by what uh, David Buckle uh, talked about at the beginning of his comments. Uh, what we do is we send people out and we do engage. So the engagement is of course voluntary. There is no um, uh, hammer, so to speak, at the end of it to say that, uh, well, if you don't engage, if you don't move to a shelter, if you don't engage with our outreach approaches, then you will be asked to move on. Uh, that piece doesn't exist in the conversation, but the actions of, uh, you know, talking about shelter spaces, hotel spaces, housing opportunities, other supports that people may need, all of that work of, uh, of our outreach teams uh, continue. And so when the public does identify them for us, uh, they just need to recognize that we will make contact when we can, but that contact would be about um, uh, supporting the individuals, trying to connect them with services and voluntarily asking whether they'd like to move to a place of shelter or um, uh, other other uh, places in the community. Councillor? Thank you. In, in order to report these, is there a preferred way? Is there a direct contact that we can provide to the public? Should they go through councillor's office, what would be the best way? Uh, so through the chair, they, they can go through the 546 city uh, and log that and that will get to our team uh, internally. If they come through the uh, councillor's offices, we provided you with a direct staff link so that you're not uh, uh, deciding of who of the many people that come on these encampment uh, calls, uh, who to send it to. So you have that if it comes through your constituency office, but for the general public, if they're just out and about and they want to uh, uh, register and let people know uh, 546 city and, and our call center will uh, direct those again to, to those that can uh, then and reach out from an outreach perspective. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. And again, kind of on the on the timeline. So if uh, if we do notify your team that there is uh, an encampment notice, somebody sleeping rough, what's the timeline for when uh, we residents should expect there to be um, an outreach? And I know your team um, strives to do one to one to one outreach with uh, with these individuals. I imagine it's fairly time consuming and it's a growing issue. So just what, what are some of the timeframes and, and staffing um, commitments involved? Uh, David Buckle uh, through the chair. Uh, David, you may be able to answer how fast are we generally getting out uh, when new encampments are, uh, are, are uh, brought forward? I, I know sometimes it's within the day uh, or certainly the next day, but is that generally our, our timeframe? Generally 24 to 48 hours through the chair. We have uh, seven active uh, reach workers, plus we work in conjunction with Social Navigator program. Uh, our reach works six days a week, so typically we can be out there same day, if not the next day. So that's, that's so Councillor really Danko, um, I'm going to have to cut you off soon, so is this your last question? If I could just get a follow-up from uh, the city solicitor, that, that's all my questions. Okay, you had 40 seconds. Go ahead. <laughs> is uh, Nicole, are you online now? Yes, uh, through you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, so we are, uh, we've just received confirmation from the court today that we will be looking at a hearing in uh, mid-October uh, with various dates uh, back and forth, and that's the earliest available date that the court has for us. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, just answered the question when you said uh, through you um, chair 
to Mr. Johnson, seven. Is that seven active? So how many workers would be um, uh, available per day? And what hours of work do they work? So they work six days a week. Uh, they're, they're, um, I'm going to ask David to, to comment in terms of what their shift structure looks like. And not all seven, of course, are, are available at all times during the day. But uh, David, can you provide an update? Yeah, through the chair. So we typically, first of all, we, we have started uh, directing them to only engage uh, encampments in pairs because of some recent issues. Uh, Typically, they cover on weekdays between 8 in the morning, sometimes 7.30 in the morning till 8 at night, and on Saturdays, uh, typically between 8 and 4. Thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, or perhaps to Mr. Zagarek through you, Chair, um, how much have we spent on uh, the encampments or perhaps more accurately uh, homelessness since the pandemic. So through the chair, council approved uh, uh, investments in terms of our homeless system through COVID is is now up to close to $20 million. That does take us through to June 20, uh, June 30th, 2021. So those are the approvals that have been put in place. There would have been some um, resources expended in the very early stages. It wouldn't be captured in that number, but uh, that gives you a, a sense of the, the the quantum for answering the question at this point. You know, we're in the uh, we're in the we're going to be in the twenty million dollar range by the time next June rolls around. Thank you. Um, through the chair to Paul, of the individuals that we have engaged in um, in encampments, how many have we successfully housed in, in permanent housing? Uh, through the chair, I don't have that number to hand. Uh, either Edward or David may uh, have the, the number there. So through the chair, our last count was eight with housing with supports through intensive case management. Eight. And, through the, and through the chair, just to make sure that that, that that number is in context, that is from an encampment directly to permanent housing. There are several hundred people that through our shelter system and through other avenues who have been, to, um, um, who are homeless uh, by designation within our, our system who have also been housed. And those were reported to you in terms of some of the, uh, the work we've done with affordable housing benefit and things along those lines. So I just wanna make sure by context that many people who are homeless have been housed but in terms of direct from encampment to permanent housing, which is uh, which is quite a step, as, as you can imagine, um, that number is, uh, is as David suggested. Thank you. Um, when an encampment is cleared, what happens to um, the materials that belong to people living in the encampments? Where does it go? Uh, so through the chair, when there were uh, encampments where people were, were moved on, um, uh, Sir Johnny McDonald and, and some in Jackie Washington Park, I believe, uh, there was arrangement for some personal belongings to be uh, stored at the first Ontario site uh, because it had lots of space. So we did make some of those arrangements. I want to be clear that that wasn't sometimes for all of the things that had been accumulated. At times there were uh, sofas and chairs and things that were in these encampments. So it didn't include all of those materials, but for personal belongings, if people wanted, uh, those were, uh, there was an offer of, of some storage. Uh, many times, I mean, up, we, we, we don't go in and physically move people out of a tent and, and break down a tent or as some have suggested, you know, kind of push things along. Oftentimes by the time we're cleaning up the encampment, people are no longer there. And so that conversation happens in advance. And um, on occasion, we have had people who have said uh, they weren't interested in keeping things and then have said, oh, I, I wanted that back. And, and unfortunately, it had already been cleared, so I do know of a case of that uh, occurring. But generally speaking, if they have a number of personal items that they need stored, we were making arrangements for that through the First Ontario Centre. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What, Councillor, you have 20 seconds just to let ah. you know. Last question. My last question was, um, in your opening remarks of, of what you uh, gave to the Premier, um, you identified two agents. Have they been involved uh, working with the City to date on encampments? And homelessness? 
So through the chair, absolutely. Uh, the one is the Good Shepherd Centers, and uh, they have been at uh, at the uh, core of doing uh, work with us for years. Uh, St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton, of course, is a partner with uh, organizations like the uh, YWCA in their uh, delivery of Carol Ann's Place through Womankind. Uh, they have uh, they have a shelter. Uh, from addictions perspective, they do addictions work, and we are deeply connected in because St. Joe's is, of course, the uh, mental health and addictions um, um, focused healthcare delivery system within the city of Hamilton. So, yes, both organizations, uh, long-standing connections to the city in terms of helping us with uh, issues around homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Wilson, do you want to be put on for a second time? Um, I'm not sure. It depends on okay. the nature of the questions. Thanks. Let me know. Thank you. Councillor Clark, you're up next. Thank you, Chair uh, Johnson. I appreciate that. Um, uh, a quick preamble. Uh, I wasn't here for the last meeting uh, for the in-camera portion. I had a, a medical appointment. Um, but when I'm looking at injunctions, I see them as a bit of a blunt legal instrument. Um, that historically has created winners and losers. And your best case scenario when you're involved in an injunction is some form of alternate dispute resolution, which the courts have historically appreciated. Um, that statement that I just made, can I just get Nicole to comment on that? Is that her understanding that when we're dealing with injunctions, looking at alternate dispute resolution is uh, one of the better scenarios? Nicole, are you on? There you uh, through, go. Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. So I, th I think, Councillor, generally speaking, whether injunctions or otherwise, uh, looking at uh, settlement or other mediated uh, resolutions of things is always a, is almost always a good option. Uh, yeah. I don't know that that's any more particular in an injunction or not, but certainly um, because of the standard and the various uh, tasks around injunctions, uh, it certainly would lend itself to some of those discussions. But in the absence of any further analysis on that, I don't really have anything else to say. Thank you, Councillor. And, and, and I think the courts appreciate it because their court time is precious and they don't want to take up court time if they don't have to. So if alternate dispute resolution can be coordinated successfully, they appreciate those efforts. Um, so in light of the fact that our court date is not going to be until mid-October, has anyone talked to the applicants to find out, the applicants for the injunction to find out exactly what they want, what their goals are, um, and who from the city is talking to them right now to try to understand exactly what they're trying to, to accomplish? I think this is for Paul. I don't know. I got a big sigh there. <laughs> no, that was me. Uh, <laughs> through the chair, let the record show I was on mute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> although, the, although the fact my whole body went, and there you might, uh, you know, anyways, you can put your own sound but effects. That, that Clark is asking questions again. Son of a gun. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so I'll answer that in two ways, and I am going to ask Nicole to, to chime in at the second part. So throughout uh, our work since um, uh, late March and into early April, uh, we have been obviously communicating and and through the way a lot of demands have come forward from a variety of groups and um, at times we did have conversations and and at our emergency and community services committee you saw the tone of the of the um, the requests that were being made and and where we got ourselves into a conversation that was not going very far is that um, you know, most that one part of the conversation was that there be a moratorium on doing anything with any encampment that that they not be moved on at all and and the indication back from staff was that uh, you know we didn't have that discretion fully and because that was not a couple weeks it was throughout the entire course of a pandemic and then maybe beyond but we talk about that later so that so along the way, there's been a, a hope that um, services could be provided, uh, things like washrooms and, and other pieces, but that uh, the major component always was, and it was in those letters that we received um, uh, publicly at our committee and, and council meetings, is that uh, we would take no action whatsoever on, in, on encampments and um, 
uh, as I say at the time, uh, that was uh, contrary to the way we dealt with the encampments and, and also uh, not not possible for us to commit to in writing because uh, obviously the bylaw was in place. Um, since the time of the injunction, I'll let Nicole talk about um, uh, about the situation since we've uh, gone into the legal proceedings. Which has made it come more complicated. Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, so I, I'm facing with a bit of a challenge at the moment in terms of answering these questions in public uh, in the absence of further direction from Council. So, uh, Councillor Clark, I'm not sure that I can answer that at the moment, uh, but I'm certainly happy to do so following our in-camera discussion, if it's the will of Council. Okay, so I'll stick with Mr. Johnson then. <laughs> um, so can I ask a, a question? Um, the moratorium on encampments, have, did we suggest to these applicants to park that completely because you don't have the authority, staff don't have the authority to go down that road and look, let's look at other things that we can do to help these residents um, get out of sleeping in the rough and get into safe, affordable, clean, supportive housing. Uh, so through the chair, those conversations uh, were always part of our, our our dialogue. They recognized the need for a more uh, housing spaces and appropriate spaces for folks, and in particular, the right kinds of supports from a mental health and addictions perspective. And um, you know, I don't want to suggest that everybody that's in encampments has serious and persistent mental health and addictions issue, but for our conversation today, really that core group, which is where this all began, um, it is a predominant factor and feature of the acuity of those individuals. So I, I just want to be very clear. I'm not trying to stigmatize all individuals experiencing homelessness, but um, we are talking about a very small subset of an overall uh, number of people who are homeless. So we had those conversations. We did have conversations about what were we able to provide in terms of when there were couples or or people with pets and things like that along the way. And, and we dealt with some of those. And, and these are things I'm talking about occurring in April and May and into June. So uh, lots of those conversations about what we need as a system. Uh, we need more beds for women. We need more, um, you know, supportive housing environments. Uh, you know, absolutely agreement on that across. Uh, I don't know that I've come across anyone who doesn't agree with that. But the challenge became is that until we get all of that, um, you know, and that's where the suggestion was that uh, to have that conversation with staff alone uh, was not possible uh, because it wasn't going to get us anywhere. And our suggestion was that needed to be um, S elevated in a conversation with council. And they did so by providing those written documents allegations in uh, whichever month that was, June or July. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I appreciate that, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the time. I'm, I'm a little bit apprehensive about not having discussions with these folks, because I think at some point the judge is going to ask us, did you have discussions with these folks? Um, and leaving it to the decision of the judge on the injunction and on tent encampments, we might get a decision that we don't like. Um, so it is better to try to come up with some form of alternate dispute resolution uh, with the applicants than leave all of the authority with the judge who in the end could rule against the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I didn't have to warn you, to, your time was up. Thank you. Um, Councillor Nan, last first time speaker, and then we're going to second time speakers, Councillor Farr and Councillor Wilson. Go ahead, Councillor Nan. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, just on those last points by the previous speaker, I would uh, echo uh, strong agreement in terms of engaging in alternative dispute resolution on this matter. I think that it's been really clear as those wards that have been dealing with encampments for a long time, um, that encampment issue isn't new, that uh, in many ways encampments have been a part of the city of Hamilton since it was first in, um, created, uh, since its inception. That said, um, I did want to point uh, a couple of questions to the new information that we heard as a council today that wasn't in the report, but that speaks off of uh, the comments that the mayor had shared as well as General Manager Johnson in terms of the pretty exciting, in my view, uh, conversation about what I would view as a made in Hamilton approach to dealing with some of the uh, the high acuity issues and the kind of integration of strategy between this isn't just going to be solved with permanent housing. It's not going to be solved with just affordable housing. In some situations, it has to be solved with uh, urgent, quick turnaround units that are coupled with the type of support that the individuals who are in that high acuity population 
uh, are, require in terms of moving them along on their health journey. And that some of those individuals are in the encampments that are currently in question and the encampments that we're seeing growing from 11 locations that were listed in the report to 15 locations and active sites that um, that um, David Buckle had mentioned in his comments. So I have a couple questions on the information via the mayor and general manager Johnson. How many uh, affordable units could possibly be brought online if we were to receive those additional funds from the province in terms of funding the support health based services? Uh, so through the chair, we believe there's an opportunity for an immediate 18 units to be there. And we actually believe that we'd be able to look at um, uh, an additional number of units uh, working with these programs. I mean, these are programs that also over the years have sourced units repeatedly and have good working relationships with a variety of um, of private and not-for-profit settings for, uh, for that. But uh, in terms of your question about how fast can we get out of the gate, uh, we mm -hmm. believe there's a more immediate situation, there's a more immediate opportunity for us to look at at least 18 and contingent on those increased funds from the province uh, that I heard really clearly in the pitch. Um, and also on that then, uh, I've heard from residents concerned and also engaging with some of the residents who have pitched their tents um, in Ward 3 most recently. One of a situation where uh, it's a couple, a pregnant woman and her partner, and, um, you know, they are a couple, so they can't access the current shelter system. She's pregnant. Um, and in that kind of scenario, what does it take from our city system to support individuals in that scenario? They're homeless. Uh, they're not causing any disruption as a couple. Um, they are trying to make ends meet and find a way to be together as a couple and, and uh, give birth to and raise their child. So given our motto, just curious about how we support this, this, this couple in terms of a service pathway. So through the chair, I'll begin, and I'm actually going to ask David, uh, I think you've run into some of these uh, scenarios uh, as well along the way, but one of the things we have done, and, and in particular why we procured a number of uh, permanent hotel spaces, is we recognize that sometimes the challenges that we have within our existing shelter system, um, we needed some flexibility so that we could quickly allow people to access um, uh, opportunities for shelter that, that and, you know, Someday we'll solve the larger issues of, of, of the other pieces, but what are we going to do today while we're in the midst of a crisis? And very much mm -hmm. hotels have become that option where we do have, uh, uh, have opportunities for couples to be together within that environment because, of course, um, it's a self-contained uh, unit, so there's not issues with... Uh, uh, men and women and women not uh, particularly wanting a man in a situation because it's been a women's shelter for all these years and all those types of things. So those are some of the ways that we can work in the immediacy. But in terms of getting people into a much more stable environment, if, if the situation is similar to what uh, you've suggested, uh, David, uh, what are some of the other fast track ways we've done in terms of uh, housing? So we've actually, through the chair, we've actually opened up uh, a single men's hotel actually also takes couples. However, for the pregnant uh, females, of which there's at least three or four that we're aware of, uh, we're looking at opening up uh, city housing Hamilton townhouses for mm -hmm. their availability to be able to move in uh, in a safe and secure manner and also receive supports. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that we're looking at creative solutions and looking at the vacancies that are within the city system and looking at City Housing Hamilton uh, vacant townhouses as a potential fit. So that's, that's good to hear. I appreciate the nimbleness and the creativity um, of, of our service partners in making that happen in terms of City Housing Hamilton. Um, Councillor Nand, you have, excuse me for interrupting. You have 30 seconds. You can either do one question or be put on to the second time speakers. Hot quick second, hopefully sure, in the 30 ahead. seconds and then you can add me on. I've the 15 sites, can you give us a proximity of where they are located across the city? Are they uh, all concentrated in the downtown core? Do we have a sense of uh, which wards are impacted by the 15 encampments currently? Uh, through the chair, I can by ward. So ward two is the most active with six different sites. Uh, ward uh, one has three sites. Wards 3 and 13 have two sites each, the largest in Ward 3 being Gage Park. Uh, wards 5, 8, and 15 have one site each. Wards 5, 8, and? And 15, sorry. 
Thank you. You can add me back to the list. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, uh, Councillor Farr? Yeah, I uh, just heard the last two speakers support a, a tactic of a negotiation on this issue uh, with the appellants, and I wasn't uh, clear if I heard them say that they that would be ward specific to their wards, and I'd love for them if they're going to speak to this issue uh, publicly to whether whether I'd love for them to identify uh, that particular aspect, especially since a public works uh, worker was uh, allegedly assaulted. He was assaulted, and a CHCH reporter accosted in recent weeks. Um, um, it, it's clear the public is starting to really engage on this issue. So you may want to uh, be a little more forthcoming uh, given uh, the situation. I'm certainly uh, engrossed in right now. So appreciate that if you're gonna bring that up publicly. So I said earlier that I would be trying to figure out what this report is uh, concluding with uh, what it says. And the group, again, back to the group aspect of this report, the group's intent is not to identify encampments in order to dismantle, but rather to provide an opportunity to engage with clients and provide linkages to supports. And I've already said twice now how successful we are at that. But this report also says, should a site be determined as a high risk, and cannot remain, a date for dismantling is determined. So our question is, what are the criteria for high risk? So uh, through the chair, and, and it's important to recognize that this both gives you the historical context of what we've been doing. Clearly in the injunction period, none of that applies. Even if they're high risk, there's nothing we can do to, um, to do that unless there was something we deemed uh, potentially that we could go back to the court on or something like that. So. We're giving you a sense of what we do in normal times and then recognizing in the injunction period, things have changed a little bit. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, there's the big factor is size. Uh, I'll tell you over the years, and, and of course this dates for me back to, to graduating out of university, um, size matters in terms of encampments and, and um, there's a lot more time that you can put in and actually a lot more success that generally occurs if they're in small in size. Uh, the larger these encampments become and it's very much what happened as, the, as a period of time led up to the injunction. If you go back to March and April, you know, the, the Sir John A site was a different site because it was a, a publicly, it's not a city property, it was a, a school board property and there were some danger issues in terms of their proximity to a building that had some bricks that were falling. But if you look at our approach, it was a very slow, there were small encampments trying to deal with them when they come. Um, what we have found over the years of doing this work is that putting a timeline on does something for everybody, and that is that it focuses people on solutions as next steps. As you can see today, we're not having a ton of success moving people into shelters. Uh, last night alone, there were 96 beds available in our shelter and hotel system and five rooms available at our family shelter. So uh, we're not having a lot of success in moving people to shelters, and sometimes that is a result of uh, the fact that um, there, there is no deadline that's set in in that case. So I, I think to the point, Councillor, it's it's not a hard and set fast set of rules, but I will tell you that size is a definite determining factor and when things start to move in the past towards uh, having to look at some, some dates being set and some deadlines being set. Okay, um, I appreciate the distinction that, that, that there's pre and post COVID and I, um, I'll just leave it at this final question. So keeping six, this group, Cam Smart, who's working with them, um, they're they're asking for tents. They're also saying publicly they don't they don't they don't want to support encampments. I guess they're saying, uh, but they're they're taking tents and they're they had a hundred tent uh, uh, donation uh, request on their website. I think they pretty much got there by now. But this report states that uh, they're part of this weekly group again with the group stuff. They're also among the current appellants to the city who, uh, through the assistance from uh, the lawyer from our downtown law firm, Ross and McBride, received injunctions from Judge Periapsky to, to prevent enforcement of our bylaws, the many bylaws. And since we've seen rapid growth of encampments, 
and an increase in the acute issues associated to these encampments. Nobody can argue that. Uh, and you're stating in the report, the city is coordinating efforts with them to allow for safer collection of garbage and waste, leveraging their trusted relations with individuals and encampments to avoid or diffuse incidents while city staff perform their role. Uh, through you to whomever, how would you say safer collection of waste is going, especially of late and whose role is it? So uh, through the chair, uh, I'll maybe ask uh, Grace or, or Edward to to talk a little bit about our approach on on waste, and um, and then I'll I'll maybe follow up with in terms of some of the who is responsible on that. Thanks. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, through the chair, um, at the present time, we've made arrangements to we. Previous to the incident um, where the assault occurred, we've been trying to keep the um, locations as clean as possible for the sake of not only the people in the camps, but for also the neighborhoods, for the businesses downtown and for the residents um, in the area. Um, since that time though, um, in deference to our, the security for our staff, we've decreased it to twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays. And um, we are have requested for some police to be present at the two main locations when those garbage um, uh, times occur. So it's 10 o'clock on Tuesdays and Fridays at uh, Ferguson and then at First Ontario. Thank you, Councillor Farr, you're at 30 seconds, please. So you want to be going on to an, another list? Uh, I can conclude here and just hopefully for those again who want to negotiate, keep that in mind. Our professional staff are saying look out uh, uh, for when garbage collection is happening, probably when other staff are working, we need security, we need police present. Um, unfortunately, because of the acute issues and uh, while you're negotiating, you may want to uh, consider that. And hopefully again, you can publicly uh, proclaim that if you wanna negotiate, do you wanna do it uh, with the inclusion of your wards? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And can I just warn everyone or at least caution everyone that negotiations are usually done in cameras. So I just wanted I didn't to bring put it out up. there. No, I didn't I didn't bring Understand that. I'm just I'm just trying to nip this now. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, second time speaker. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Chair Johnson. Thank you. Um uh, Mr. Johnson uh explained for people who are listening from the public um how our encampment teams work. And I think he identified public health officials who are on that team. Is that correct, Mr. Johnson? Through you? Uh, so through the chair, our outreach team is actually uh, situated within our uh, public health unit. It's uh, the mental health uh, street outreach program. So it is a, it's a collaborative effort, but it actually sits in our public health unit. So yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Th thank you. Um, since, since COVID, has our chief medical officer of health offered us an opinion on um, an approach to encampment? Paul? So through the chair, I'll begin. I know uh, Dr. Tran is still on the call and he can offer uh, some other uh, comments in terms of operationally. Uh, obviously, Elizabeth and I have, have uh, chatted about it and, um, and, and there is support for the operational element of it. If she had concerns about the way outreach was occurring or the way that uh, we were engaging people in the encampment, um, she would have raised that with me. So no concerns from that perspective. And I'll let uh, Nin answer uh, some of the broader questions around uh, public health response around encampments. Thank you through uh, Madam Chair. I'm trying to um, first, I guess, understand the question. I mean, from uh, if you're with the Chief Medical Officer of Health in Ontario and in sort of uh, guidance provincially on terms of uh, encampments, uh, the short answer is no. Uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any public statement or communication or guidance documents in terms of encampments. Um, and I don't have anything too much in addition to add to what uh, Paul has said in terms of uh, our involvement. I, we have a number of, uh, of staff and services within public health services that relate uh, to servicing, uh, uh, you know, populations uh, such as this through our harm reduction uh, program, street health clinic, uh, as well as outreach work in terms of a mental health and street program. No, thank you, Dr. Tran. Uh, the reason I was asking is uh, I was been doing a little research on 
how other jurisdictions are approaching encampments. As I think someone said in their opening remarks, um, it's not unique to Hamilton. It's certainly not unique to Ontario. And in British Columbia, as you know, um, Dr. Henry uh, issued a, a letter to mayors and um, regional representatives and CAOs uh, stating that during the time of COVID, to protect, to keep an eye um, and to account for people in encampments um, and to prevent uh, the risk of community spread, her advice was that we should leave encampments where they are while the provincial emergency is active. Um, so I understand and I read, um, and I think you've just confirmed that the uh, Dr. Is it Williams, uh, the Ontario Chief Medical Officer has not issued um, any statement, but I guess my question is, uh, have, have you advised um, our city manager um, on a public health opinion on whether encampments during COVID should remain or move? So uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, we have not uh, uh, advise one way or the other. I think what uh, Paul has mentioned, there's been an ongoing discussion uh, between him and Dr. Richardson. I mean, we certainly provide, um, you know, some additional context in terms of some of the public health or health issues um, that would uh, need to, uh, that are under considerations uh, in this population and in Camden. So I do want to, to uh, and I think we, we always have to sort of step back uh, before, before we talk about just encampments, yes or no, um, or what the position encampments in terms of looking at the underlying, you know, health and safety issues of our uh, citizens. And particularly uh, that's, that the partic most relevant, I suppose, are the ones that are, are more focused on housing. Um, so that includes in terms of things like uh, safe food, safe water, um, in terms of both consumption as well as uh, use of terms of waste, um, the elements in terms of um, of uh, uh, safety from like the elements from heat uh, and cold, as well as physical safety, uh, violence, as well as infection and control. And I know that, um, and and certainly and there's there's always complex issues. Uh, we're talking about. Heat. In this situation, in terms of mental health and addictions, I do know that um, you know Paul and his group have taken uh, you know that uh, you know those discussions like to heart, and, and a lot of that has been uh, uh, rolled out in terms of uh, the other options that we have um, provided in terms of in terms of how we approach uh, shelters and hotels, in terms of doing uh, incorporating as many of those principles. Uh, as we can, and, uh, and you know, including physical distancing. So I do think it, it's it's not a, uh, a straightforward answer that you probably are open for, but we haven't provided that uh, that type of uh, guidance. And I think that's one of those. I think that you, as city council, will you know, we can provide you know some of the, the context or information um, and to help you make uh, that uh, decision. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wilson, you're at your five minutes. Would you like to go on for the third time? Yes, please. Okay. And Councillor Nan, second time. Thank you. Through the Deputy Mayor to uh, staff, just a couple of questions as it relates to, I just really want to drill down on the health component of encampments and the types of issues that we are contending with serving um, in that population and particularly as it relates to addiction services. Um, referencing and acknowledging that we need additional funding to provide those those services. But currently, what does our overdose prevention support look like on these 15 encampment locations that we currently have? What does overdose prevention support look like for the encampments currently in place in the city? So through the chair, I'm not sure, David, whether you want to start that and uh... In terms of some of the services that are there, yeah, one of the through the chair, one of the um, many supports that are offered by our community partners and also keeping six ham smart is a wide distribution of uh, naloxone kits, uh, and certainly the larger sites, first Ontario Centre and uh, Ferguson would have access to on-site 
health clinics as well. And through the chair, there also in this community, of course, is a safe injection site uh, now called Consumption and Treatment Services site. So there is a location for that. Um, uh, and uh, the other piece is the van needle exchange program continues to operate uh, uh, in this community. It's back or back up and operating. I'm not sure Nin whether it ever stopped, but it certainly is uh, providing some some services. So uh, uh, you know. Again, addictions and street level addiction, as you know, not new to the city and we continue to recognize that these are hot spots, and so that um, services are deployed to where uh, issues are most acute and that that uh, includes the encampments, but uh, overdoses are an issue and uh, continue to be a health issue um, uh, that has engaged our paramedic services and other community supports as well. Some of the concerns that uh, I thank you for the response. Some of the concerns that have been sh shared by residents in Ward Three have been from a safety perspective, which are reasonable concerns in terms of the increased number of needles that uh, are accompanying some of the locations. And from that perspective, um, any any thoughts from staff about the possibility of temporarily locating um, sharps container boxes that we already have in our pilot programs in different parks, for example example, in order to secure some of the safety concerns of residents who walk in our city parks or who are walking near the current encampment locations. So through the chair, we've certainly tried on a temporary basis to, um, you know, have uh, what I call more individual approaches so people can uh, have sharps containers. So we can look at some of those things. Uh, you know, we really need to see where this is moving in the next uh, few weeks to understand what resources the city may have to invest and whether there's a comfort to do that. But it, you know, there are lots of options that would be available if we uh, if we need to, but they will require resources. We don't have the staffing and we don't have the physical resources right now to ensure that uh, needles can be picked up every day, for instance, and those types of things. But we understand that from a community dynamic and almost all the encampments, uh, needle complaints are are coming forward to our staff. Yeah, I would imagine the comfort around the table would be there to support ensuring that our public who are using our city properties could feel more comfortable in, in those physical areas with the use of what have been really successful safe uh, uh, safe needle boxes in, in the pilot location. So um, I guess you answered the question that I had in terms of how we're currently resourcing our overdose preve uh, prevention in the encampment areas. Uh, and you, claimed, you stated really clearly, General Manager Johnson, that we'd need more resourcing in order to do that uh, in, a, in, in a more robust way if that was required. Um, are we seeing an increased number of overdoses since COVID-19? Through the Deputy Mayor to um, Dr. Trump. Sure, uh, so through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, um, if we look at the, the proxy numbers uh, based on paramedic calls. I mean, we have uh, been seeing, uh, from what I understand, uh, a higher rate this year, uh, particularly lately compared to last year. I mean, it does fluctuate. I mean, there are parts, uh, periods uh, after, you know, COVID-19 where the rates were, were low and then, so it has fluctuated, but, you know, it's starting to creep up uh, again. It is one of those things where we want to, um, I think there's multi factors, uh, impacting overdoses I mean, first and foremost is certainly mental health that's uh, impacting everyone uh, and particularly those who are who rely on a certain amount of social interactions and services um there is a, an issue to my understanding in terms of uh, uh, the drug supply and by closing the borders there's an un consequence um, and we've seen that a bit I guess a bit more nationally in some other jurisdictions and then the third uh, which I think you know we're, we're able to um you know, as as we're reopening services as well as some of our partners, is that the uh, reduction of access to things like uh, naloxone, um, where a number of sites, uh, community organizations aren't opening up. So that's where we try to work with other organizations to increase um, access and seeing whether they be supplying naloxone. So um, it is one of those areas that we. We focus on because we it's it was clearly an issue in a crisis before COVID and, and you know it's something that we're dealing with actively uh, uh, currently. Thank you Thank for the third answer, Dan. Would you like and to be on a third, um, sure. third list, please? Thank sure. you. Because here's the scoop, folks. We have first-time speaker, Councillor Collins, second-time speaker, Councillor Clark, and third-time speaker, Councillor Wilsons and Nan. So let's try and keep, I'll try and keep the pouncing ball here. So we're going to go to Councillor Collins as a first-time speaker, please. Thanks, Kim. And I got, 
Yeah, and I have Councillor Danko for a second time too. Thanks. I, I just have uh, one or two quick questions and uh, really mixed messages from the McMaster employees and the law firm from the start of this process who basically painted a picture that, you know, the shelter system here locally is broken and doesn't work. Um, there are individuals who can't be, who can't receive uh, the, the treatment and care that they need in the current shelter system and and they need priority status. And they were looking obviously for supportive housing, which uh, we do have in the community, but we may not have enough of, that's debatable. So I, I'm trying to understand um, if I could ask through you to anyone who'd like to answer, where are shelters in this in terms of the um, the role that they're playing from a public communication standpoint? Obviously they're the experts, they've been providing those that provide it today have been providing it for decades and um, they've been doing it quite well in terms of operators. And um, and, and so the, the picture that's been painted by those people who we are at legal odds with right now is that the shelter system is broken, is not servicing the needs of, of people in the community. And they gravitated very early away from, this is a pandemic, this is a, a, a COVID-19 issue, that's why they shouldn't be in the shelters. And they've gone right past that um, you know, now that things have kind of settled down, if you want to call it that, and, and this message is basically, well, the shelter system's broken. This is no longer COVID, it's no longer pandemic. It's just we have hard to house individuals who have needs, they need supportive housing. And because of that, the no camping bylaw shouldn't apply anywhere in the city of Hamilton. Um, and, and that's where we're at. So again, with that narrative, which I believe is accurate because I've read through some of the media articles from July into August and now into September, and I've watched closely their comments. Can I can I get an understanding in terms of where shelter partners are at with this? Uh, um, do they agree? Do they agree their the, the, their operations that they're providing are, are, are broken and, and, and they can't serve people in the community? Um, or do they still feel that those that are in need of shelter services um, have a bed or, or a, a welcome place in their facilities um, when needed, irrespective of the pandemic in place or not? Uh, so through the chair, um, uh, in, in more detail, uh, I'd be able to do that in closed session. Uh, I'll say at a, at a high level that, uh, no, they're very pleased with their shelter system and they do believe for many people it offers a good opportunity to, to move forward. And the evidence of that is, is a few things. Over the years, uh, they have worked uh, tirelessly with our housing services folks to create a better shelter system. We have shelter diversion programs that you have invested in. Uh, we have new approaches to shelters in this community. We built a family shelter. Uh, not long ago, we have uh, made investments in shelter activities along the way. So uh, they believe that they, they are appropriate places for, for many people in our community to take that next step towards the ultimate goal, of course, which is, which is permanent housing. Uh, what we all agree on, myself, our shelter providers, uh, our staff who do this work on the front lines, um, is that there is a core group of folks that shelters and hotels are just not uh, the appropriate place. They will not be successful in those environments, uh, but that is a, a small number and that is where we get into what are those alternatives. And again, this community has developed um, highly intensive uh, supportive housing environments, whether it's Indowell, Good Shepherd, a Canadian Mental Health Agency, uh, you know, all those sorts of folks are working at it and helping to make it happen. And then the second piece is we've done creative things like the special care unit, which looks specifically at um, a street level alcoholism and again, providing the right kind of housing with the right kind of medical support. So, uh, you know, yes, they, they believe the shelter system plays an important role and can be a, a strong stepping stone. And there's lots of evidence to support it. And then through COVID, they have done everything in their power uh, to make their congregate settings as safe as they possibly can be. Congregate settings by their very nature are slightly riskier, obviously, than being uh, completely on your own. But I uh, think we can take great pride in the outcomes that we've achieved and uh, the work that we've done with public health to ensure that our shelter system is, as, uh, as I say, as safe as it possibly can be. And they feel very good about that as well. And thanks for that, Paul. I think it's important to note that above and beyond the shelter system, there are support networks and services in place for those people who are homeless or living rough. We've historically used the, them in partnership with community agencies throughout Hamilton, and it's worked quite well. And so I, I'm, um, again, I, you know, I, I'm still trying to understand the motives here. And, and, you know, I understand the city. For some people, the city is everything to all people, irrespective of what other levels of government do or should be doing. 
we heard today from some of the delegations for defund the police that we should be somehow we're involved with the jails and that there, there, are, there are issues there within the Barton Street Jail and other places that we should insert ourselves, certainly not our area of responsibility. And I think it's an education process for many people. And, and here again, I, I mean, I wonder where all these people were when they were advocating for the homeless. Where were they in the last federal election uh, pressing the government, now a minority government, in terms of providing the services that they've bragged about as part of their national housing strategy, and yet we've seen nothing here locally. Again, people come to the city and expect that we're going to open up the, the vault here at City Hall for re with resources that we don't have uh, for a homeless situation. We've provided $50 million through our hydro funds and through our our um, uh, our the the other fund that we have in terms of application process, and so we've provided a lot of resources, both capital and operating. We're waiting for our provincial and federal partners. And here again, we have another group. Uh, and again, uh, it's it's a you know for me, it's a political stunt uh, coming back to the city, trying to get uh, you know their name in the paper at at everyone else's expense, and not going where they should be going. And that is the province, where I don't think they're going to make any uh, headroom or, or or any progress or specifically to the federal government where they actually have uh, connections to those people. Uh, w and so I, I would um, encourage if they're listening here today to uh, to try to assist the city of Hamilton instead of standing in way to help the homeless population. I really appreciate the answers to those questions, Paul, and I have others in camera along those same lines that I'll be asking. Thanks, Madam Chairman. My apologies, I'm constantly t muting myself so you don't hear me breathing. Um, second time speakers, I have Councillors Clark and Danko. Third time speakers, Councillors Wilson, Nan and Fars. We're starting with Councillor Clark, a second time speaker, please. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy Member. May I ask if the injunction is specific to any ward or is it citywide? Nicole, are you on? My apologies, Councillor. Yes, it is citywide. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Thank you. And so to my friend and colleague, Councillor Farr, I wasn't trying to disparage you and I hope you didn't take it that way. Um, I understand that the injunction was citywide and um, my concern is that if we don't resolve this issue, these encampments are going to spread and we'll have tent cities all over the city, which is going to be problematic. I have homeless people who have been tenting along the escarpment face uh, in my ward. Um, our staff generally deals with them with wellness checks and things like that. Um, and my comments were simply from my experience injunctions are a blunt instrument. I am shocked and dismayed that the app appellants went and got an injunction when they could have easily gone to the other route and sat down with the city to try to come up with some solutions that everyone could live with. I'm not on for tent cities. I've never been on for tent cities or encampments of this nature. The residents in that apartment building in Councillor Farr's ward deserve the same as every other resident in the city, the peaceful enjoyment of their home, their apartment or their townhouse. And what is happening um, is wrong in my opinion. Uh, we're, we're, it, it's just, I, I just, I find it fundamentally flawed that people can take over private property and put tents on it. And now we have an injunction that our first court date may not be until mid-October. This injunction could go on for many months after that, and we have not solved the problem. So I still believe alternative dispute resolution is an advantage. It may fail, but it's something that um, a municipality in this situation should be exploring. I'm not belittling what Councillor Farr has done. I respect him completely. 
I admire what, um, what he has been doing for his residents, fighting for his residents, and he has worked diligently to try to solve this issue in any way that he can. Um, it was, I was just simply providing commentary from my experience that if we're relying on the courts to solve the problem, um, we may find that the problem is with us a little bit longer. So no, 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 no uh, ill comments were meant to counsel the far. And if you took anything that I said as a disparagement, I apologize. Thank you. Thank you and thumbs up from Councillor Farr. Um, Councillor Danko, second time speaker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, appreciate the, uh, the comments from uh, Councillor Clark. Um, I also wanted to address the, the issue of if you wanted to negotiate a settlement to offer up your ward. Um, obviously the issues that all of us have in our wards are nothing compared to what Councillor Farr is facing downtown. Um, the what's going on down there is, is certainly a nightmare for everybody involved, our staff, Councillor Farr, and most importantly, the residents in that area, no question. But the fact is there, there's already encampments in every ward in this city. So, you know, whether I wanna offer up ward eight you know, for encampments or not, it doesn't really matter because they're already there. And my concern is now and, and has always been that unless as a council and as a city, we're willing to come to the table and find some sort of settlement to this, encampments remain completely unregulated throughout the city. There's nothing we can do about them. And uh, Councillor Danko, I'm just cautioning you. I'm getting some flags from the staff. This could be an in camera decision or conversation, and you may want to um, reword your your commentary, please. Thank you for the you. the guidance, Madam Deputy Mayor. I I think I'll, I'll just leave it there then. But the point okay. the point is being that this is not just um, a, an issue that's specific to any particular ward. All awards are affected. Thank you. I agree. Thank you. So we've got Councillor Wilson, Councillor Nan, Councillor Farr. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> uh, sorry, my question was asked by Councillor Nan uh, with respect to addictions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And we've got Councillor Nan, please. Thank you. Through the Deputy New Mayor, just a couple last questions on the report or information that uh, pertains to the report. Do we have a current breakdown of the demographics of those who are um, in our encampments, i.e. how many are women, how many may be people with uh, disabilities? I understand that that information is difficult to collect because uh, we don't have uh, by name and full data, but roughly speaking, do we have a sense of how many women are in the encampments versus not and any other demographic data? Yeah, turn that over through the chair to uh, David Buckle. He might have, um, I doubt he'll have all of that information just to be yeah. clear, but he may have some of that level of information. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Through the chair, I would suggest that the vast majority are males. However, there is a significant uh, representation of females at certainly the Ferguson site and first Ontario site. Um, at least 20 women at both of those two major sites. Um, we're also seeing as far as people congregating at the sites during the daytime and late hours, although they don't necessarily sleep there, a uh, significant, uh, not insignificant number of those are females as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and any, any data uh, otherwise in terms of demographic, that's as far as we've been able to, I can appreciate the difficult nature of getting this information. So just, for the public record, there's no other de uh, demographic information that we have. Uh, David? Yeah, it's through the chair, that's that's where we're starting with. Thank, Thank you. you. And apologize, I just lost my note page. Um, I will leave it there <laughs> in, okay. in interest of time, given that I'm toggling between multiple screens. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Councillor Farr, last time speaker. These are just like clarity questions and a few quick comments. So first and foremost, thanks to uh, Councillor Clark for bringing me some clarity. Uh, quote, I'm not on for 10 cities, end quote. Um, you are clearly among the majority and uh, I'm sure folks might want to recollect or maybe we can resend out our press release from our last council meeting. Um, 
for the comment on not unique to Hamilton, here's what is unique to Hamilton with regards to encampments in this city. For those who, who may not know, uh, we're the only city who has an influx, an unbelievable amount of tents on a major public thoroughfare where there's a library and a market. Uh, we're the only city, um, and staff will confirm this, and I'll ask for Grace to confirm this, that has them across from a mid-rise residential with, with hundreds of uh, residents just trying to go throughout their day. And again, uh, very unfortunate. What's great news is we're very successful at getting people to safer and more humane conditions. That point may be overlooked by some who are very supportive, who maybe have donated tents, but we've done a terrific job. But the reality is there are growing acute issues as the issue grows and it's grown exceptionally uh, uh, large since the court order, uh, since the judge said yes to the injunction. So I just wanna make it clear that that's another example of encampments. There's 55, I counted this morning, tents approximately, on Ferguson Avenue across from these residential homes. That also is unique. And through you to Grace, can you please, yes or no, just confirm you shared that with me just the other day. Uh, through the chair, uh, the councillor is correct that it, through the municipalities that we have been in touch with to find out about their experiences with encampments, most of them are in the off the beaten path, so to speak, and uh, that ours is unique in, in how um, obvious it is in the uh, downtown core. Okay, and I appreciate you doing all that research, and I know it took some time, time and I may have been overly persistent uh, in trying to get that answer. I think you're awesome and you're doing great work, among with everyone else with the encampment task force. I was also grateful that uh, Dr. Trans had that comment uh, in a response to another colleague's question um, and essentially said that hotels and shelters uh, um, have available water, have the toilets, uh, safer food are available. And those, by the way, are the options maybe that are not liked by certain groups that are, are fighting us on this, um, that we're, we're offering and we continue to offer. They've always been avail available, shelter space is there, hotels have always been there, and guess what? No outbreaks in either of those locations as we've been offering through the pandemic and even before the pandemic. So I appreciate those comments and through you to Dr. Tr yes or no have i got that right you're pretty much saying it's healthier because you're you've got water you've got toilets toiletries and safer food in those options that we provide did i hear that correctly through you through you madam chair i i do i'll provide a bit of context so yeah i mean the in terms of what shelters and hotels as well as some of the other housing options that uh, Paul, Grace, Edward, uh, and David are trying to, you know, explore for it, folks that they do have that uh, advantage um, over uh, other types of housing, such as encampments, in terms of those issues. Uh, I think there is, you know, a whole host of issues that each individual uh, considers, but from those uh, considerations, um, yeah, and, and I think I also want to echo uh, Paul's uh, comment. Um, and I think you've alluded to there is that um, you know, under his leadership and, and the, the group work of our shelter operators is that they've been very good at working with us uh, and following and taking COVID seriously, implementing screening, IPAC measures, you know, spacing out beds, um, you know, uh, to, you know, and that's you know, a main reason why we don't have uh, breaks uh, in uh, shelters. I'm aware of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you answered my question. Thank you, Dr. Tran. really appreciate it because the health component is obviously the whole reason why we're having these debates. Uh, again, just for clarity, Madam Chair, uh, uh, as uh, the report talks about maintaining lines, quote, lines of communication, end quote, to avoid duplication, uh, kind of speaking to the fact that we have the appellants at the table with us weekly and again to these uh, group sessions that we have. I would like to know roughly, just for because the report doesn't hit on it, what's the ratio of outreach uh, work performed by outreach workers that are, are appellants or other partners that are not appellants to the city? How many are we working with regularly on this? And I'm not suggesting anyone's doing bad work. They all have their lines and I'm sure they're using their expertise in whatever capacity, but what's the, what's the ratio there? I just need the ratio. I don't need any explanation. 
but they are their appellants they're at the table are they the majority are they 20 percent of the people that we speak to weekly on this issue as far as outreach goes which is an important aspect obviously oh through the chair no they're they're not the the majority uh the regular okay. participant in a weekly basis is keeping six ham smart do attend um uh, from time to time and and remember that this group as i say has been there throughout it so in the very beginning stages for instance uh, you know Anyways, I'll, I'll leave it at that. They're not good, the yeah. majority of the of the group, and um, and through it, they've how had much time has it gone? And, and and both organizations, keeping six ham smart, relatively new outreach organizations, a year or year or two, and we manage very well with outreach. Uh, we should probably add prior to the formation of these current appellants to the city, along with downtown Hamilton law firm Ross McBride's lawyer, who went to the judge who asked for this injunction, who received the injunction from Judge Perioski. Uh, so for those who are, are asking questions about uh, how we uh, unfortunately have encampments that are not regulated, that's why. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor, or sorry, Mayor Eisenberger, please. Steve, I move to receive the information report. Thank you very much. It's moved You're by welcome. Council. Councillor Eisenberg, actually, I think that we already had a mover and a seconder at the very beginning. Can I call we? the question? Thank you. It was Councillor Farr and it was moved, seconded by Councillor, uh, or sorry, Mayor Eisenberger. That was the original. So all those in favor, electronic vote, please. Councillor Collins is in the uh, chamber. He's in the house right now, so he says yes. Councillor Pauls. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm just following the roadmap. We're just going to notice this motion right now. General information and other business amendment to the outstanding business list. It's before you. We said it at the very beginning. It's moved by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Jackson. Uh, and that's an electronic vote too, please. Um, actually, the with the amendment 12.1 AB, items 9.1 to 9.5 goes on to the next agenda, so we can't be taking the defunding of the Hamilton Police Services off this yet. It still has to stay on. Correct. Thank you. So, electronic vote for that one, please. I had Councillor Pearson seconded by Councillor Jackson. Councillor Collins is contaminating my seat, sitting in my seat. Okay, thank you. Is there any other items of general information, other business before we go into uh, in confidential, private and confidential? I see Councillor Danko's got his hand up. So while we're waiting for that, Councillor Danko, please. Thank you. Uh, I think, is General Manager McKinnon still on the on the call? I have a question, just a quick question about um, back to school HSR capacity. And this is really the only chance I have to to ask publicly before back to school. So council, or sorry, oh, Mr. McKinnon is on, on uh, line. Mr. McKinnon, did you hear that question about the HSR buses capacity with the schools being back in session? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I caught half of it. So if the good councilor could repeat it, I'd appreciate it. Councillor Danko. I just saw a press release that uh, the city issued earlier today about uh, the back to school plan. And uh, part of it was the uh, HSR capacity on those school routes, which are typically standing room only and crowded. So i um, just wondering if you could elaborate that on a little bit, uh, General Manager McKinnon, if you could. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, you, you got me at a bit of a disadvantage here. Um, I'd be happy to follow up with Debbie on that and, and confirm uh, to make sure that I haven't got any of it wrong. Thank you, Councillor Danko. Sure, yeah, we can we can take that offline. I, I know that it was in the press release, um, but I think it'd just be beneficial to uh, to clarify a couple questions. So thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Any other general information, business, seeing none? So I need a motion, please, to approve the closed session minutes of the August the 10th, 2020 meeting as presented. And I have Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Nan. All those in favor, electronic vote, please. Okay, I'm gonna assume it's a yes. So we're going to be moving into closed session. By the time I read all this, we can bring up that vote. May I have a motion please to move into closed session respecting item 13.2 pursuant to a section 8.1, sections E and F of the city's procedural bylaw 18-270 as amended and section 2392 subsections E and F of the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 as amended as the subject matter pertains to one, litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, and two, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. And we will require an electronic vote now. Uh, so I have Councillor Vanderbeek, and it's seconded by Councillor Marula, and it is going to an electronic vote. While the vote is being done, I just want to highlight to the members of the public, the meeting will continue following the closed session portion of the meeting when you see the members of the council rejoin the meeting. We will wait up to five minutes upon reconvening an open session before proceeding with the meeting to provide members of the public and media time to return. A reminder to all members of committee to please ensure you move into the closed session portion of eScribe. Before we move into closed session, I would ask all members of the public to please exit the WebEx meeting now. Thank you. As well as any staff that are not directly related to item 13.2 are also asked to please exit the WebEx meeting now. Once clerks has confirmed that only the appropriate attendees are still in the WebEx meeting, we will move into item 13.2. Councillor Wilson is waiting her hand, and so does Councillor Pearson. Councillor Wilson and Councillor Ferguson. Go ahead, Councillor Wilson. Um, I think you're mistaking my hand, Madam. I was not waving it. Well, then keep it to yourself. <laughs> Councillor Pearson. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. Can you bring down your voice, please? No, you. Yeah, there you go. All right. Um, just um, for committee and any of the viewing public, I do. I will have to cut out around seven thirty, eight o'clock, uh, for a funeral visitation this evening because I didn't make it today, and it's only today. So if we're not done, I will have to scoot. Thank you. Oh, my condolences, Councillor Ferguson. You. you had uh, your hand up or no? No, Councillor Marilla, you're fine. Everybody good? No, Councillor Preparella. We need Councillor Nan, Councillor Collins to vote. So we got thumbs up from Councillor Nan, thumbs up Councillor Collins, who else? Councillor Clark, thumbs up. Ferguson, thumbs up. And Vanderbeek, thumbs up. Thank you, everybody's those thumbs up. Okay, folks, uh, it is 10 after five. Uh, we'll reconvene, uh, well, we'll give them 10 minutes to set up, please for nature breaks, et cetera, and we'll see you at uh, 5.20.
to you, Madam Deputy Mayor, no, it's up to. So it's completely fine. It's it was primarily when we had um, members Keep outside loud. chambers. Okay. Yes. So we're just gonna go ahead, folks. Um, so we just came out of camera and I'm gonna go to Councillor, oh, sorry, um, Councillor Farr and it's seconded by Councillor, or sorry, Mayor Ice. Um, one quick second, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, my apologies. No, it's my fault. I need to go into open and switch this before you do it. Hang on, I just need to get the system into open folks, sorry. Okay, you're good, my apologies. Okay, thank you. So it's moved by Councillor Farr, seconded by Count, uh, Mayor Eisenberger that uh, 12.3 is referred to council with staff direction. December, September 16th, council. Yes. September 16th, council meeting. And this needs a recorded vote, please. Hang on, the vote hasn't come out yet. I just still have to uh, just get the system moving there, sorry. Oh. Vote's on its way, folks. Councillor Farr, oh, you voted thumbs up, correct? Okay. And Councillor Johnson, you were fine with that as well? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's carried. Thank you. And it's moved by Councillor Danko, seconded by Councillor Nand uh, for to adjourn. And that vote's on its way too. Oh, we have to electronically we vote. Hang in there, folks. Because it shows that we have quorum. Bear with me, we're getting there. Everybody voted on that quickly. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye.